Full Stack Development is a comprehensive and integral approach to building digital solutions covering both the front-end and back-end aspects of a web and application development. In an era where technology is constantly advancing, Full Stack Developers are in high demand for their ability to work on every facet of project. As per Talent.com, the early income of a Full Stack Developer in India ranges from 5 lakhs to 20 lakhs per year. While in the United States, it ranges from $97,000 to $149,000 per year. Hello everyone and welcome to this session on the Full Stack Developer course. Whether you are an aspiring developer seeking to understand the entire development process or a seasoned pro looking to expand your skill set, this course will empower you with the expertise to navigate the ever-changing landscape of the Full Stack Development effectively. In this full course, you will explore programming languages, frameworks and the best practices to become a proficient full-stack developer capable of transforming ideas into digital reality. But before we get started, let's take a moment to outline the agenda for today's session. First, we will begin with a brief overview of HTML covering its structure, doc type declaration, elements and forms. Next, we will explore CSS, a style sheet language used to control content presentation and layout. Within the CSS section, we will discuss its syntax, selectors, the CSS box model, and units. Advancing further, we will provide an introduction to JavaScript, highlighting its benefits and guiding you through setting up a development environment, including JavaScript fundamentals. Afterward, we will provide a brief overview of a jQuery. Then, we will explore the Angular framework, emphasizing how to create dynamic web applications. As we move forward, we will learn to build dynamic and engaging web applications using React.js from scratch. Advancing, we will discuss the introduction to Node.js. We will then proceed to essential backend development components such as MongoDB, REST APIs, and Marvin. This will also include important tools like Git, GitHub, as well as Jenkins, where we will explain what a pipeline is, discuss Jenkins files, provide installation guidance, and touch on Docker. Additionally, we will explore full-stack web development using Django. Finally, as we conclude this full-stack developer course, we will present a roadmap to help you become a full-stack web developer. But before we begin, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated on the latest tech content from Edureka. Also, visit the Edureka website for full-stack training and certification courses. The link to which is in the description box below. So what is full stack web development? I'm sure you all must have heard of front end and back end web development, but what is full stack web development? Now full stack web development basically involves front end and back end web development. It requires in-depth knowledge of the different scripting languages like HTML, JavaScript, CSS, which make the web look more interactive and alive. It also requires high level programming languages such as Java, Python, and so on to code the server side. Apart from this, you also require experience in working with JavaScript frameworks like Node.js and libraries such as jQuery and so on. Now, in the further slides, I'll be covering the different aspects of becoming a full stack web developer in depth. So stay tuned. So before we move on to what a full stack developer does and how a front end and back end developer works, let's look at the different layers of full stack. First, we have the presentation layer or the front end of the web. This layer helps you interact with the web watch videos, perform actions like register to an online shopping site. So guys, whenever you surf a website, the different fonts, images, and the content of the website forms the presentation or the front end of that website. So basically, the design, look, and feel of the web is accomplished with the help of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Then comes the logic layer or the back end layer. Now, this layer forms a dynamic connection between the front end and the database. So every time you search the web, it's the logic layer that transmits your requirements to the database and returns what you searched for. All of this is powered by a web server. Now, in order to get this layer working, it's important to know at least one of the programming languages such as Python, Java, or C hash. Okay. Now, lastly, we have the database layer. This layer is a massive warehouse of information. It contains a database repository which captures and stores information from the front end through the back end. Now, a prerequisite over here is to have knowledge of how data is stored, edited, retrieved, and so on. Languages such as MySQL, MongoDB are a must to know. 
Now let's look at the type of web developers. So guys, front end developers are responsible for a website's look and feel. These developers must be masters at three main languages, which is HTML, CSS and JavaScript. They also need to be familiar with frameworks like Bootstrap, AngularJS and EmberJS, which make the website look more interactive and alive. Libraries like jQuery also help to package code into a lightweight and compatible form. Now moving on to the back end developers. Now the back end of a website consists of three components, the server, the application and a database. A back end developer creates and maintains the web server, application and the database which allows the front end of the website to operate. To make the server application and a database to communicate with each other, backend developers use server side languages like PHP, Ruby, Python, Java, and .NET to build an application. They also require to operate on tools like MySQL, SQL, MongoDB in order to fetch, store, or edit data and then serve it back to the user in the front end. Now, guys, this is how backend developers work. Now, moving on to full stack developers. The term full stack developer was popularized in a meeting around eight years ago when Facebook announced that they are looking to hire only full stack web developers. Now, basically a full stack developer should be knowledgeable enough to work on both the front end technology and the back end technology. So he needs to have an understanding of how the web works at each and every level, including setting up and configuring Linux or Windows servers, coding server side APIs, running the client side of the application by using JavaScript and structuring and designing the web page with CSS and HTML. A full stack developer is like the jack of all trades. One must have enough knowledge to run both the client and the scripting side. Now let's discuss a few key points about why one must practice full stack web development. One of the reasons is the full stack developers can choose from a rich set of tools and technologies for creating and designing unique code. They are not restricted to a certain set of tools for development because there are n number of frameworks and libraries that will assist a full stack developer in achieving an effective web application. Now the next reason is design and development. Now one of the best things about working as a full stack developer is that you're not restricted to only development. As a full stack developer, you can design and style your application. And then if you're bored of designing, you can probably switch to your developer mode. Now developer skills come into handy when you want to create a functional and a bug free application. A full stack developer is basically a creative person who can both develop and design an application. So guys, I'm not going to lie to you. A full stack developer is like the Stephen Hawking's of web development. After mastering various scripting and programming languages and working alongside several frameworks and libraries, a full stack developer is no less than a master. Of course, one requires to have work experience and a lot of knowledge, but nothing is unachievable if you have the will to do it. Apart from that, a full stack developer is highly valued in all parts of the world. In the US, the average salary of a full stack developer is over $110,000. Not only in the US, all around the world, full stack developers are in high demand. Now that you have a basic understanding about what a full stack developer is, let's dive deep into how to become a full stack developer. Let's look at the responsibilities of a developer and what exactly does he do. All right. So guys, to begin with, you must have a decent understanding of how a website or a web application is built and what tools and technologies are used to do so. So let's begin with our front end web development. To master front end web development, you'll need to know many technologies, but the main technologies are HTML, CSS and JavaScript. Now HTML, which stands for hypertext markup language is the skeleton of every web page. It defines the structure of the web. Without it, the web would be as shapeless as a lump of clay. By using HTML, you tell the browser how you want your content to be structured by defining the different parts of a web page. For example, you define the content of your web page within HTML tags. Now these tags tell the browser which part are headings, body, sidebars and footers. This not only helps to structure the web page, it also lets you style each HTML element by selecting them and then adding different style parameters. Now CSS, which stands for cascading style sheets is like the clothes we wear to look stylish and attractive. The HTML elements we define can now be styled using CSS. For example, you can change the color of the header, add and style various buttons. You can also use CSS to adjust the width of the HTML elements. You can style them by adding color and design. 
you can also play around with buttons and make them look colorful and attractive so guys you can style a web page in any way you want css has thousands of styling functions which let you design and make a web page look like a beautiful painting next up is javascript now before i get on with how full stack developers use javascript it is important to understand how javascript works javascript is basically a language of the web which every browser pc and mobile phone understands now javascript can natively run on the browser by natively i mean that most of the web browsers like google chrome safari and internet explorer have a javascript engine embedded into their browsers okay now this javascript engine interprets the javascript code so that it can run on the browser so guys this is exactly how javascript runs on the web browser now where is javascript used now let's look at an example so guys when you're browsing on a web page you come across many buttons on clicking these buttons some event occurs now javascript has event listeners which perform specific actions on the click of a button like for example on the click of a button another page might open up or a personal detail form can pop up all of this is possible only through javascript it is basically used to manipulate the html elements add motions and graphics to them so any sort of motion that you see on your web page is all javascript now that you have a good idea of how full stack developers work on the front end let's look at the back end now when a user opens up a web page and clicks on a link or submits some form or let's say he enters a url where does this data get stored and how does the browser return information to the user so basically the browser connects to a web server now a web server is just a computer running an application or a software that delivers resources to the web pages So guys when a web server receives a request for a resource it has to respond with that resource so how does it do that now basically back end developers program the web servers to respond with the right resources so the main aim of the web server here is to respond with the correct resources but where do they get these resources the web server is connected to a database which is continuously pulled on receiving some request So the role of a full stack developer here would be to create an application that fills a web page with the required resources by pulling data from the database. Now this application is programmed using server side languages like Java, Python, PHP, Node.js and the database is also programmed using languages such as MySQL, MongoDB and SQL. So guys basically the back end of a web page is used to serve the required resources to a user. So here we just discussed how the front end development is used to design the user facing part of a web page that lets us interact with the web page. We also discussed how the back end is used to deliver a web page to the browser along with the requested resources which are retrieved from a database. So guys this is what a full stack developer does. He has to create both the front end and the back end of a web page. All right? Now let's look at some of the important technologies and tools that a full stack developer must know. First of all a full stack developer must choose a code editor that is best suitable for him there are hundreds of code editors out there personally i switch between visual studio code and sublime text they are the most user friendly code editors but you guys can go ahead and choose whichever code editor you like now the second tool is a version control system a version control system basically is used to keep a track of all the changes that you make to your code files or any sort of documents Now like the name suggests it creates versions of your code or your file every time you change something so let's say that you created a web application and added an additional feature to it but for some reason this feature slowed down your website and you want to go back to the old version of your website so usually it is very hard to revert back to an older version but a version control system takes care of this because it has a track of all the code changes that you've made and it can easily revert back to any code change Some of the popular version control systems include Git and Subversion. Now guys there are thousands of JavaScript frameworks and libraries which will come handy during web development. Frameworks like Node.js can help with back end development of a web page and JavaScript libraries such as jQuery can help at the front end to design a web page. Then there is Angular, React, Backbone, Meteor which are all very useful to a full stack developer. A full stack web developer is always familiar with a couple of JavaScript frameworks and the best part of these frameworks is that after learning JavaScript which you'll definitely need while developing the front end they are very easy to understand. Next up we have HTTP protocols. 
Now, HTTP is basically a stateless application protocol on the internet which allows clients to communicate with the server. So basically, it enables communication between the front end of your web page and the back end. Guys, let me tell you that there are a lot of web developers out there who don't know much about HTTP. But it is quite essential to have an understanding about HTTP and how the internet works. It is also necessary to understand what is REST and why is it important in regards to the HTTP protocol in web applications. Apart from all of this, a full stack developer obviously needs to have prior knowledge about running the application on operating systems such as Linux, Windows and so on. Because at the end of the day, all of this is running on top of an operating system. Also, a lot of full stack developers have brushed up on various project management tools like Jira, Teamwork, Basecamp to effectively carry out the web development process. So guys, becoming a full stack web developer requires good amount of effort and dedication. But is it worth all the effort? I would say definitely it is. It is the most value designation and once you practice full stack web development, you'll become a master of the web. And at Edureka, we provide a full stack web development course that has all the required tools and technologies that you need to learn. And we also make sure that you don't just learn it, you master it. So guys, if you're interested in learning the full stack web development master course or any other training technologies, let us know in the comment section and we'll get back to you at the earliest. So the idea behind HTML was a modest one. When Tim Berners-Lee was putting together his first elementary browsing and authoring system for the web, he created a quick little hypertext language that would serve his purposes. He imagined dozens or even hundreds of hypertext formats in the future and smart clients that could easily negotiate and translate documents from servers all across the internet. Now HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language and it is a standard markup language for creating web pages and web applications. It is used to describe the structure of the web pages using a process called markup. Now, HTML mostly constitutes of elements and these elements are the building blocks of any HTML page and are represented by tags. Now, let me just give you a brief introduction to the structure of HTML. Now, this is also called an HTML boilerplate. So firstly, an HTML boilerplate begins with the HTML tags, which tells the browser that this is an HTML page and this is where it begins from. Next comes the head tag, which contains most of the meta information about the document. The head tag normally also contains the link to the styling sheets, the fonts that you might be using on your web page, and even the JavaScript that you might be using. Now, the head tag also has the title element, which specifies the title for the document and can be seen as a text on the tab that you open on a browser. Now, next comes the body tag, which mostly contains the content that is visible to the viewer of your page. And these contains elements like H1 tags or paragraph tags, which are known by P tags, and they make up the mass of your content. Now, to create an HTML page, there are a few steps. So firstly, you need to open any sort of text editor. It could be Notepad++, Notepad, Sublime Text, or even Visual Studio Code. You have the freedom to use whatever text editor you want. Next, you have to write up some HTML code that you want to show on your web page, and then you just save your file as a .html. And to open the file, all you have to do is just view it on your browser. Now, let me just give you a quick demonstration on how that is actually done, if you've still not understood that. So let us create a folder first. So let's call this folder HTML demo. And now we're just gonna use Sublime Text because that's my favorite text editor. Out here, all you have to do is create a new file and I'm gonna be saying that it's a HTML type. Then you just fit in your HTML boilerplate. I'm gonna tell my title is gonna be my first web page. And that is the title of our web page. Now let's put in some content into this. So it's gonna have an H1 which says, this is just some text. Let's save this. This is gonna be saved into our HTML demo. So yes, let's open it, let's save it as index.html. Now, once you've saved it, all you have to do to view it is go into your folder and just open it on your browser. So as you guys can see, the title is written out here on the tab and this is our H1 that we just created, okay? So that's how you basically create an HTML page. So let's move on. Now, there are some elements that I want to tell you all about, which is very important. So first is the doc type element. So the doc type declaration 
represents that the file you're working is a document type and helps the browser to display web pages correctly. And it only appears once at the top of the page before any HTML tag and the doc type declaration is not case sensitive. Okay, so this is what HTML actually looks like. Now before we move further with some HTML coding, I want to make you all aware that a web page is fundamentally made up of three constituents. The first is HTML, the second is CSS or cascading style sheets, and the third is JavaScript. Now HTML will only give the structure of the web page. It has nothing to do with the styling, while CSS is completely responsible for how beautiful your web page looks, what colors you're using as the background, how your images are actually lined up, and all those sorts of things. To learn more about CSS, you can always refer to our CSS tutorial on the same page of Edureka. And thirdly, JavaScript is for making your page much more dynamic. If you're clicking on a button, your posts are being actually submitted. That's all being done by JavaScript. And if you all want to learn about JavaScript, we also have tutorials for that and you can surely check them out. Okay, so now let's go ahead and create some elements and see how they look like on an HTML page. So let's go back to our HTML page. So this is what an H1 looks like. So let me just copy this down now. And let me show you all the types of headings that HTML provides us. It's actually H1 through H6, so H2, H3, H4, H5, and H6. Let's also change them here. H6, H5, H4, H3, 2. Now let's save it. Let's go ahead and reload our page. So this is how the different types of headings look like. This is H1 being the biggest and H6 being the smallest. Okay, so that was about headings. Now we have some other tags also that I want to make you all aware of. So there's a P tag first. So P normally stands for paragraph. Now paragraph is basically what it looks like and it normally contains random text or paragraphs of your web page. And this is what they look like. So this is what a paragraph looks like. Okay, so that was all about adding a paragraph. So how do you add images? So you can simply add image with the image tag and all you have to say is a source. Now I already have a beautiful picture of a Pokemon that I really loved as a kid. So let me just copy that down into the folder. Okay, so now that we've copied down our image into our folder, all you have to do is give the source. Now this can be ninetails.png. That's the name of our image. Let's go back to our page. Let's reload it. Okay. Now you can also put in attributes like height and you could say the height is going to be 7 or 500 pixels and then you can also put in an attribute called width and say that's also going to be 500 pixels. Yeah, so that changes the height and width of your image. You can also make it smaller by saying something like 100 pixels. So let me just show you that. Save it, let's reload it. And yeah, now we have a much smaller nine tails out there. Now, suppose you don't have a picture, you can also put an alt tag. So this will say, there was supposed to be an image here. So let's save that. Now you will not be able to see the alt tag because our image is working. But suppose I misspelled the name of my image and now you'll see something like that out there. So there was supposed to be an image out here. So it's showing the alternate thing. Right, we can also have line breaks in our HTML. So you do that simply by saying slash br. And then there will be a line break between this word Alamco and Laboris. So let's save that. Let's cancel this out. Okay, so now Alamco and Laboris are on different lines. We can also make stuff bold. So suppose you want to make this first word bold. So you can go b slash b and that'll make it bold yep now lorem is bold you can also for making things bold you can use a strong tag and now let's say this is also bold and now this is also bold comes up right there then you can change the size of text so let's just create some other text so it not so that it doesn't get cluttered up so we have tags like big and we also have tags like small so let me just show you the difference. This text is big, while this is small. Let's do that. So this text is big, while this is small. So let me just put a line break here. Save that. Let's also put a line break here. And now let's put back our image. 
Yeah, this text is big while well, this is small. Now you can also put in horizontal lines inside your HTML. All you have to say is HR and that'll put in horizontal line out there, right like that. You can also put the width and height out here. So width, there's no reason to put a height because it's not there. And width is gonna be something like 70%, you could say 70%. And you have a line that goes 70% through the screen. Next, we can also put in links into our HTML. So suppose you want to go to a site so let's say you want to go to edureka now we can put some text like say this is a link to a website let's save that spread here and now this will take us to edureka.co yep so that's how it works you can also put links on images so suppose we were to remove this text out here copy this image from here and just put it out here now if we were to click on the image it'll take us to edureka.co okay you can also add lists into your HTML page so there are two types of lists one is an ordered list so ordered lists are numbered lists and you can put in list items like this so let's put in a bunch of list items okay so let's type in some text so this is a random list so list items are actually going to be the things that you're going to list out so these could be anything that you're listing out you could list out your favorite dogs you could list out your favorite chocolates or anything like that let me just show you what that looks like let's go back to our page and this is what it looks like so as you guys can see we have a list out here which says this is a random list this is a random list and just to make it a little more creative let's go and put in some stuff like that so firstly let's put an h2 out here these are some of my favorite dogs uh, let's say I love Samoeds I also love Corgis I love Huskies and I also love Golden Retrievers so now we'll have an actually good list out here so these are some of my favorite dogs now if I were to just make this an unordered list so we could also have unordered list so this is how you create an unordered list you just go UL and then you put in your list items so I'm gonna say so let's put an H2 again and these are some of my favorite heroes in Dota 2 so list item this is gonna be let's see I really love playing Shadow Fiend then let's put in some other heroes like Storm Spirit, Invoker, and let's say Templar Assassin. Let's save that and let's see. So these are some of my favorite heroes in Dota 2. Now if you see our H2 is kind of indented. That is because we have put it inside our list. Now if you were to just cut it out and put it outside. Let's reinvent my lines and let's see. So now it's properly showing. So these are some of my favorite heroes in Dota 2. You can also put in images in these list items. So suppose we were to put in some images of Shadowfee and Storm Spirit, you would just put an image out here and you would put the source. Now I don't really have images, but you can also put in the URL of images. So let me just show you how to do that. So let's see, Shadow Fiend. Let's go into the images. Let's find something small, like let's say 300x300. Okay, so this looks like a nice cartoonish figure. So we open this image in the new tab and we copy down this link. So you can see the source is this link. Let's save it. Let's see if it shows up. Yep, and now this thing shows up just outside Shadow Fiend. You can also put in some styling or some attributes, like let's say width is going to be 100 pixels and height is going to be 100 pixels so let's save that now and now it's a much smaller image of shadow fiend now we have other types of tags also so these are called div tags so div tag stands for division so to divide your page into separate parts you could say this will contain the footer so footer tags are normally coming in the end now you could also have a div tag in the beginning and this could contain the header so these tags will contain the header this is so let me just put in some header so this is the header and this is the footer
So this is the header, headers always come on top and this is the footer. Now you can also create forms using HTML. So let's go ahead and create one. So our form is gonna be called a registration form. Okay, so now let's put our form in a div first of all. So let's give our div an ID. So IDs and classes are actually used to select stuff on an HTML page when you're styling. So to understand more about IDs, check out our CSS tutorial. Let's give this ID form or registration form rather. Then let's go into our div and create a form. Our form will always stay inside our form tags. Now that we have done that, let's understand the elements of a form. Firstly, we need an input. So first input will be of type text. Let's say its name is gonna be first name and we'll have a placeholder that sound like this, say aria. And we will always be requiring it. So if you say required, that means somebody will, if he's actually inputting stuff into the form, this is a mandatory field, okay? So let's save that and see. So now we have a registration form called ARIA. Okay, so we also need labels. So let's go ahead and create one. So label, so for first name, and this is gonna say first name, and it's gonna have a colon. So now there's a label called first name, now we can do this for last name also. So let's control C, control V. So it's gonna be last, it's gonna be last, and this is also gonna be last. And we wanna put a placeholder for Paul, and this is also a required field. So now we have a last name with this placeholder. We can submit stuff into that. Now form also takes in two important attributes I forgot to mention. So one is the action, and the other is the method. Now action is something that will happen when you submit this form so you can run a script something like script.php but for now that's for another session. Okay now there are other types of inputs so let's see let's create another div. Now suppose you want to input the gender also so let's see let's first create a label and let's also create an input type. So input will be type of radio and this is going to be called gender male and let's also give us a value of choice one save it now you want to label and you want to give it the attribute for and you want to give it the name out here so let's put in that so gender male save that and let's write male out here so let's save that now and let's see what it looks like so now we have this thing called male we can check it and we can uncheck it now let's create for female also and others so let's see let's call this female and this is going to be of type choice 2 now we have male we have female but if you see we can actually select both of them or all of them so that's not something we want right so let's make this choice 3 let's make this other Okay, now we have a gender submission going on, so male, or it's female, or it's other. Now we can't really select everything, so how do we actually solve that? So let's give them all the same name. So we can call it gender choice, save it. Now you either go male, or you go female, or you go other. You can't really select the same thing. So that's how you make that happen. Okay, now let's look into some other types of input types we can take in. So let's create another div. Suppose you want to take in the email address. So let's go ahead and copy that. Let's put it out here. Let's say, so label for, let's see. First of all, we need to change this type to email. And we will also give this a name of email. Let's put in a placeholder instead of a value. And it's going to be something like, let's put xyz at the rate email.com. Okay, now we have this thing going on. So let's change this label to email and let's change this label to email too. Now we have this thing going and we can type in our email. And we'll also need to type in a password for registrations. Let's call this password. Let's also make this password. The type is going to be password 
and let's remove a placeholder because passwords don't really have placeholders save that and now you see when you type in a password you can't really see anything that's how you make a form that inputs a password okay so that was how you take in emails and passwords in a form now there are some other stuff that I want to show you so let's dive right into that so let's create another div okay so first of all we need a select tag so select tags are used for making selections so let me show you how that works so firstly let's give this a name and let's call this birthday or let's call this the month now we'll also need a label for this let's create a label so our label is for month let's call it birthday now our select can have various options so you're basically going to put it in a bunch of options out here let's see option now we need 12 options actually that's 3 that's 6 that's 9 that's 12 delete these out just read in my lines now our options are going to have values so our value will be something like fine so let's say Jan Feb March April May June July August September October November and December and you could say January out here February let me just create this quickly March let's save this now let's see what this looks like so we have this birthday thing and it has all the months in there okay now out here if you see it already comes with the default value of January now you can also mitigate that by putting in another option called default so let's put another option or so now that we have an option let's give this a value 0 and let's say selected disabled now if you reload this there's nothing but you get all these different values now instead of just making it blank you could say that this could say month so now this says month and you could create something similar for days also so for days you need to create 30 of these and I hope you get the logic of creating this thing now now our form also needs a button to submit so let's go and create that also let me show you another type of input so let's say input and the type will be check box and the name will be agree and let's put a label for this a for agree and I agree to all the conditions of the form now we will have this thing going and we have a checkbox we could check it we could uncheck it something like that then all we need is an input and on an input we rather need a button say button and you say submit and you also have to give this a type so this is going to be of type submit so once that's done we see this button and we can submit it so if you go and submit you'll see please fill out this field because it's a required field and that's all that is there the forms so that's how you create a form in HTML you can also create tables in HTML so let me show you how to do that let's reload and make this blank save it yeah so our tables are created with table tags your table and tables have table data okay so we can also create tables in HTML for that we need the table tag now table comes with the table header first of all so this will contain all your table headers so suppose you are creating a table for dogs and the breeds so th dog uh, and you can say the dog also has a name and breed so this has created a table header now so let me just show you what that looks like so now we have the dog name and breed now we can just simply go in and put in some table rows so for the row you say tr 
and in every row you will have to put in some table data so for that you use the table data tag so td so let's say our dog is called so let's make this rather dog owner name right so I had a dog and my dog's name was stoner let's call him stoner and stoner was a street dog so let's just keep the breed as street okay so that was one table data row save it now we'll be needing multiple table rows so let's just copy that paste it multiple times so let's say my friend Shubham he has a dog called Goldie and it's a retriever and then I also have this friend called Ayushman he has a dog called Duke and it's Husky and then there's this guy called Ishan he has a dog called Monster but it's a pug yeah so now we have successfully created a table and you guys, you guys can see dog owners are Arya, Shubham, Ayushman and Ishan their name of their respective dogs is Stoner, Goldie, Duke and Monster and the breeds are Street, Retriever, Husky and Pug so that's how you create a table now with CSS you can add a border to this table so let me just show you how that's done with a little bit of CSS so let's say style let's say text slash CSS now out here you could just do some little styling let's say let's give our table a border of 1px solid black now our table will have a border and we can also give TDs a border and in there are gonna have 1px solid black too so now everything has a border and our table looks much neater yep so that's how you create a table in HTML okay guys so now it's time I actually show you how HTML can be really polished sometimes so let's go ahead and create a blog so for this blog I've already created the CSS out here so I'm not really going to be explaining the styling part but we are going to be creating our blog so let's go ahead and see how that looks like so first of all let's delete everything let's create a page now so let's call this blog now we'll be linking our style sheet out here so for linking our style sheet all you have to say is something like this and then we go ahead and copy my style sheets in the desktop we're doing our stuff in HTML demo let's copy this here right now our blog.css is going to be here now let's go and start creating our blog so firstly let's put everything inside a div now this is going to have a class called post because I've used the class to actually style some stuff now that's done so let's have another div so this is gonna have a class called date and we're gonna be putting in the date so let's say our date is gonna be October 24th 2018 now let's say we have a heading so let's say Vancouver my favorite city then let's put in some paragraphs because every article needs a paragraph so for paragraphs you're just going to be filling it with some lorem ipsum now our paragraph will have a class called quote okay now let's reload and see what is being made okay so if you guys can see our blog post is coming up now we can also add some images to our blog post so let's say let's add a link first so we link to https www.edurecord.co now we are going to use an image for actually making it clickable so we already have an image it's called image1.jpg so that's there let's also put an alt tag out here just in case this doesn't load up so alt and say Vancouver image now let's put in some another paragraphs so not lorem ipsum and some more paragraphs I guess because this is a blog so let's make it look like a blog save that and let's also give it a horizontal line to make it look neat save this let's load it okay so we have this nice looking article and it has this image if you click on this image it will take us to edureka site so we go to edureka if we click that image let's add another article into this just to make it a little longer so let's copy down this div 
So let's change the date first because let's say we post it on the next day. Let's change the title. So the my second blog post. Save it. Let's remove the image from this one to make it a little different. Yeah. So now if you see, we have this nice looking blog post going on. It has this horizontal line. We have some quote out here. And that's how you can do stuff with HTML. So what exactly is CSS? Well, CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets and is generally used to control how HTML tags and elements are displayed on your screen. So this means basic styling of your web page is controlled by CSS. Now CSS was actually made to solve problems that were introduced in HTML 3.2. Now HTML 3.2 got in some new attributes like font color, background color, which generally was pertaining to styling of a element on a web page. Now, while this did add some very, very needed functionality into HTML 3.2, it cluttered up your code as a developer and made your life pretty miserable. So to keep the structure of your web page, which is the HTML, and to make the styling a different aspect, CSS was made by W3C. So W3C stands for the World Wide Web Consortium and CSS till date is still being maintained by the W3C developers. Okay, so that was a general introduction to CSS. Now let's move ahead. So this is the basic syntax of CSS. You basically have selectors, which selects or targets the place that you want to attach your styling to. Then you have basic properties and value pairs. Now you can include your CSS into your HTML with a link tag while putting the href attribute as the file name. Or you can do some inline CSS, but that's not actually recommended because that's the problem that we are actually trying to mitigate by putting CSS as a different file. Also, if you don't want to create another CSS file, you can do some internal CSS by putting in some style tags in your head tag and just writing some normal CSS to it. Okay, so now let's see the different type of CSS selectors. So these are all the different type of CSS selectors and basically a selector is a way of targeting an element on a web page. So the star selector selects all the elements and applies the CSS that you would apply to it. And then if you would say div, then it would apply your CSS to all the divs. Now div comma p will apply to all the divs and paragraphs. Div space p will put your styling to all the paragraphs inside divs. Now going through all the CSS selectors is a pretty cumbersome job. So I recommend that you go through this page on W3 Schools, which has all the different types of selectors and the different types of pseudo selectors all listed out. So this will very much help you when you're doing your own CSS. So always keep this page open. Now, just for basic sake, let me just tell you about pseudo selectors. So we also have pseudo selectors, which is defined something like this. So pseudo selectors include stuff like hover, active, visited, and stuff like that. Now, suppose you were hovering over an A tag. So you can say there is supposed to be some specific styling when you're hovering over it. So how would you do that? You would just say A colon hover and then you would actually specify the styling that you want. Now you could also find all these types of pseudo selectors out here and it's all listed out here. So A visited, like select all visited links, something like that. Now, I also want to make you all aware of the box model that is very much used in CSS. Now, box model has four things, the content, padding, border, and margin. So content is the basic content of the web page that you want to show to you, your general audience. Then the padding is the space between your border and the content itself. The border is a line that can be of any size, color, and width. And then there's a margin, which is the distance from the edge of the screen to the border. Okay. And now the box model looks something like this. So the content comes in between, then comes the padding, which is between the border and the content. And then there's the margin, which is between the screen and the border itself, the screen edge and the border, right? So that's how the box model works. Now the last bit of basics is the CSS units. So there are four kinds of units. Firstly, we have the pixel. So pixel is represents any pixel on a device. So you could say something like font size is equal to 25 pixels. So it'll make it actually 25 pixels. Then there's also points, which is mostly used in print media. And all you need to remember to use points correctly, that 72 points equals one inch. Now the last two types of units are relative units. Now these are relative to your current font size. So one EM or 100% is actually equals to your current font size. So if you want something to be double your font size, all you have to say is two EM. So these are how relative units work in CSS.
Okay, so that was all the basics of CSS and how you select stuff and all the units. Now let's get ahead and code some of our own CSS. So for this time, I've actually created a bunch of HTML pages and we're gonna style these HTML pages by adding some CSS into them. And this will stand as good practice for CSS alone. Okay, so for the first page, we have this page called page1.html and it's a pretty basic page. Let me just open it up and show it to you guys. So this is what it looks like without any sort of CSS being attached to it. Now we're gonna create some CSS and we're gonna try and practice First of all, selecting stuff in different ways possible. Okay, so firstly, let's do some very random CSS, okay? Firstly, let's target all the divs in this HTML. So how would you actually do that? Well, you'd say div by going selectors and let's actually save this as a CSS file first so that our syntax is colored properly. Okay, so that's a div. So that's how you select any element in CSS. Now suppose we were to say background color or rather just background it will be purple and the text or the color of the text will be white. So now everything inside a div will look like that. So now let's just save this as page one. As it's saved as page one dot CSS let's reload our page and everything that is inside a div now has a white text and it also has a purple background. Okay. Now let's see how we actually select IDs. So we select IDs with the hash. So we have an ID called quote out here if you go and see. So where is that thing gone? Okay, so this paragraph out here that you see has the ID called quote. So we're gonna select that and put in some of our own CSS. So let's see. Now that we've selected our ID, we can say, suppose we wanna change the font family. So we could say font family is Verdana and you could also put in alternate font families just in case Verdana doesn't exist in your system like Kilsans. Fine. So that's how you set up your font family. Let's also set the color to be black. Let's see what changes now. So this is the code that I was talking about. So that font should change now. Let's reload. Oh yes, now the font has become Verdana. And that's what we exactly want. And the text is also black now. Okay, so how do we select classes now? So if you go here and see, we should have a class called movies. Right. So all these have a class called movie, all these A tags. So let's select them. So first of all, to select a class, you say dot and then you say the class name. Now we could put in some random CSS into this again. So let's make the color, let's keep it white and let's make the background steel blue. Let's see. So where are our movies? Let's see where the movies actually exist. Oh yeah, Dota, Splinter Cell and God of War. These are the movies, so these should now change. Let's save it. And now they have a background color of steel blue and they have a text color of white. And that's exactly what we defined out here. Fine. Now let's try out some other kinds of selectors. So suppose in the span out here, we have this ID called author. So what if we only want to target that? What would we say? So we could say span and hashtag author. Now you could put any type of CSS. So let's say text transform. So this is how you transform any sort of text and you could say uppercase. Now the author will be changed to uppercase out here and this is the author, the Pope Alexander part. Now watch that, now it's just uppercase and we have selected it with this selector called span and hashtag author. We can also do some other kinds of selecting. Let me just show it to you. So we could select the allies of the unordered list or the ordered list. So our skills is the ID. This is the ID of skills. So let's select them now. So we have skills and we could go the ordered list and then the li and what we want to say out here is the color will be purple. We can do the same thing for the unordered list too. Let me just copy that down. Put this here, say unordered list and let's say we change the text color to white. Save that, let's reload our page. So wait, first of all, let me uncomment this. Now let's save it again, reload our page and see the differences.
now since we had given it a purple color it's now all purple and let me just put a background of white so that you can see it yeah now these are purple and these are background white we can do the same for the unordered list too let me just uncomment that let me also give it a background of purple or actually let it be like that let's just make it blue now sass and hamel have turned into blue as you see out here this is the blue thing fine now that was selectors okay now let's go ahead and select some other stuff so what if we want to select all the paragraphs that are after the h3 tag so if you remember we can do that by saying h3 plus p and let's say we want a background of black and some text color that is white so color white not being very creative with my css at this moment because this is just about selecting so let's see how that reloads yep now we have a color of white and a background of black and that only selected the paragraph just after the h3 which is my favorite video games okay we can also select every paragraph that has a class by just saying something like p and class we don't even need to specify the color or i mean the class name so you go background let's say we want to give a gray background let's see all the paragraphs of the class so this is the only paragraph with the class now you can do the same thing for IDs, just say ID out here and let's see all the paragraphs with an ID. So this is the only paragraph with an ID. Okay, so now that we're done with selecting stuff, let's go and actually see how text can be transformed with the use of CSS. Fine. So first of all, I already have a page created for that. So this is going to be our page that we are going to use to see how text is transformed. If you see I have an ordered list with all the types of text transformations or the text stylings that I want to show and we also have a paragraph out here which will show the basics box elements like the borders margins and padding so I'm going to demonstrate that through this PID out here right so let's get started first of all let's create our CSS file and in the CSS file we're going to save it and we're going to call it page 2.css right then yeah it's connected as page 2 so let's get started so first of all let's target this ID with lorem so lorem ipsum is just some Latin paragraph that is normally used in web development to fill in spaces with text where you can always come back and delete that text and fill it with something more meaningful so for now we are going to be using this lorem ipsum thing so it's in a paragraph tag with an ID of lorem so let's go ahead and select it so we are going to select it with the help of the ID, call it lorem. Now, first of all, let me just show you what the page looks like without any CSS attached to it. So this is what the page looks like, right? So this is the part that we are going to target right now. First of all, let's give it a background of black. Let's make the color of the text white. Let me show you what that looks like. Okay, right? Now let's give it some borders and padding. So first of all, to give a border, we could say we use the border act property, then we give three parameters. The type of the border, the size of the border, and then the color. And you do it something like this, 3px, solid, red. Now, apart from solid, there are a lot of types of borders, and those include dashed, dotted, rigged, and many more. These are the ones that are just from the top of my head. So you can try out them out and you can find other types of CSS border just by going to Google and saying CSS border types. So these are all the types of borders that you get and you can definitely check them out. It's impossible to show everything in one video like that. So let me just show you the solid type. So let's save it and let's see what kind of border we actually get. Let's close this down. Yeah, now we have this neat little border of three pixels in size and red in color. Now let me just show you how dotted would look like. So this is what dotted looks like and this is what dashed looks like. Fine. And this is what dashed is. Okay. Now let's also give this thing some padding. Now padding exists between the content and the border. So I just explained the box model when we were discussing the basics of CSS. So I hope you remember that. So for padding there are four parameters actually. The right, top, left and bottom. So you can define your pad something like this. You can go 13 pixels, 13 pixels, 13 pixels, and 20 pixels. Now these are just very arbitrary numbers. But what I want to explain is that this first part will mean that there's 13 pixels of padding from the top. And then we move via in a clockwise fashion. 
So this is on the right, this is in the bottom, so 13 pixels are padding in the bottom and 20 pixels are padding on the left. Now you could also say this really easily if you want to give equal amounts of padding suppose. Now this means that there will be 13 pixels of padding on the top and bottom and this second part would mean that there's 13 pixels of padding on the left and the right and if you just put one digit that means there's 13 pixels of padding all around it. Now let's go and put these different paddings around lorem ipsum. Now it looks much neater. We can also put a margin. So let's put a margin and the margin also works in the same way. So suppose you were to say 5 pixels, that means it would give a 5 pixel margin all around your content. If you were to put say 10 pixels and 20 pixels, this means that 10 pixels of margin on the top and bottom and 20 pixels of margin on the left and right. And there's also another keyword that I want to make you aware of and that is auto. So what auto does is it gives equal amounts of margin however you specify it. So out here it'll give 10 pixels of margin on the top and bottom and equal amounts of margin on the left and right. So let's see how that works. Yep, so that's how it changed it. Now that was all about the box modeling. So let me just remove this part from the HTML and let's remove this part from the CSS. Now as you guys can see, I have this ordered list out here. First of all, let me reload the page. Now I have this ordered list out here which shows us all the types of styles and weights and sizes that I'm going to be showing right now. And this will include a lot of the units that we discussed like M's, points, pixels and percentages. So let's move ahead. So to select these I'll be using these IDs. So let me just remember the first four IDs is normal, italic, oblique and small cap. So let's go ahead and create them. So firstly let's select our normal ID and say what are we going to try and show here is font style so all you have to say is font style is normal so normal basically means that the font style will be normal instead of something bolded then i think we had italic so you go font style italic then we also had oblique so you go font style oblique and we also had small caps so let me just see that again yep it's small cap so you go small cap and what are we trying to show in small cap is the font variant. So font variant small caps. So let me just reload and see how that changed stuff. Okay, so font style normal just stays normal while italic and oblique are almost similar. Then in font variant small caps, this is how it would look like where the first letter has a bigger font size and the rest have a smaller font size but everything is in capital. And next is the font weight. So let's see the IDs. It's normal, bold, bolder. So let's go with that now. So firstly we have normal. So font size is the size or weight. It's weight. So font weight will be normal. Next part is bold, bolder, lighter. Okay. So we select bolder like that. We go font weight is bolder and we can say again, let's first after bolder, it's bold. Okay, we so W bold and you go font weight is bold. Let's see how that changes stuff. So yeah, bold is bold and font weight bolder is slightly more bolder while font weight normal is absolutely normal. Right, time for some more. So the next is the font size, which goes from extra large, large, medium, small, extra, extra, small. So let's do that. So first is extra extra large and this is the font size that we're talking about. So it's extra extra large. There's also extra large. So extra extra large looks something like this. While only extra large looks something like this. Fine. Then we also have large. So font size will be large. So that's font size large. Next we have medium, small and extra, extra small. So medium, small and extra, extra small. So this is going to be font size, medium. This is going to be font size, small. And this is going to be font size, extra, extra small. So let's see how that changes stuff. So this is extra, extra small, this is small and this is medium. Now the next thing that we're going to see is how points work. So our size is going to be 25 points. So instead of just doing that, let me just change extra extra small 
and let's say it's 25 points. You should remember that one point is around two inches. So that's how font size extra extra small would look like if it was 25 points. Then we could also say the font size is 150%. So that shows us how percentages works, where 100% means the current font size. Look at the change, and that's how 150% means. The next thing that we want to show is line height. So let's say, what is the ID? Let me just check the ID. So the line height IDs are line normal, height 25 points. So let's just select one line normal, and this is going to have a line height of normal. Let's put a semicolon, save it up, and that's how line height normal is. That is the normal line height. Now you could say your line height is 25 points, and that's how it would change. Also, you could say your line height is around 25 EM, or just 5 EM, let's say that. And that's how it would change even more with EM, with 1 EM being the constant font size that we are using, or you could say line height is 200%. That is basically twice of what our line height or font is. So that's how it would change, right? So that was all about text styling. Now let's move ahead and see how positioning and stuff takes place in CSS. So for positioning, I have again gone ahead and created this page3.html. So in here, we will be including a CSS page called page3.css. So let's go ahead and create that. First of all, we have to set this to CSS, save it as page3. And let's get started. So first of all, we have three types of positioning in CSS. Absolute, fixed, and relative. So first of all, I'm gonna show absolute positioning to you guys. Now before I show absolute positioning, let me just show you guys how text and stuff can be centered, first of all. So let's start doing some random CSS. So first of all, we are gonna target this ID called container. So let's go hashtag container and let's go to background some random color so for color picker we just go color picker let's give us uh, this background go okay that's the background we chose let's also give it some borders border will be two pixels solid and black we can also set up a border radius so border radius gives you a curved border so you could say border radius is around five pixels let's say now let me just open up the HTML file that is concerned at this moment. So this is page three. Okay, so this is with some CSS. Now let me just uncomment that CSS first. So this is what our page would look like without any sort of CSS. Now this is what it looks like with the CSS that we just included. Now to make you aware of how box radius works, let me just uncomment that first. Let's comment it out so box radius should not work. And we should get, yeah, now if you see, let's zoom in out here. You see that this border is pointed. Suppose we don't want that to happen. Let's remove that first. And let's uncomment this. Save it. Let's reload. And now we have this slight little curved border which looks much neater. Okay. Now we can also center stuff. So a neat way to do that is, let me just show it to you. Let's take this part called centered. Now to center it, let me just give it a first background to make it look different. So this background will be, let's say, 89 CFF0. So that's our color. Let's see what our color looks like. So that is the color that we are going to center. Now, let's say our width is going to be, we can set the width of elements like this. So you say width is 50%. And then you go margin is going to be auto. So what does auto do? It'll put an equal margin on all sides. Let's reload our page. Yep, and now it's centered. We can also center without actually centering the element. We can just center the text by just saying text, align, and center. Fine. Now that will remove the background and just keep the text out here. So that's exactly what we wanted. And that's how you align your text. Okay, now let's move ahead with absolute positioning. Now, absolute positioning means positioning based on the document itself, which means this whole web browser. So a browser is basically the document that you are actually manipulating. So it's called document object manipulation, if you've heard of that term. So let's go ahead and let me just show you how absolute positioning works. 
So first of all we have this element called top left and we're going to try and put it on the top left. So let's select that first. So you go top left. Now let's give it a background. Okay, that'll go to be the background. Now let's also give it a border. So let the border be one pixel solid and black. Let's say now to position something with absolute positioning, all you have to say is position is absolute. Now let's also keep the width around 200 pixels and the height also around 200 pixels. Let's save it. Let's see how stuff changes. Let me just zoom out. Yeah, so that is our element. So this is what top left and bottom right is going to look like. Now we are going to try and select this element and put it in the bottom right of this parent. So let me just show you how that is done. So to select that, I've already created an ID for it and it's called bottom right. Let me give it a background of white. And you say the position is absolute. Now we want to change the position to actually inside the element. So we have to say it's going to be zero pixels from the bottom and also zero pixels from the right. So since it is, has absolute positioning, it's going to position this inside of this. So first of all, let's give it a background of white and also make the color black. All right. And now we have this right where we want it. Now there's also something called the Z index. So Z index is what comes first on your screen basically. So if you have multiple things that are stacked on top of each other with absolute positioning, the one with the most Z index will be the one that is shown on top. So you can set a Z index like this and say the Z index is five. So anything with a Z index of four will actually come underneath this thing, right? So that was all about absolute positioning. Now let's go ahead and do some fixed positioning. So for fixed positioning we have this ID called fixed which contains a paragraph saying I'm staying right here. So let's select that first. Let me just remove all this stuff so that it's not cluttered anymore. Let me reload the page. Save it, reload it and that's how. So I'm staying here first of all. This is what is going to change. Fixed positioning. Right? Is that what we called it? Fixed position. Okay. Now, first of all, all you have to say is position is going to be fixed. Now, let's make it more prominent by giving it a background of black and a text color of white. So, let's see. This has become black and position is fixed. What do I do? If I'm scrolling, it just stays there. It doesn't really matter what I do to this thing. Okay, so that was all about fixed positioning. Now the next thing that we're going to see is relative positioning. So for that I already have two elements created. So let's say these are the divs which says this is going to be relative. So relative positioning as I was just saying is positioning based on the relative position of the element. So let me just show you. So relative one. Now let's give it a background first. So let's just select some color. Let's make this green, this green out here. Okay, that's going to be our color. Let's give it a border of one pixel solid black. And let's say the height is going to be around 100 pixels. Now we're going to select another element and position it relative to this element. Okay, so that is this element uh, right out here is going to be relative to. So to set something with the position of relative, all we have to say that the position is relative. And the less rest of the CSS is just arbitrary. So let's say left, not padding left. So you want to position it somewhere left of it and the positioning is going to be relative. So 20 pixels from the original positions, 20 pixels to the left from the original position I mean. And you could say from the top it would be around 30 pixels. You could also say negative 30 pixels to move it the other way around. Let's give it a background. i am already given it a background. Okay, let's give it a background of yellow. So you say background equals yellow and you could also give it a border and say 1px solid blue. Let's get a blue background. Okay. So this relative layout is going to be positioned relative to this thing. Fine. Let's just reload and see. Yep. And that's how relative positioning works. Now this might just not look neat at this moment, but I'm trying to drive a point home. Fine. Okay. Now let me just see uh, if I have dog.jpg. Okay. There's a PNG file called edureka. 
let me just show you something first of all let me just remove everything from here okay so now that our things are less cluttered and let me just rename this now to the image that is already there so edureka.png and edureka.png fine let's save this let's see what our page looks like now so this is what it looks like now you can float stuff like images to the left and right so let's just select the image tag and suppose you say float them to the right these will float everything to the right now that's how you position stuff or images with the float tag so I guess that was all about positioning of stuff now let's move ahead okay so in this part we are going to be learning about overflows so for overflows what we can do let's say let's go back to page 2.html and we have this text out here or this unordered list and this list is pretty big right first of all let's open up a new page or rather let's open up uh, okay wait let me just close these out so let's save this as page 2 dot CSS or rather let's just call it something new. first of all let's set this to CSS right let's save it and let's call it overflow now what I want to show you guys is something really cool so let's select the ordered list so that's what we're gonna select let's say it has width of around 100 pixels it has some padding from the top and right so let's get some padding of 10 pixels and 10 pixels all around rather let's give it a margin of 100 pixels and auto so we'll bring it right to the center let's see so it was page 2 that we we're fiddling around with so this is page 2.html now let me just replace this with overflow dot CSS let's see now yeah so this is what it looks like now if you see to scroll through this list is quite cumbersome because you have to actually scroll like this let's give it a background also background is gonna be black as I just love black and the color of our font is gonna be white see how that change yep so this is what it looks like now what if you do and say max height is equals to 500 or rather only 200 pixels yeah so that doesn't really do much so if you say overflow is auto you get a scrolling bar or you could say overflow is scroll let's remove this max height now you see we have these little scroll bars out here and that's what exactly overflow does it's basically shows us the items and you can scroll through them yeah basically like that so if you were to say that the width is only suppose 50 pixels let's say make this even smaller yeah so that's how it, now you have this little scroll bar and let's just scroll through stuff so that's how overflow works okay now let's look at some pseudo selectors or some pseudo classes that we can select and style so first of all let me open up the page that is going to be responsible for that so we have this page out here that i've created now it also has some new tags that you might be seeing these are some html5 tags so header tag nav tags and then the main tag these are just some new tags that you see in html5 and you can also target them through css3 so targeting them is pretty easy but what i want to show is something pretty cool let's save it first let's create a new page let's call it CSS right so let's save this first as page 5 dot CSS okay so now it's time to practice some more CSS and we'll be doing it on this page that I've created so this page is kind of a big page to be honest it has quite a lot of paragraphs quite a lot of links a few images also I guess and they use a lot of the HTML5 tags that have been newly introduced like the header tag, the nav ID, or the nav tag, the main tag, we have section tags, and a lot of other tags like these. Now these tags can also be selected with the help of let's say CSS3, that's what we are learning. Okay, now let me just remove this part because we won't be needing that. Now let's go ahead and save our content and let me just show you what this actually looks like on the web page. So let's go ahead and open up page 5 and this is what it looks like on a web browser rather without any CSS attached to it. So let's transform this thing with the help of some CSS. 
So firstly, we've created this page called page5.css and we've already attached it to this page out here with the link tag and the href attribute. Now let's get started. So first of all, let me just actually make use of some pseudo selectors. So we have already discussed pseudo selectors while going over the basics. Now let me just show you how they work. So a hover is going to target all the a links while we are hovering over them. Now when we are hovering over them, we want the background to become black and text to become white. Right? So let's save it. Let's reload. Now if we hover over these, the background becomes black and the text becomes white. Right now, the same thing can be done with a lot of other selectors like this active. So when you click on a link, that means it's going to turn like that. So let's save it. Let's see. Let's reload our page. First of all, now you see when we hover, nothing happens. But once we click it, it becomes that black and white kind of thing. Right. We can also do this for visited and that will actually change the link when once it's been visited. So if we go and do this, open link in new tab. Well, it's not working out here, but if there was actually a database connected, you would actually see this to them. Now, suppose we want to select our body. Let's give it a background first of all. Get out the color picker. Let's give it a nice green background. Okay, now that's going to be our background for the body. Now, we also have a div with the ID of wrapper. So, let's go ahead and select that first. So, we say wrapper. Now let's give it some CSS. So we're going to say margin is going to be zero and auto. Now whenever you say zero, you do not need to actually specify the units. So we can just do that. We'll give it a background color of white. Then we'll give it a width of around 800 pixels. We'll give it a height of around 1000 pixels. Okay, now let's save that and let's see what it looks like now. So this is what it has turned to. Now we can also do some more stuff. So let's select some HTML5 elements like the header tag and let me just show you that CSS still works as we want it to. So let's give it some simple padding around zero pixels on the top, zero pixels on the right and we want to give some 10 pixels on the bottom and zero pixels on the left too. See what changes. Now we got that little change. We can also select stuff like with the IDs as I just showed you. Now let's select the navigation which has the ID of horse nav. Let me just check if I'm right. Yep, it's called horse nav with the N being capital. Now we can say stuff like so there's also the display attribute. This shows how elements will be displayed. Now they can be blocked or inline block, which means it'll be converted into an inline element. Now we could say display is blocked. And you could just give it some background just to make it more apparent. So let's give it a background color of black and make the color white. Let's see. Yep, that's how it's selected. Now you can also give uh, pseudo tags like this one out here, like visited, to IDs too. So let's say once we're hovering over the nav bar, we want this to happen. So let's save it. Now if we only hover over it, Will the change happen? So that's how that works. Now let's go over and see some word spacing. Now word spacing is used for mostly specifying the words. So let me just remove some stuff from here. First of all, let's remove all this. Right, let's remove the header tags. And we just need this part where we have all these paragraphs. So I'll be targeting the first paragraph to show you all word spacing. So it's going to be this one out here, right here. Fine. Let's save it. Go ahead here. Reload the page. Now this is what it looks like. Let's remove everything that we have already created. And let's just select para 1. I hope that's what it was called out here. So it is called para 1 indeed. Now we can go word spacing and just say Let's say, let's give it 10 pixels between the words. Right, so the spacing between these words in this paragraph should change now. Now that we've saved it, let's go ahead and reload. So yeah, now you can see that the word spacing for this, this out here is much more different. Now we can also do letter spacing the same way. So let's select paragraph 2 for that. So for letter spacing, all we have to say is letter spacing and then we could say something like 10 pixels. Now this will specify the letters and how they are spaced. Now you can see it looks this horrible thing is having 10 pixels of letter spacing. 
I also put some word spacing into this so let's see how that looks like let's put a word spacing of 20 pixels and make this even more ugly yep so that's what it would look like with word spacing and letter spacing so that was just for experimentation purposes and you can use that whenever you feel free to okay so another property that I want to make you all aware of that is in CSS is a clear property so the clear property makes sure that nothing actually appears before it so in this case the footer tag which is right about here which says only the copyright part now it is shown here this is the footer tag that we are talking about so we want to say something like let's say so you can say clear and both so that's how you specify clears. Okay, so let's give it a background color of black. Let's also say the color of the text will be white. Just to make it a bit more prominent. Yeah, so nothing actually appears before that. So that's how you use clear now. So there's also style types, also list style types. So let me just see. We have these lists out here, first of all, which says random one, two, three, random one, two, three. Now let's say first of all let's convert this into an unordered list so find all let's gonna replace that with unordered list right I just want to show it with unordered list first so let's say let's select all the ULs and let's say list style is gonna be none now if you see out here we have these bullet points and now we don't okay so you can also do these with ordered lists so let's go back and let's do control and ul find all let's select them let's make them ols ordered lists let's see now ol doesn't work with list type none if you just realized now we can do something like alpha lower alpha so let's see that how that works okay so for lower alpha we have to say list style type please remember that that was my mistake right now okay if you have to select the ols again now you see that we have these list types that is saying with small caps now there are other stuff like lower latin also lower latin so let me just show you what that looks like save it okay that doesn't really change because i don't think i have latin installed but we can also go greek there's a bunch of stuff that you can do and it's pretty fun so i have greek installed now it goes alpha beta gamma instead of abc and that's how you can change stuff you can also change the position of the list style so list style position you could say outside so let's see what that means and doesn't really change much out here but that's one of the properties that I just wanted to show okay now you can also place contents before an element so let me just show you how to do that let's clear all of these things now so let's say we want to select par 1 and say so this is going to be a pseudo selector again so you say after you say content and your content is gonna be let's say at the rate say all these at the rates are gonna be before this little thing out here so let me just show you the change yep so since we said after it has all these at rates after but if we say before this is how it'll change so now it's all before them right okay now let's go ahead and see how we can use the nth child elements so for that we're gonna select our ul again actually let me go ahead and delete everything first of all okay so let me create another html boilerplate and this is going to be called list so first of all let's say we have an unordered list with a bunch of list items so allies all around let me just copy that down and paste it a few times right so now we have all these list items here let's just fill them up with some random text okay so let's just say something random like cats so let's save this let's go out here now we have these things called cats okay so what if we want them to have alternate paragraphs I mean alternate background colors so first of all let's go ahead and select the allies and give them a background let's say this gray color that I have selected f7 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 now you see we have okay this doesn't seem to be working allies looks like I've deleted my link tag that's why the CSS was not working so let's see now we have that okay so first of all let's go back and change this to f7 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 right this will give it this gray color that you see out here it's also give it the width of around 360 pixels so that'll bring it there 
let's also give it a margin of 100 pixels from the top and equal on the side let's bring it to the center right now suppose you want to say li nth child and you could say something like 2n so this will select all the even childs and you could say they have a background color of white so let's see how that changes things for us now you see that all these things out here have an alternating background color where it's gray, white, gray, white, gray, white. And that's how you select all the even childs. Now you can also select the first child by saying first child. For that we do not really need this 2n counter. And now only the first is black. You could also say last child and now the last will be white. And that's how stuff changes with CSS. Okay. Now you can also change the first line so let's go ahead and change our HTML up a bit so let's create a paragraph and it's gonna have some lorem ipsum in it so let me just show you something really cool let's delete all of this stuff let's select our paragraph and we're gonna say the pseudo selector called first line and let's say text transform uppercase so let's reload that first of all let me just comment this out just to show you what the page looks like without any css so this is our page without any css and let me uncomment this now save it and there you go the first line has been completely made uppercase now instead of first line you could also say last line last line and that will transform the last line to uppercase you could also say something like first letter and okay so just to show you that it does indeed work let me just reload this without any CSS first okay now you see that the lorem ipsum begins with the lowercase l now let me just uncomb this out save it and now you see that the first thing is a capital you could also change it to say stuff like text size or rather font size and say around 100 pixels now the first letter will be 100 pixel big and that's how you can do stuff like that okay so another thing is you can also change the pointer or the cursor so let's see when you're hovering over a paragraph let's say P and hover first of all we want the background to become black we also want the color to become white and we want the cursor to become pointer so let's see so when you're hovering over it, it becomes this hand-like thing and when you go out, it becomes back to normal. So that's how you can change the cursor also. Now let me show you all something called a box shadow, first of all. So let's remove this cursor part. So without the cursor, it looks something like this. Let's remove the hover tag. So that's always there. Right. Okay, now let's also change this to that gray color that I really like. And let's also change this to black so this is what it looks like now let's give it a width of around 400 pixels so this is what it looks like now let's also center it so that I can show you some cool stuff so margin let's say 0 and auto so this is going to center it from the top of the screen now that it's centered okay so this is what our thing looks like now suppose we were to give it a border so borders are really neat so 2px solid black so this is what a border looks like. But there are other stuff also, like a box shadow. So this is how box shadow works. It takes three parameters, so one is Z, X, and Y axis, and not really in that order, it's X, Y, and Z axis. And then it also takes a color. So let me just show you how that happens. So suppose we say zero X, zero Y, and let's say three pixels on the Z axis, rather five pixels to make it more prominent. And then it takes an RGBA of zero. We want to make it really, really invisible. So 0 0.5. So that gives it a half opacity. Now, you can see this really neat little shadow going all across our content. So that is what box shadow does. It's a neat little trick for when you don't want to use a border or something like that. Now, other than borders, there's also outline. Let's say an outline is black in color. So outline completely negates our box shadow. And you could also say outline equals none. So let's remove that now because box shadow looks really neat. Yep. Okay, so now let's talk about text decorations. So since we have some text already going up, let's decorate it. Now there are a few kinds of text decoration that I want to show. 
so the text decoration let's say so first say is line through just so put a line through all of the content so now it's all strike through you can also say something like overline or underline so let's see that underline will underline our text yep and overline as you might have guessed will overline our text now everything has a line on top of it fine now we can also set the visibility of our text or any other tag to be honest visibility so let's check out all the other visibilities that are there so to do that always go on Google and type visibility and CSS and let's see the visibility property and how it goes so you must understand that knowing everything in CSS is kind of impossible so you should always have a go-to or a backup so my backup is normally W3 school and they have everything regarding CSS and its properties these are all the properties that you want to go through and I'm mostly going through the most important ones in this tutorial that you may use in your day-to-day -day projects and topics but sometimes you might need the rare ones like counter reset, empty cells, flex, flex bases and all these stuff. And you can always go back to W3 schools and go through them. Now you can say visibility is visible or something like that and it should make it visible. Yeah. Right. So that was all about the miscellaneous types of CSS that we were handling. Now let's go ahead and see some gradients and how we can create some beautiful gradients using CSS. Okay, now before we move on to gradients, let me just show you some white spaces or some more text transformations. Right, so I already showed you all these text transformations. There's capitalize, there's lowercase, there's overline, line through, uppercase and underline. Now capitalize will just capitalize it, so I don't think I'm going to show that to you guys. Now let's close these two pages out here. Let's create our new CSS file and first of all let's set this to CSS. Let's save it and let's say it's going to be page 6.css. Now out here if you see you have a bunch of white spaces right. Now let's see how you can handle white spaces using CSS. So there is a thing called the ID called white space pre. I think that's exactly what it's called white space pre. Yep. Let's select that and you could say white space is pre. Let's see how that changes stuff. So first of all, let me load up page 6 for you guys. Right, let's remove the CSS, save it, let's reload it again. And what we are actually targeting is this part. White space will be preserved. Right, so white space will be preserved. Now, go ahead, uncomment that, save it, and let's reload. Now see, the white spaces that are in the HTML is preserved. Now, white spaces can also be handled in other ways. So, there are two things that I want to show. So, let's select this thing called never wrap. Never wrap, right? And we say that the white space is going to be no wrap. So, let's see how that works. So, first of all, this is what we are actually targeting, this Laura Mipsum part out here. And it's somewhat like this. And let's see how it changes now. And now you see that it goes completely out to the hair, so no wrap, it doesn't wrap it around. So you also have pre-wrap, so let me just show you how that works. So I'm going to be targeting this part out here with these weird kind of white spacing. So let's see, preserve wrap. So with preserve wrap, we go pre-wrap out here. And that's the property, so let's see, yep, lorem ipsum and the wrap has been preserved. Okay, now you can also set up the direction. So let me just show you how that's done. So we're gonna select these two things out here, left, right, and right, left. So hash, left, right, and also control C, and let's make this right, left. Fine, let's remove all the stuff for now, and let's remove everything before right, left too. Now that we've removed that, let's remove this, let's save it, let's see. Okay, so this is what it looks like right now. And all you have to say is direction is L to R. So that means left to right. And out here you say direction is RTL. Let's see how that changes stuff. So I prefer right to left and I prefer left to right. So that's how it's working. Fine. 
So that was all about white spacing and directions. Now let's move on to gradients and animations. So this is going to be the last part and the most interesting part in my opinion. So gradients are those beautiful backgrounds you see on most websites and to generate your gradient you can always use this thing called a gradient generator. So this gradient generator out here is a really nice gradient generator. You have to select the direction and you select the ending colors. So I've already selected a gradient out here. It's going to create this gradient. Now let's see. Go to page 7. Right. Now let's select the body tag. Let's close this off. Let's close this off. I want to save this and let's create a new page first of all. And this is going to be our CSS. So we have to save it and say page 7. Right. Now we select our body and just paste in. So let me just explain how this happens. So there's a linear gradient and there's also another thing called radial gradient. So I'll just show you that. Now this takes in a few parameters. The first is to the right, that's the direction. And this is how the colors will change. So let's just see how that works. So first of all, let me comment this out. Let me just open page 7 for you. Now if you see, it's going to be a blank page. Okay, this is a gradient. I'm sorry. Let me save that. Right, so this is where it looks without a gradient, and you already saw where it looks with a gradient, but let me just show it to you again. This is where it looks with a gradient. Now you can also set the background with other stuff, like a uh, image. So for that you go URL, and you can paste in the URL. So let's go and search for a beautiful image. I really like Dragon Ball Z, so Goku Super Saiyan 3. So that should be a good image to save as a background. So let's see, this looks like a really nice image. So you go here. Let me just save this image as. So this is going to be Goku. And it's going to be saved in desktop and in CSS tutorial. It's going to be Goku.jpeg. Right, so you can say Goku.jpeg. Right, now that's saved, let's go back to our page and it should have a picture of Goku. Okay, so that didn't work. I think I got something wrong. Let's go and analyze that. Let's open up our CSS tutorial. Okay, so it's a JPG file and not JPEG, so that was our mistake, small mistake nonetheless. And now we have this picture of Goku. Now you can also set the background repeat. Let's close this off, say background repeat, and you could say no repeat, and it will not repeat the background anymore. Or you could say background repeat is going to be, let's check out all the background repeats that are actually available. Now background and repeat. So if you go into background repeat and see the properties you can just try it yourself. So you can repeat it according to the y-axis, you can repeat it according to the x-axis. So let's see how that works. So repeat x. So if we say that I think it should repeat it on the x-axis like it was or you could repeat it on the y-axis. I don't think that will show up out here but let's see. Yep, it's now repeating on the y-axis. So that's how background repeat also works, so we've covered that too. Now we've also covered the gradients, now it's time we do some radial gradient. Now if you remember, let me just go back to the gradient part. So if you have a radial gradient, all you have to say is that it's a radial gradient out here. And a radial gradient doesn't really need direction because it's going to be radial. Save it page and let's reload it okay now we have a gradial radial now you see all these lines going in but if I just zoom out you can see that it starts from the center and spreads out where it's white on the sides and white on the sides so that's how radial gradients work okay so now that we've covered the gradients let's go into animation so I think animation is the most interesting thing that you can do with CSS so we have selected the div so first of all let's give the div a border Mm, so this border is going to be 2 pixels solid and black. Now let's give it a background to begin with. Let's say it's going to be of red. Now this is how you do animations in CSS. Okay, so before animations actually, let me show you how you can move this thing around. Fine, so there are some stuff that I want to show you guys. So let this be. Let me just show you what this looks like. So let me give this a width first. It's going to be 4, um, 100 pixels or rather 200 pixels. And the height will also be 200 pixels. Now let's see. 
Okay, we have this div out here. Let's make it a little bigger. Give it 500 and 500. Save it. Yep. Let's also make this much more prominent. Let's go to 10 pixel background. I mean a 10 pixel border. And now you see we have a really prominent square out there. Now let's try some really interesting stuff. So let's say div and when we hover over the div you want to scale this. So scale and let's say we want to scale. Okay so that's not how you scale. First you say transform and how do you want to transform? You want to scale it and you want to scale it twice. So when we hover over it, it should scale twice. Let's reload and as you see it's scaling twice. Now we can also transform some other stuff like this so we can rotate. So we can say rotate 45 degrees. Let's see when I hover it's rotating 45 degrees. You can also skew it. So skewing is how it works. Let's see. You can skew it 20 degrees to the x-axis and 10 degrees to the y-axis. Save it and this is how it gets skewed, this is how skewing works. You can also translate stuff. So this is, let me show you how translation works. So translate and let's see you want to translate at 20 pixels and 20 pixels. So let's see. Hover over it and it translates a little. Let's translate it around 120 pixels just to make it more clear. 120 and 120. Let's save that. Let's reload this and you see that now it's translating so much. Right? So that's how translate works. Okay, now that I've showed you scale, rotation, skewing and translate. Let's see, we can also set up the transitions. So with transitions you can set up a lot of stuff. So now that we're done with transitions, let's go ahead and see some animation. So for animation, I'm going to be actually targeting this div out here. So let's actually style this div. I've given it the width of 100 pixels and a height of 100 pixels, and a background of red and a border of 3 pixels, solid and black, let's say, right? Let's see what that looks like. Now that's what it looks like. Fine. Let's zoom in a bit. Now, all we need to do is actually set up some keyframes. So we do that by saying keyframes. Now we name our keyframes. Let's call it anime and we have to set up actually what it will look like at different points in time. So we do that by saying 0% and it'll have let's say a background color of red and then it'll move so we want to move it in the square so let's say it'll be not padding rather it'll be 0 pixels from the left and from the top it's gonna be 0 pixels. Let's save that copy that down Let's paste that a bunch of times. Now, what I want to say is this is going to be 25, it's going to be 50, it's going to be 75, and this is going to be 100. Let's save that. Let's change their colors. So, this is going to be yellow first, then changes to green, some pretty basic colors, blue then, and in the end, we'll change it to red. So, that brings us back to the original position. Let's first also move it by 300 pixels. Then let's move it 300 pixels both ways. Now it's only going to move 300 pixels this way. And in the end, it comes back to the original position. Now, to use this keyframes animation, we have to give this animation name. It's going to be using the animation with the keyframes name anime. Now we can say the animation delay is going to be 2 seconds. You can also say how many times it's going to be iterating. So you can say that by 100. Let's save that. Okay, so our animation is not working because we haven't set the positioning. So now let us just save this and let's say our position is going to be relative. Let's save that. Let's uncomment our animation. Now you see that our animation will work as we intended it to. So after two seconds, our animation starts working and this will just keep going on and on. Now if you want to actually repeat that animation, there's a way you can do that. And that is with the animation iteration count. Let's say you want to iterate it a hundred times. Let's reload. Let's wait for two seconds and voila, our animation will keep going on and on and on. So that's how you animate stuff with CSS guys. So what is JavaScript? Now JavaScript is basically a high level interpreted programming language which is used to make web pages more interactive. Now it all started in the year 1995 when Brent and I created JavaScript in a span of 10 days. Since then it has seen multiple versions, updates and has grown to the next level. 
Now JavaScript is basically the language of the web. So it is used to make the web look alive by adding motion to it. Not to be more precise, it is a programming language that lets you implement complex and beautiful things or design on web pages. Now let's move on and see what can JavaScript do. So basically there are a lot of queries about why do we need JavaScript and what it can do when we have HTML and CSS already. But JavaScript as a language helps you build a website that will do a lot more than just gawk at you. Now currently we have hundreds of programming languages and every day new languages are being created. Now among these are few powerful languages that bring about big changes in the market and JavaScript is definitely one of them. Now JavaScript has always been on the list of popular programming languages. According to Stack Overflow for the sixth year in a row JavaScript has remained the most popular and commonly used programming language. Now moving on to what this programming language can actually do. We see that JavaScript is mainly known for creating beautiful web pages and applications. Now an example of this is also the Google Maps. So if you want to explore a specific map all you have to do is click and drag with the mouse. And what sort of language could do that? Of course is JavaScript. Now this language is also used in smartwatches. Now the popular smartwatch maker Pebble created Pebble.js which is a small JavaScript framework that allows a developer to create an application for the Pebble line of watches in JavaScript. Not just that the most popular websites like Google, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon etc. make use of JavaScript to build their websites. Now among things like mobile applications, digital art, web servers and server applications JavaScript is also used to make games. A lot of developers are building small scale games and apps using JavaScript. Now a lot of people ask about where to run the JavaScript code. Now when it comes to running the JavaScript code you can use the console which is pretty simple because you can just type whatever you want to do with your code and you will see the output here itself or you can use any text editor. For example I will be using the Visual Studio code and show you how you can write your code here and then how you can run it in your website and see how it works. So you can work it both ways you can enter any data or input here and then you can go back to your console and check your output. Also if you have to check anything for your code you can check it inside the console itself. Now JavaScript was originally designed to run only in browsers. So every browser has what we call a JavaScript engine that can execute JavaScript code. For example the JavaScript engines in Firefox and Chrome are SpiderMonkey and V8. So it's pretty easy for you when it comes to running JavaScript code online. Now JavaScript can build the backend for our web and mobile applications. So in a nutshell JavaScript code can be run inside of a browser or in node browsers and node provide a runtime environment for our JavaScript code. So now that you know where the code runs let's move on and have a look at the different benefits of JavaScript. Now there has to be a reason why so many developers love working on JavaScript. Well there are several benefits of using this language such as it's easy to learn and simple to implement. Now it is a weak type programming language unlike the strong type programming languages like Java and C++ which have strict rules for coding. Now it's all about being fast in today's world and since JavaScript is mainly a client side programming language it is very fast because any code can run immediately instead of having to contact the server and wait for an answer. Not just that it has a rich set of frameworks like angular JS react JS which are used to build web applications and perform different tasks. Lastly it also builds interactive websites. Now we all get attracted to beautifully designed websites and JavaScript is the reason behind such attractive websites and applications. Now finally we will have a look at the setting up of the development environment or the IDE. Now there are different editors that you can use for writing your JavaScript code. So there's Visual Studio Code and then we have Sublime Text and then we have Atom as well. Now these are pretty famous and popular when it comes to working on any programming language. 
but when it comes to choosing the favorite one i would definitely opt for visual studio code so today i will be using the visual studio code in order to show you all the examples and also explain the fundamentals of javascript now out of these my favorite is the visual studio code it's simple and easy to run your codes here now to download visual studio code you just have to type download visual studio code and just go to the website code.visualstudio.com and get your version that is suitable for your system. Now it's a very simple lightweight cross platform and powerful editor. So if you don't have Visual Studio code on your machine, go ahead and download it right away. Now in order to become a front end developer, you should also be aware with HTML codes. So here we are going to use our HTML code as our host for the JavaScript. Now first thing first you must get this live server extension installed here before you try to run your JavaScript or HTML code here. So all you have to do is just go to the extensions and then search for live server. Now I have already installed this so you just have to install this before running any of these codes. So now that you are ready to learn how to code in JavaScript. Let's begin with the fundamentals. Now talking about the fundamentals, the first thing is the variables in JavaScript. Now this particular programming language includes variables which basically holds the data value and it can be changed anytime. So it uses a reserved keyword var to declare a variable. Now all your variables must have a unique name. So now let's get back to a Visual Studio code. So this is my basic HTML file here. So here I have the HTML head and title and after that I have the script tag as well. So inside my body I have a head tag that says welcome to Edureka which means when I go to my website it will show me this particular head tag that is welcome to Edureka. Now it's always a good practice to keep your script tag at the end because the browser parses this file from top to bottom. So if you put the script element here in the head section, you might have a lot of JavaScript code there. So your browser may get busy parsing and executing that JavaScript code and it won't be able to render the content of the page. Now almost always the code that we have in between the script elements needs to talk to the elements on this web page. For example, if we want to show or hide some elements. So by adding the code here at the end of the body section, we will be confident that all these elements are rendered by the browser. So here we use a variable to store data temporarily in a computer's memory. So we store our data somewhere and give that memory location and name and with this name we can read the data at the given location in the future. For example, think of the boxes that you use to organize your stuff. You put your stuff in various boxes and put a label on each of them so that you can find your stuff easily. Now a variable is basically like a box. So what we put inside the box is the value that we assign to a variable. Now that's the data and the label that we put on the box is the name of our variable. So let's see what's the code for declaring our variable here. Now in the old days we used to use the var keyword to declare a variable, but there are certain issues with that. So now we have started using the let keyword to declare a variable. So first we will use the let keyword here and then we have to declare a name for our variable. And your name should be something that is understandable or by looking at the code you can see that what you are trying to write. So here I have a code with the variable name. So I have given the name as edureka and then I'll just write console.log name. So now once I save this code and finally we will save this code with the extension .js. So this is our JavaScript file. Now in order to run this in your web browser you need an HTML file. So now this is where this file will come into existence. So here I have added one source which points to my JavaScript file. So here I have just given an extension as src equals to index1.js which basically takes me to my JavaScript file. So now when I run this HTML file, it will take me to the browser and you can see the heading here that is welcome to Edureka. Now how do I get this console? So you just have to right click on your website and go to inspect 
and once this window has come up you can just go to console now inside console you can see that you have edureka mentioned here why because we have declared a variable with the name edureka so our output was console.log name so as soon as we run this code and go to our console you can see edureka now in case i change the name for example i'm just changing the name to learn javascript now make sure you give something unique because you cannot use the keywords that are there in javascript as your variable names or any sort of value so here i have given the value for my variable as learn javascript now once i just save this and go back to my browser and once I refresh this you can see that it has been changed to learn JavaScript now previously it was edureka and now you can see that the name has changed to learn JavaScript because the value also has changed here so now that you have seen how this variable works here let me tell you about certain rules that you need to follow while writing the name of your variable now the first rule is that it cannot be a keyword that is it cannot be a reserved keyword in javascript for example let where these are all reserved keywords for javascript so you cannot use them as your variable name next up is you should always have a meaningful name so you must keep in mind that when you are giving a name to your variable it must be meaningful and understandable while just seeing the name itself also your name must not start with any number so how odd would that be to just have a name that begins with a number like one edureka or two edureka so it does not look good that way so you must not have a variable name that starts with a number next up you must keep in mind that there should not be spaces or hyphen when it comes to the name of your javascript for example i have written learn javascript here I can also just write it like this in order to separate the two things but there should not be a hyphen or a space in between the two words so you just have to write it together also the names here are definitely case sensitive that means if I write learn JavaScript like this and then I change it to learn JavaScript with a capital L these two will be considered as different names because it is case sensitive so now this was all about variables now let's move on and take a look at constants now by declaring a constant you basically assign a meaningful name to a value so once a constant is declared it cannot be modified or assigned any other value so now let's see how we can define a constant in javascript so for example you want to describe your name in two different parts such as the first name and the last name so suppose you have let first name is equals to edureka and then you have last name as javascript so here you would need a semicolon to separate the two things and declare it separately in such a manner but rather than doing this you can just use constants that makes your work easier so now let's see how you can use the constant in your javascript code so now let me just take the variable name as age so for age we have a specific value suppose i'm giving the age as 23 now when i type console.log age and then let me just save this one again and now once i go back to my website and refresh it you can see that it gives me the value 23 so here what I'm doing is I'm declaring a variable, but also I'm giving it a constant value. So now I cannot change the value of my age here. Now sometimes we don't want the value for our variable to change because otherwise it's going to create all kinds of bugs in our application. Now in those situations instead of a variable, we use a constant so that the value of a variable that is the name implies can change, but then the value will remain constant now in the next line i give age is equals to 21 and then now let me save this one and see what output do i get when i run this one so let me just refresh it so you can see that i get an error here because we have already declared a constant value for age which is 23 and again we are changing the value to 21 
So this will definitely give you an error. That is the uncaught type error assignment to constant variable. So here your variable age is a constant. You cannot assign any other value to this variable anywhere. So thus it will show you an error. So basically we cannot reassign a constant. So once you have used constant you cannot change the value. So the best practice is to use where whenever you're planning to change the value next. So now that you know what are variables and what are constants you must be wondering what are the kind of values that we can assign to these variables. So now let's move ahead and have a look at the different data types that you can use. So now here we have two different types. So first we have the primitive or the value types and then we have the reference types. First we will have a look at the different primitive types. Now the data types are basically the type of data that can be used and manipulated in a program. So the different data types include the numbers, strings, boolean, undefined and null. So now talking about these data types, let's go back to our code and see what are string literals, what are numbers, what are booleans. So let's just type let name equals to edureka. Then we have another variable as age which is equals to suppose 23. Now for checking boolean, let's just give another variable as is approved is equals to true. So true and false are the ones that represent our boolean values. So this one is basically our string literal and this one is our number literal. This one we are using for boolean. Next up if we just write let first name and put a semicolon it automatically gives an undefined value to this one. But we can also write it as first name is equals to undefined. So there's basically no value assigned to this particular variable. Now the final one is the null value. So let me just give it as let date equals to null. So now let me just save this and then let me go back to my console again. Now once I refresh it. So basically I have not given any console here. So there's no output in my console, but then you can always check the type of your literals here. So what I have to do is just type type of and then if I want to check the type of my variable name. So I can just give name and it shows me string. So here I have my name as edureka which is a string literal. So this is exactly the value that it is showing me here. That is the type of my name is string. Now let's check the type of age. So you can see that it shows number. So my age declares my number literal here. In the same way when we type type of is approved. Suppose I write type of is approved it will show me boolean. So you can see that inside the console itself you can find out the types of all of these variables. Now if I just want to check the type of my date so I'll just write type of date and it shows an object because we do not have any value here. We have a null value which is also considered to be an object in JavaScript. Now this is exactly where the reference type comes in. So these were the different primitive types. Now we will have a look at objects. So now that you have seen the primitive types in JavaScript we will have a look at the reference types in the reference type category. We have the object array functions. So now we will talk about these three different types. So first let's talk about the object. Now object in JavaScript and other programming languages is like an object in real life. So think of a person who has a name age address and so on. So here I have given three attributes to my particular object. Suppose the girl is my object. So I have three different attributes for this object that is name age and eye color. Now when we are dealing with multiple related variables we can put this inside our object. For example we have two variables name and age here. So what we can do is we can declare it as a property for our object. So we can refer these two as elements or properties for our object. This basically makes the code clear. So now let's see how we can declare an object in JavaScript. So let me just declare 
my variable as girl and inside girl I'll add properties for the girl so we have to begin with the curly braces so now inside the curly braces I will add the properties now the first property was name so let me just give the name as Emily and then we have the age as 23 and then we also have another property as eye color so it's brown now we separate these properties with the help of a comma now finally we close this curly brace along with a semicolon now I will just use the console.log and find the output for my object which is the girl so now let me just save this one and let's go back to the console and see how it works now inside this I will add the properties for my object which is the girl so here you have to give the name of your first property and then use colon and then I'll just write the name as Emily and we separate the properties with the help of a comma so the next property is age so I'll write it as 23 and then we need to close the curly braces along with a semicolon now I'll just type console.log and the name of my object that is girl and close it with a semicolon so here I have declared this variable or my object which is the girl and inside girl I have declared certain properties for the girl which is the name and the age now let me just save this one and go back to the console and see so you can see that once I run this code I'll get to see the properties for my object so it shows the name that is Emily and age as 23 now suppose we want to change the name of this particular object what do we do so this is exactly where we use the dot notation so what we will do here is we will just give the name of our object which is girl dot name suppose I want to change the name here so I'll just give the name is equals to and I'll give another name here suppose I want to give the name as John and then add the semicolon now let me just save this one and see what happens to the output so now once we go to the console you can see that the name has been changed to John here now this is one approach there's another approach that you can change in order to change the name so what you can do is use the bracket notation now what is this bracket notation so we can just type girl and use the square brackets so inside the square brackets I'll give the name that is for the variable that I'm planning to change so my name now will be equal to suppose I want to give the name as Sam so I just type Sam and close it with a semicolon and then now let me save this one now once I go back to my console and see you can see that the name is changed from John to Sam again so these were two different approaches that is the dot notation and the bracket notation through which you can also get into the property of your object and make any particular changes so now that you have learned how to declare an object let's move on and see what are arrays and how you can declare arrays in JavaScript now the JavaScript array object is basically a global object that is used in the construction of arrays which are high-level list like objects so now in case you have a list of products in a shopping cart or list of colors or list of items that are used in order to make a painting you will need to declare them with the help of arrays now declaring them just using variables would be hectic because you have to define all of them separately which might be a tedious task when your list is pretty longer so now here comes arrays to your rescue so let's see how the arrays work in JavaScript so I'm just going to give the name as items and inside this I will declare my array here for example I have certain items inside my list for example I have color then I have paintbrush and then I have a plate so suppose these are the items that are present in my list so what I can do is close it with a semicolon and then now I'll just use the console.log and I'll put items here now let me just save this and go back to the console and now once I refresh this you can see that it gives me the value and also what are the items in my list 
So you can see that I have added three different items in my list that is colors paint brush and plate. So it gives me the value of the number of items inside my list and also what are those different items. So now once I click here you can see that it also gives me the index value for each one of these items. So in array the index value always starts from zero and not from one. So you can see that the index value for color is zero and then for paint brush it is one and then finally for plate we have two. So basically the index value goes from zero. So here we have zero one two which means that the total length of the array is three. So now if you want to display any particular item you can just use this index value. So suppose I want to display the paint brush. So what I can do is use the square bracket give the value as one because the index is zero one two. So the index value for paint brush is one. So let me just save this one and now let's go back to the console. So you can see that the output it gives me is just paint brush because I have just given the console log item value as one. That means I only want to see the value that is there in the place of one. That is the index value should be one. Not just that you can also add something else in your list with the help of the index value. For example, I can just give the name and specify the index value where I want to add something. Suppose I want to add another item. So the index value will now be three because I want to add it at the end of my list. So I've just given the value as three and suppose I just want to add sprays. So I'll just type sprays semicolon and then I'll just save this code. So I'll add the item sprays here. Now let me just change this so that it shows me the value of all the items. And let me save this one. Now once I go back to my console and reload this now you can see that the value of the items have changed from three to four and also another item has been added to my list and also you can see the index value. So sprays come at the index value three. That's exactly what I have added and that is exactly where the value has been added to. Now here you don't need to have a similar type of data. That is if I want any number to be added here suppose I just want to add 100. So I can just add this number here and then save the code. So you can see that in the output it will give the value as color paintbrush plate and 100. So it need not be a similar data type. You can add different data types and also put it in the array itself. Now if I go back to my console and just type type of the name of my list that is I've given it as items you can see that it shows object. So you can see that array is basically a type of object. We can also use the dot notation here and find out various properties. So you can see that you already have different properties that you can find out. So let's just find out the length of my list. So we can just type length and let me just save this one. Now once we go back and refresh this you can see that it gives me the length as four. So basically with the help of dot notation you can also find out the values or different properties for your array. Now this was all about arrays. So we have seen what are objects and what are arrays. Now it's time to move on and have a look at functions in JavaScript. So functions in JavaScript are divided into two different types. First we have the predefined functions. And then we have certain user defined functions. So basically a function is a sub program designed to perform a particular task. Now functions are executed when they are called and values can be passed into functions and used within them. So now let's see how we can declare a function in JavaScript. So here I'll use the keyword as function for declaring any sort of function or the name that I'm going to provide to my function. So now let's see how we can declare a function. So I just want to view welcome to Edureka. So what I do is take the function keyword and suppose let me just type view and inside this I'll have to add the curly braces inside which I will have my console dot log. So I want to print welcome to Edureka. So now once I close this now after the curly braces we have to call the function now. So my function name is view 
so what I'll do is just call my function here and now let me just save this one so now once I go to my console and then I run this code you can see that it shows me welcome to edureka so what actually happened is I have used a function view and I have inserted whatever I want to display and after that I have called my function here so what happens is so inside console log whatever I have written is displayed in my output with the help of this particular function that has been called here now we can also add a parameter so let me just add a parameter inside my function so suppose I've added a parameter as name and here I'll concatenate that particular parameter so let me just type name here and then inside my function I will be typing whatever parameter I'm going to pass through it so inside my function I'll just write learn JavaScript so here I'm just passing a parameter inside my function so here I'm giving the name as learn JavaScript so let me just save this one and go back to the console so once we run the code you can see that it shows welcome to edureka learn JavaScript so the value has been concatenated here so you can see that there's a missing space here because in my code I haven't added the space so in order to add the space so you just have to leave it blank and then add it again and now once I save this code and go back to my console and run it again now you can see that there's a space after edureka because here I have added a space and then concatenated the name so now let's check for the value square so now let's see how the function works in JavaScript so here we have taken the keyword as function and we have given a name to our function suppose I want to find the square of a number so I have taken the function name as square so now inside the square I've given the parameter as number and then you have to open the curly braces inside which I'll return the value that I want as my output so here I want the square of the number so I've given the return value as number into number which will give me the square now you have to close the curly braces next up you will define the number now so here suppose I want to find the square for number 2 so I have defined the number here as let number equals to square of 2 so I want to find out the square of the number 2 and then finally console.log number now once we go to our console you can see that it has given me the output as 4 because the square of 2 is 4 and I have asked for the square of the number 2 so this is what the output is so now that you know how functions work in JavaScript let's move on and have a look at some conditional statements in JavaScript now what are conditional statements when we use the word as if else or we put certain conditions that is when the conditional statement comes in JavaScript so let's see how that works so first let's have a look at the if statement so suppose I'm declaring a variable here as number so let number equals to let it be an undefined array here next up I will define the array or I will provide a set of numbers inside this particular array so let me just define this and provide certain value so let my array be one four one two five two so these are the set of values that I have provided inside my variable next up here I will be using the if conditional statement so now inside if we are basically supposed to provide any particular condition so I have to find a condition here suppose I want to check if the number in position 0 is equal to the number in position 2 so this is the condition that I have provided here so now after the condition I will just try to get the output so I'll just give console.log so let me just say the answer would be yes so in case the condition is satisfied it will give me an output as yes so now let me just close this with a semicolon so now this is where and how we are using our if conditional statement so inside if we have just provided a condition for our variable that we are using so our condition is that to check whether the number in the position 0 is equal to the number in position 2 and in array as you remember the index always starts from 0 so we see that this is 0 1 2 so you can see that the numbers in position 0 and 2 are same so basically the output should be yes 
So now let me just save this one and go back to our console and see what it shows. So I get the output as yes because the condition has been satisfied here. My if condition is satisfied and that is exactly where I've got the output as. So now let's see what is the if else condition. So it is pretty similar to the if condition. So it's pretty similar to the if condition just that there's one more condition that gets added here. Now in this case if both the numbers were not equal what we would have got. Suppose let me just change this value to 3 and now let me save and see what my output is. So you can see that we do not have any output because I haven't given any value for the next condition. That is what if these two numbers are not equal. So now this is where the else condition comes in. So I'll show you how you can add the else condition. So you just have to write else and then I will give another output here. So I will just type console dot log and then let it be no. So when the condition is not satisfied it comes out from this loop and goes inside the else condition where if the condition is not satisfied it will give me the output as no. So now let me just save this and go back to the console and see. Now you can see that the output is shown as no because here the condition is not satisfied so it has come out of this particular condition and now it's checking the next condition. So here if this condition is not satisfied the output would be no. So you can use this if else condition a number of times and you can provide different conditions and also provide different outputs for different conditions that you are going to imply here. So now let's move on and have a look at loops. So in JavaScript we have the for loop the while loop and the do while loop. So first let's see how the while loop works. So for that first I have to declare a variable suppose I'm taking i equals to 0. I have to initialize the value of i and then give a condition. So here I'll use the loop. So I'll take while and give the condition as while i is less than 5. That is the value of i is less than 5. And then I'll give the output here. So it will be console dot log number is now I'll concatenate the value of i here. And then finally it's i plus plus. So now what happens here exactly is so I have initialized the value of i as 0 and then I have given a loop which says that while i less than 5 we will be printing the number that is number is and the particular number and i plus plus that is the value will be incremented after each loop. So what happens here is the loop will start from 0 and it will go on till 4. So 0 1 2 3 4 as soon as the value of i reaches 5 it will come out of this particular loop and the output will be only from 0 to 4 because so now in order to check the while condition first I will initialize the value of i. So let me just take the initial value of i as 0 and then here I'll use my loop. So suppose I'm giving a condition here that is i is less than 5 and for the value of i less than 5 I will give an output which will be console.log number is and then I'll concatenate the value of i here and then finally increment the value of i here. So now what exactly happens here is that so first I have initialized the value of i to be 0 and then I have considered a condition that is i must be less than 5. So I had to put it inside a loop. So I have taken the while loop here. So what we consider is while the i value is less than 5 our output will be number is and it will take the particular number. So it will count from the number 0 and go on till 4. Now as soon as the number reaches 5 it will come out of this particular loop. The i plus plus is for the increment that is from 0 to 4. And as soon as it reaches 5 it will come out of this particular loop and then only the number 0 to 4 will be visible in our output. So now let me just save this and see what happens. So let's go back to the console. So now you can see that the number is printed as 0 1 2 3 4. So as soon as the number reached 5 it has come out of this particular loop. So this is exactly how the while loop works. Now in a similar manner you can also use the for or the do while in order to insert loops in your JavaScript code.
So in do while what happens is first you make the task happen that is you use the do keyword and put your output or whatever value you want and then later on you put the condition. So the condition is checked later whereas in while first you check the condition and based on that you provide the output. Okay, so this was about the while loop in JavaScript. Now let's move ahead and see that how does the do while loop works in JavaScript. And also how the do while is different from the while loop. So in case of do while loop what happens is the condition comes a little later. So first we declare the variable and here we take our do loop and inside the curly braces we give our output. So we have our output as number is and we concatenate the value of i and then we increment it as i plus plus. Now once we're out of this loop here we will be adding our while loop. So here we will be giving our condition. So suppose I'm giving the condition as i less than 6. So what happens is now it will take the values till 5 only. And what happens here is it will keep printing the value and come out of the loop and check for the value or the condition that I have provided inside the while loop. So now let me just save this one and go back to my console and refresh this and see. So here you can see that it's printing the value from 0 to 5. So previously we had given the condition as i should be less than 5. So it printed till the value 4. Now in my do while loop I have checked till i value less than 6. So here it has printed the value from 0 to 5. And as soon as the value is more than 5 or the value goes to 6 it comes out of the loop. So now let's move on to the for loop and see how the for loop works. So while using for loop you don't have to initialize the value here. So here we will begin with our for loop and inside the for loop there are three sections. In the first section you initialize the value for i. So here we are giving i equals to 0. And then the next section is the condition for the i value. So here I'm giving the condition as i value should be less than 7. And finally we will give the increment or decrement value. So I'm giving i plus plus here and finally we give our output that is console.log number is and we concatenate the value of i here. Now instead of declaring your variables here you can do one more thing. So what you can do is inside your for loop itself you can just type let and then initialize the value in this manner as well. So now let me just save this one. And now let's go back to our console and see what is the output. So you can see that I have given my condition that i value should be less than 7. So what it prints here is the value from number 0 to number 6. So you can see that using the for loop is pretty easier compared to the other loops. You do not have much to worry or you do not have too many sections to be divided in this. You just have to use the for loop inside which you can initialize the value of your variable and also provide the condition and then give the increment or decrement value all together. And finally you just have to add the output that is whatever you want to print. So this was all about for loop and with this we come to the end of loops. So we have learned about the while loop, do while loop and the for loop and how these three loops work in JavaScript and how easily you can define any variable and insert it into the loops. So for any sort of condition rather than writing the same thing twice or thrice or number of times what you can do is you can just put them inside the loops and let it just take place all at once. Now the final thing that we can discuss in JavaScript is the switch statement. So what is this switch statement? So if you have a number of cases that you are supposed to check inside any particular program so you can use the switch statement. So what happens is inside your switch statement you can add various cases and then go for the value that you want to execute. So let's see how the switch statement works in JavaScript. So for example let me just take a variable as let game equal to let me just take any particular game such as cricket. It's World Cup season anyway. So let's take the value of my game as cricket. Now you just have to use the switch statement inside which I will just declare my variable game. So first we take the switch condition inside which I'll take the variable as game and inside the curly braces I will have my first case. 
so my first case i am adding the game as football so whenever the game football appears i will just give the output as console.log i don't want to watch football now this is our output and then we give the break statement so that we can switch into our next case so now if we consider another case and suppose here we have hockey and then we will give another output for hockey that is console.log and then we put console.log as i don't play hockey and then break the statement again now the next case would be cricket so suppose i have cricket here so i will just give the output here as console.log i love cricket now in case i hadn't initialized any particular game here so we always need a default value when it comes to switch statement so here what we do is we take another default value and for our default value we give another console.log so we just give match not found so this is how we write a switch statement in javascript now let me just save this one and go back to my console and refresh this okay so there's some error let's see so yeah we just had to put colons instead of semicolons now let me just save this one and now let's go back to our console and see so you can see that the output is i love cricket because here i have already initialized the game to be cricket so what i want to see is whenever the switch statement comes in and inside switch we have various cases it will only take the output where i have the value for game as cricket now in case i change this value to football and now let me just save this one now let's go back to our console and refresh it and see and it says i don't want to watch football because for my football uh, case i have given the output as i don't want to watch football so this is exactly what is getting printed or this is what we get as the output now let me see let me just give foosball and we do not have foosball in any of these cases so it should go to the default value but let's see what is the output here so let me just save this one now and go back to the console and refresh it yes so exactly the, we get the output as match not found because it goes to the default value so in case any of these are not found or matched with the initialized value it provides us with the default value here so this was all about the switch statement in javascript now with this you know a lot more about the loops and switch statement and before that you have also learnt about all the fundamentals such as the object arrays strings and how you can take the syntax and include everything inside your javascript code and also how you can get it inside your console and see what is the output with the help of your html file as well so now with all of these you have learnt about the variables objects functions arrays loops and conditional statements in javascript now this will help you create your own website now you can beautifully design your website with the help of javascript and also by playing around with these fundamentals of javascript so let's look at the basic dom structure so basic dom structure this is just a simple html document here and they have laid it out in a tree sort of pattern okay there is the document it's the parent of everything else the document tag within the document tag then you have html tag which further contains head and body and then head contains title and title contains some text over here if you if you look at this right and then you have h1 tag which contains some text and then you have the p tag which is which contains some text the dom really refers to so so whenever you are writing html what is really happening is that you write certain directions to a browser so a browser is a software right through writing html you are writing certain directions to the browser that hey paint my web page in a certain way so it's like uh, if you had a friend and he had a canvas that canvas and that friend together are the browser and you as a developer 
either person who's instructing this browser or person and you're telling this person hey draw a box for me make it this wide make it like this make it have this shadow effect print or display a message like box one over it the font size the font weight multiple multiple things right or if it's a document like let's suppose you're dictating a document to somebody okay the heading should be jquery training start with the subheading jquery intro then start with the paragraph plan your jquery training now so it's that is sort of the way that the browsers work this html is essentially directions they are essentially directions to the browser okay what the browser does is that it takes those directions and creates something called as a DOM, a document object model out of it. Now, why does it create a DOM? Because it needs to apply the styles that you have provided from the CSS. It needs to do several things to it. So it converts it into something called as a DOM and makes it available to you and to itself for manipulation. And a large part of JavaScript or jQuery has to deal with DOM manipulation. And we're going to figure that out as we go along, right? So when it comes to DOM manipulation, right? If you look at this example, so let's talk about this particular line. Uh, let's suppose that there is a div tag with the ID results. This particular line basically gets that element, gets that DOM element to you in this variable, in this JavaScript variable. And the following lines are setting the HTML inside it. So basically you are setting HTML or you're setting text inside an HTML using JavaScript. Now that's a very, very powerful concept, right? Right there. That you can deliver a web page to a user with a certain look and feel, and then based on how the user decides to interact with it, you will make changes to that web page. You can literally change this entire web page right there and then because you have JavaScript helping you out because it has access. It can read that HTML document, that DOM, it can read the DOM and pick out the nodes in the DOM. So think of these as nodes and think of jQuery having access to each of these nodes and having the ability to modify each of these nodes. Whether it is the content of the node or it is something else that it can do to a node. Now, one thing about the DOM is that every browser behaves a little differently. So if you have ever felt that your website doesn't look the same on Chrome or versus Mozilla versus Internet Explorer versus Opera or versus Safari, and I'm sure you must have experienced this with even uh, very, very good websites. Like they tend to differ quite a bit depending on how careful the developers were. So the reason is that it's not broken. It's just that every browser behaves differently. So it's like this. Consider each of the browser as a person, right? You are giving directions to paint the DOM. So you want something called as a document to be painted or printed on a canvas and you're giving instructions to each browser. But each browser behaves differently. Each, like, like a person, the browser behaves differently to instructions. Now 90 to 95% of the behavior is similar, but that 10%, 15%, depending on what kind of instructions you're giving might change. So the websites don't look massively different, but they are still a little different, right? So that comes from who developed that browser, what did they want to build it for, what is the main purpose? So Internet Explorer, for example, is built primarily for security. It is supposed to be very secure. Uh, Chrome is built for something else. Firefox is built for speed. Safari is built for something else. Opera is built for something else. And based on those decisions, sometimes these behaviors change where they might not react to a CSS property or they might not perceive a certain way in a certain way, in a, a certain directive in a certain way. So this is a problem. This is a huge problem for developers who have to build quickly and have they have to build websites which would sort of at least 90 to 99 percent of the time behave in a similar way across browsers because if you were to build for different browsers or if you were to write separate code say doing the same thing for different browsers it would be just too much work and developers are supposed to be lazy right so jquery helps us out jquery really help, really helps us out so think of jquery like a manager okay think of jquery like a manager 
who knows each of the workers. So if if these are my friends, he knows the behavior of each and every friend. He knows Firefox requires more directions than Chrome, or Chrome is a bit slower than Internet Explorer, or Internet Explorer needs to be given the instructions slowly. Now these are not the actual differences, but I'm just giving you an example. Now, as a manager, jQuery knows how to deal with the different behavior of different browsers. So it eliminates the need for us to write code specific to browsers. Instead, it takes care of it for us. That is the first and the most fundamental reason why jQuery is so, so popular, that it removes the dependency to write code for each and every individual browser. Makes it very, very easy for people like you and me to build websites really, really quickly. Okay, so what is jQuery then? So jQuery is essentially a JavaScript library. So it is still JavaScript. What is the difference between JavaScript and jQuery? JavaScript is a language. jQuery is a library built using JavaScript. So jQuery fundamentally is nothing but a lot of JavaScript code that has been written by developers who are way, way experienced, who have 20 to 25 years of experience developing and programming and so on and so forth. So jQuery is just a library. Now, it was first released in 2006. It's one of the most popular libraries with cross-browser support. It is lightweight, lightweight being that the size isn't too much. It improves developer efficiency, of course. Easy to learn because it relies on a lot of CSS-based syntax. We'll come across this soon. And the current uh, latest releases are 1.9 or 2.1. You can use either. Both are sort of the latest releases. And uh, so let's move ahead. Now, the next question is why jQuery? So jQuery is a JavaScript library designed to simplify the client-side scripting naturally because the syntax being similar to CSS, cross-browser support, it helps in creating dynamic web pages. Dynamic in terms of Whenever you may are able to manipulate the DOM, that is what adds a dynamic nature to your web page and your web application. So that is one of the fundamentals again, that it creates dynamic web pages which respond to user input. It is intuitive and easy to learn. It integrates with IDEs. So IDEs have out of the box support for it. It helps in pages loading faster. So because the size is small, the download time of the library in itself is small, which helps out. So generally when you find websites to be slow, either it's your internet connection, and if that's not the case, then the website is heavy. Heavy being that the size of the code that you're downloading to run the website is, is a lot. Next is that it helps in creating animated pages like Flash. So before JavaScript or jQuery, or even jQuery became really popular, one of the typical ways to animate a web page was using Flash. However, that meant that as a front-end developer, you had to learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and Flash. Further, Flash is not, I think it would be sort of sufficient to say that it's not the most elegant of things to deal with when it comes to browsers. Again, a lot of problems across browsers uh, and across OS as well. So what happens is that jQuery, because it's so easy to use and there are so many functions already built in, it provides us with a lot of functionality to create animation, which is similar to Flash, but without using Flash. So in terms of you learning newer things, it reduces the number of newer things that you have to learn. You don't have to learn Flash and you're still able to create beautiful animations using jQuery, which is also a part of a dynamic web page, right? Uh, a web page which can sort of animate based on user input or based on certain sections being loaded and so on. So HTML document type, uh, it informs the browser what document type it is. And again, it has to do with the interpretation of the document. So again, the document, the HTML document just contains directions to paint a web page. And the doc type basically tells the browser which version of directions these are. And so it is very important. Till HTML4, this was the way that you would mention the HTML document type and from HTML5 it's just very simple you just type this and that's it this will be sufficient now CSS selectors so whenever you give directions uh, in terms of hey I want the box to be of red color or I want the font to be 14 pixel 
or I want to divide up the page in columns of 20%, 20% and 40%, right? You write that code as CSS, but then how do you tell CSS, how do you link the HTML and CSS together? In terms of what style is to be applied on what element, that happens through selectors. Now there are multiple ways to select or identify a tag. So imagine it in this way that there are eight boxes that you're telling your friend to, uh, that you told your friend to paint on the canvas. Now you want uh, one of the boxes to be of red color. Naturally the friend will ask, hey, which box? Now if the boxes were numbered, that they were identified as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you would tell your friend, hey, box number three needs to be of red color. Now, when you're doing this, this is an identifier and selector is, I think a synonym, you can consider it as a synonym for an identifier. So there are various ways to identify a, a HTML tag. One of them is the tag name in itself. That is a P tag or a div tag or a span tag. And these are then universally applied. So if I apply a span tag with font size of 14 pixel, that will be applied ac across anywhere in my HTML document that I use a span tag. Then there are ID selectors, which you set by setting the ID on the HTML document. Then you can of course set this class selector as well. Now tag, ID and class tend to be the most popular ones, but then there are more. There are a lot of ways in which you can set selectors. There are pseudo class selectors, there are selectors based on relationships, that is the parent-child relationship. Then there are attribute-based selectors and uh, then there are multiple selectors as well. So for now, I think we can focus on the top three, that is tag, ID, and class. But I think even selectors based on relationships tend to be commonly used as compared to the other ones. Right, so the jQuery object, let's say I open my local host. Okay, so this is an empty web page right now, but just to quickly show you what I mean is that this is an object in JavaScript, right? Curly brace is open, curly brace is closed, and it essentially contains key value pairs. So if I had to count the number of fruits, I could store it like this. And then if I do a.apple, it would print one, a dot banana, it would print two, and a dot guava will print three. Similarly, what you have is something called as a jQuery object. Now, there are two ways to use the jQuery object. One is the dollar symbol, and the other one is jQuery written in this particular casing, that is j, cap j small and q capital, and the rest of them small again. You can use either. It is fine if you use dollar or if you use jQuery, but a lot of times the examples that you will find on the internet will be using dollar. Now dollar is essentially a function, okay? You need to really look at it like JavaScript syntax. So it's dollar is nothing but for you a variable. So if I was to show it to you again, you can consider it like this, where dollar is equal to this, right? Now I can say $a equal to three. And if I do a, I print dollar, then it's an object. So dollar is a valid identifier or a variable name in JavaScript, in JavaScript in general. But what jQuery does is that it adopted the dollar as a symbol for itself, that all jQuery needs to be accessed through the dollar. And if you look at it, it's not just a variable, Actually, it's a function. jQuery, this, uh, this parenthesis, right? If uh, So in JavaScript, functions are called by the parenthesis, the opening and the closing of the brackets, and then code inside it. So this is essentially the jQuery function, which has a lot of things inside it. But you need, really need to visualize it in that particular way that I'm just calling a function. That's it. Okay. So a jQuery object is like an array which contains zero or more indexes. It also contains object methods like length, context, and selector. So it's a jQuery object contains a lot of things. But keep in mind that it is nothing but JavaScript at the end of the day. So we are not going to lose sight of the fundamentals. Very, very important. Okay, so some IDs for jQuery. So I'm going to be using Atom. 
there is sublime text again one of the very good ones lightweight but there is dream weaver you can also use it in the browser console like i was just demonstrating there are online editors such as js fiddle js bin cloud9 and then there are debuggers so i just use a chrome web inspector in Fa in mozilla or in firefox there is a firebug and you can use either depending on uh, what you're familiar with what you have installed uh, all of them are are good right so jquery cdn and installation so there are two ways of installing uh, jquery in the web project one is to download jquery and have the file like just like a javascript file stored on your on your laptop or in your project and give the path to it so that is what i have done i have the jquery.js file here if you can see this is a lot of scary javascript don't be confused by it but uh, i just included it like this so i just added it it's over here it will find it and i'll be able to use it okay the other way is through the CDN, uh, which is uh, called as a content delivery network. CDN uh, are basically hosted by big companies such as uh, Cloudflare, such as Google, such as Amazon. Uh, jQuery in itself might have its own CDN, which are basically localized servers. So servers which are close to your specific location uh, respond to your request. The benefit of a CDN is that, of course, because the server is physically close to you. Physically meaning that it's not sitting in the US. If you're in India, it's sitting in Singapore. Or if you're in US, it's not serving you a file from India or UK or Europe. It is serving you a file from US itself. So physical proximity plays a role, of course, in transfer rate, as well as the fact that the file version is being maintained and you don't have to maintain a copy of the file on your own machine. That also plays a role. Then there are certain other benefits in it being a standard file, so on and so forth, versus you choosing it from, you know, something that a co-developer downloaded. So you are sure that it is the original jQuery and it's not been modified. It's not been messed around with. If you think about this, right, there's this file. I might accidentally edit it. I just edited it. Now something might break if I'm one of the developers on this project. But if you're downloading it from the CD and I can't really accidentally change something. So that is why the CDN helps out. But if you're developing on local, I usually prefer local being, if you're just in development mode, I usually prefer having the files on my machine because that's much faster because it's just serving the files from my machine to my machine. And uh, I don't have to wait for it to download from a server. So development i would suggest that go with downloading the file okay so before we start with this let me show you something now notice that i've already loaded the jquery files and i'm doing a console.log of dollar i have not defined dollar anywhere unlike the browser okay i'm going to reload this page on my browser i'm going to just get rid of this and if you notice it has jquery html line 36 line 36 and has done a console.log it has returned a function so jquery dollar is a is a function essentially which can be a little head spinning but in javascript even functions are objects okay even functions are objects so when when it said that dollar is an object it is correct and when it says dollar is a function is correct because functions are also objects in javascript now if I do jQuery, I'll get the result as the same function. And for comparison's sake, let me do it like this. So if you notice, both of these are returning the same thing, right? They're the same function. Let me just remove these for a second. Yeah, let's also try something else. Let's see if they are same. And they are. So as I said, jQuery or dollar it is the same thing okay so now talking about what we are doing here let me just okay so i have a simple html file which has a div tag now notice that there is nothing inside this div tag so even when i'm loading this page right there is nothing to be displayed it's a it's an empty html page with nothing inside it everything is basically i have uh, 
I've committed out everything. There is only one div tag, but it has nothing inside it. Now let's suppose I wanted to display something after the page was just loaded. How does that work? So let's break it apart piece by piece. So I have dollar. It takes something called as a document. So when, when I pass in document over here, jQuery understands that I'm referring to the entire HTML document right from the very top. And then I'm going to use something called as ready. Ready is a function. Again, it's a function. So this is a function, the one that I've highlighted, which has another function on top of it. JavaScript allows us to do this. Okay. That there are functions defined on top of each other. It is also called as chaining. That I have a function topped on another function. So I'm calling a function which takes in a parameter. The parameter is another function. So I know that we're doing a lot of functions here, but uh, just be with me for a second. So I am basically telling the browser that, hey, when the document is ready, execute this function, the one that I've just selected. Just run whatever is inside of it. So I'm not setting a timer here because I don't know when the page would be loaded or when the page would be ready, right? I'm just saying that, hey, whenever the document is ready, do whatever is inside this function. So let's try it out. Let's do a simple console.log document is ready. Let me actually also comment out all of this. Now let me reload the page. So this prints and let's see if we had this outside. Let's set it on the line number on line number 36 and then on line number 42. So if you see, right, line number 36 is executed, line number 42 is executed, but the document got ready later on. It executed this, it set this instruction, it moved on to this instruction, and when everything was done, and when the page was ready, so the page, the document was not ready until and unless it comes down to this one. Until unless it goes through everything, the document is not considered to be ready by the browser. So this function does not get triggered, but then, internally JavaScript triggers this function once everything is ready. So this is really the first snippet of code I think that most people go through when they're writing jQuery that uh, when the document is ready, do something. And the next thing is that you want to display something on the, on the web page. Now jQuery allows us to select an object or select an element in the DOM or to break it down, it allows us to select a particular HTML tag. Now selection can happen through multiple ways. It can happen by saying div. So it will select all the divs available in the document, all the divs, even if there are like 1000, 10,000 divs, it will select all the divs. Not recommended that you do this because naturally it causes a lot of problems. So like CSS, if you wanted to set the style on all divs, that is what you would do. Then the next option is to select it by ID. So if you look at this over here, the ID is ready demo. So I can just set the hashtag like I would do in CSS. So CSS would be something like this, right? Or let's reduce it a little bit, right? So hashtag ready demo in a similar way. I can do hashtag ready demo over here, which tells jQuery that or the browser, in fact, that this is what we are referring to. This is what we want something to be done on. What do we want some to be done on? We want to set the text inside it because it's empty and we want the text to be document is ready. So we were doing a console.log, but now we want to show the user that, hey, my web page is ready. So we want to say web page is ready. Now let's reload the page. As you can see, it appeared. It wasn't there. It is my code which put it there. So anything I print over here, it will show over here. And this happens after the document dot ready. So when the document got ready, then this function was executed and the function execution wanted this to happen. First, select the tag that you want to make changes to. So I want this node to be modified, manipulated. I want the text inside it to be web pages ready. And that's what I ended up doing. So it is executed as soon as the document is ready for DOM manipulation and we assign a function, right? So moving on. Now, another thing that jQuery allows us to do, which I was talking about is chaining or even, even actually JavaScript allows us to do is, is chaining functions on each other where functions are executed one after the other. So let's suppose I want you to set the color of this after it loaded. 
jQuery provides me with a method called as .css and whenever you're kind of searching for these things online, you have to refer to them as .css in jQuery and you will immediately open the documentation on Google or, or jQuery website. So ca.css in jQuery, this is a method which takes two parameters. The first parameter has to be the CSS property and the second parameter has to be the value. Okay, so let's run this for a second and see the result, if it works or not. Okay, it already did, right? Web page is ready. We can also chain another one to this or let's suppose, try, let's try a different one. Let's try it as something like uh, font weight and let's set it to 700. Now it becomes bold. If I make it as 100, it is not bold. If I make it as 1000, it is, okay, it is not bold. Yeah, 1000 is not a valid property. Yeah, 700 is, so it becomes bold. And I can even change the color again, so I can make it blue now. So I'll go over here, I'll select the color. So if you look at it, it's a sequence. First do this, set the text, then color, then this. So again, I'm giving directions, like to a friend. But this time the canvas is ready and uh, probably it's a second friend, which is my JavaScript and jQuery friend, which I'm telling that, hey, now do this, now do this, now do this. And to try the last thing that was given on the slide deck, which is fade in, which basically tells it to fade in, sort of an animation. I can give it a number. I can say, I think it's in milliseconds. So I can say that, hey, show it in 2000 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds. Okay, let me set it to 5000, which should be five seconds, which is pretty slow. I think uh, my live reload is enabled and that's why it's kind of not loading really. Uh, it's not really showing that effect. Let me try it out like this. Right, so jQuery also allows us to declare functions of our own on the dollar object. Now, this again goes back to the fact that functions are also objects and objects can contain functions on top of them, right? So, so an object in JavaScript can uh, have like uh, one of the keys, one of the, uh, one of the keys be corresponding to the value, which is a function. So to define a custom function on JavaScript, this is sort of the way we would do it, where we would call $.fn.myCustomFunction and then define a function, which would do something. And then we can do further things to it. So if you have to define your own jQuery functions, there is a possibility to do that as well without you know rewriting the entire library. However, what I would suggest is that uh, just keep it as a mental note for now because it is uh, preferred that you are a more advanced uh, user of sorts who has done this, who has sort of familiarity with, JavaScript, uh, with jQuery and JavaScript quite a bit to be attempting this. But it's a good to know thing that you can extend the library and one of the most beautiful things about jQuery, you can extend the library through your own means and fashion. What is Angular? So it only makes sense to start with what exactly is Angular. So for viewers who are watching any Angular video for the first time, you deserve an introduction to what you are learning. Now, most of you, I assume, actually already have done your research before coming onto YouTube and typing out Angular tutorial. So it's only mandatory that I give you this introduction. So first of all, Angular is a front-end development framework. Now that's out of the way. Let's get into what front-end development framework means. So when, if you have any web developer friends, you will constantly hear two words, backend and frontend, backend and frontend. So what do these two words mean? Well, uh, the roles of a web developer are forked into two very distinct branches in this industry. The first is that of a backend developer and the second is that of a frontend developer. Now a backend developer is responsible for mostly everything that happens on the back end. So basically stuff like routing, well, routing is also done by front-end developers, but that's another thing. But routing is basically the job of a back-end developer, uh, fetching things from a server, writing the JavaScript for all that things. That is a complete back-end developer thing, setting up the server for, in fact, setting up the database schema, 
that's everything a backend developer does. What the front-end developer does mostly entails what you see on your screen right now. So the way you see Facebook, the way it's designed, how everything, how the news feed is actually placed like that, that is the job of a front-end developer. He makes sure that everything on the website looks tip-top and smack perfect, and he does this with a lot of optimization. So mostly back in the day, front-end mostly used to be done by HTML and CSS, and CSS used to get very complicated in this fashion. It still is a little complicated if you want to present a very polished website, but creating the HTML and making it much more reactive is what the framework does for you. So most online sites will say that front-end development framework is also referred to as a CSS framework. Well, while this is very true, it's not so perfect of a thing to say that it's a CSS framework. It is more of a reactive HTML framework, and I will explain just now how. So the second thing that you should know about Angular is that it is maintained and developed by Google. So AngularJS is a JavaScript-based open source front-end framework mainly maintained by Google and by a community of individuals and corporations to address many of the challenges encountered in developing single page applications. We'll also get to what single page applications mean in a moment. It aims to simplify both development and the testing of such applications by providing a framework for client side model view controller, that is the MVC architecture, on the model view view model controller, or the MVVM architectures as you might know it. So basically, it's maintained and developed by Google. Now, if you know Google, you know things they give you as a product is amazing. Things like Flutter really took off. Android, we know what it is today. And AngularJS has been out there since a long time. It's got an amazing community. If you have any sort of doubt, you can go ahead and post it out on Stack Overflow under the Angular tab, and you will probably get an answer almost immediately. Other than that, your problems might already be there posted by somebody else who is developing and face the same problem. So basically you have a great community, great support from Google, and it's a breeze to work with Angular today. The third thing that you need to know about Angular is that it is a JavaScript based framework. Now, if that was not already obvious from Angular 1, which is named Angular JS, well, I'm just putting it out there, it is JavaScript based. So why is it a good thing that it is JavaScript based? Well, JavaScript is commonly known as the language of the web. So if you are interacting with any part of the web, you're probably going to use JavaScript or the JavaScript engine. You might be doing unknowingly, but you are definitely doing it. For example, you're watching this video on YouTube right now. You are using a JavaScript engine that runs a video framework. So yeah, so if you know JavaScript, you basically know how to talk to the web. So when you're trying to learn Angular, you don't really have to learn a new language. For example, when you're learning Flutter, you have to learn about Dart. So Dart is a new language that is developed by Google and is used in Flutter, that is their mobile application development framework. If you want to go learn Flutter, you can check out my Flutter tutorial on Edureka. Uh, but for now, you need to know that Angular is based on JavaScript. Well, not exactly JavaScript, it is based on TypeScript. TypeScript is the main language that is used in Angular scripts. And TypeScript is basically a superset of JavaScript. And we'll get into what TypeScript is later on. So basically, the fact that it is made of it is based on JavaScript makes it much more common and easy to reach out for developers like us. After that, we just discussed that Angular is made for single page applications. So we are not trying to create multi page applications with Angular. Angular is made for making single page applications. So what exactly is a single page application? Well, it does not re require a page reloading. So for example, Gmail is a wonderful single page application. So let me just go ahead and show it to you. So if you go ahead and open up your Gmail account, and let's say you are straight up going to open on the inbox page. Now, if you were to go into drafts, uh, let the site stop loading. Okay, so if you were to go into drafts, you see that there is basically no load out here. Your screen isn't going into that whole whoop de whoop of loading. But if you are not on a single page application, for example, Go to webinar, which is a recording service. So out here we are on the My Webinar tab. And if I were to go to my recording out here, you see that this goes into a loading fashion. This is loading up a new page. So this means that go to webinar is not a single page application, while Google is a single page application. And you just saw how much faster Google can be. My God, this is still loading, and Google was done with it already. So yeah, single page applications certainly have the performance and speed that you require today to do all your things very seamlessly. 
So it's great to have a framework that lets you create single page applications with so much ease. So with that out of the way, this is all the theory part. Let's go ahead and start up with our own Angular project. So the first thing that you need to do is to start up with Angular is go ahead to your browser, open up a new tab and search for Node.js. Now I am assuming that you don't have Node.js installed on your computer. So click on the first link and go ahead and download the one that is recommended for most users. After you download it, you'll get a setup file. Go ahead, click the setup file and just follow the instruction. It's a pretty easy install and I don't think there should be much problems with it. But just in case out there you get a problem with it, some configuration problem goes wrong, please go ahead and check out another video that actually explains how to install Node.js on your computer because this video is meant for Angular. I have a lot to do and I can't waste time with stuff like how to install Node. There are a lot of videos out there, including EdureCars itself, and you can go ahead and check them out. Now, once you have installed Node on your computer, you can go ahead and check if Node is installed by just typing Node on your command prompt, and this should open up a JavaScript console. You can say stuff like print, or let's say var x equals five, and if you just call x, it'll say five out there. I know my text isn't very clear because I have this weird blue background in my command prompt, but yeah, if you can open up a JavaScript console with just typing node, you have installed node in proper fashion. Now to exit from this console, you can just type dot exit and that will exit you from that console. So now let's go ahead and clear up our command prompt. And the next thing that we are gonna do is install Angular on our computer. So to install Angular, let's see what we have to do. So the best place that you have for any doubts of this sort is the Angular documentation. So go ahead and search for the Angular docs. So this will open up the Angular docs. It's at angular.io slash docs. Go ahead and check the setup part. So out here you see that you need Node.js. Now that you have done it, you can go ahead and install Angular through an NPM command. So NPM is a node package manager and all you have to say to NPM is that you need to install. So install or you can just simply say I and then hyphen G, which basically means that it is going to be a global install and not pertaining to any particular folder or any project setup. So we are gonna be installing this globally so that you can access the Angular CLI from almost anywhere on your computer. So after that, all you have to say is Angular slash CLI, if I'm correct. Okay, it's at the rate Angular. So for stuff like this, always keep the documentation open and you should go ahead and press enter after that. So this command will go ahead and install Angular on your local machine. So let's just wait for this to finish. Okay, so as you guys know, I already had Angular installed on my computer. So nothing new has actually been changed. It just says it updated one package, so that doesn't really matter. So this means that Angular has been installed on our computer. And you can go ahead and check that by just creating an Angular project. Now I'm in my default user directory, so let me just go ahead and change it to the desktop directory. And out in the desktop directory, I want to make a folder called Angular Tutorial. So Angular underscore tutorial. So this is where I'm going to be saving all the projects and all the setups that we will be needing for the various assignments and simple applications that we will be looking at and the concepts. So this is going to be the folder for the day. So let's go ahead and quickly change into that folder. And so Angular Tutorial and we are in our Angular Tutorial folder. So out here, what you can do to start up a new Angular project is, as you guys can see, out here it, is, it says to create a workspace and initial application, you can use the ng-new command. So ng-new basically tells Angular CLI that you want to start a new project and then you basically give your project a name. Okay, so ng-new and what do we name our project? Well, let's think of some appropriate name. Let's go back and see what are we actually going to do next. So we are gonna be writing our first app. So it's very simple that we are gonna be calling this our first app. So ng-new will go ahead and create folder which has everything that you need to create your first app. So you can opt out for routing for now because we will not be going for routing in this tutorial. And we will also be using CSS for our file. So just press enter twice and that will be using the default settings for setting up your Angular project. And there it goes. So that completes our project setup. And for this project setup, we are also missing out one thing. So firstly, we are missing out our code editor. So I'm gonna be using Visual Studio Code 
but you can use other paid applications like WebStorm out there. WebStorm is amazing. If you can pay for it, please go for it. But for now, for a very free way of making a tutorial, I'm going to be sticking to my cheap ways and just use Visual Studio Code. Now, just because Visual Studio Code is free doesn't mean it takes away from any of the functionalities that come from the paid apps. It has all the functionalities like syntax highlighting for creating and generating components. It's really good. You even get a built-in terminal to actually run your Angular CLI commands. Okay. So let's just wait for this project to get set up. It kind of takes a couple of minutes from some time. So let's just give it some time. Okay, so now that our Angular app is set up and up and running, all we need to do now is go ahead and just download Visual Studio Code. So to download Visual Studio Code, go ahead and type in Visual Studio Code on your browser. Go to the first link and also the second link out here that download Visual Studio Code. That should give you a set of file and you should just go ahead and set it up. That's very easy to do. So let's not waste more time and get started with writing our first app. Okay. So out here, if you were to go to your desktop and if you made a folder like me, like Angular tutorial, you will see that there's a folder that says first app. Now, if you were to open the folder, you see a lot of things you probably don't understand out here. So there is a TS lint, which is a JSON source file. There's also the package file, there's a package lock. There's also this imp very important angular.json file, which basically includes all your dependencies. Now, this E2E file is not really going to be useful for us in this Angular tutorial. E2E basically means end to end, and this is made for end to end testing of Angular apps. What we are going to be interested in is mostly the node modules and the SRC. So, out here in SRC, you see that there is this index page. There is an index page which is your HTML file. There's also this style sheet, which is your basic styling of the web app that comes built in when you basically make any Am Angular app. So, first of all, let's go back and let's open this folder, particularly with Visual Studio Code. So, as you guys can see, I have opened up our first app and we can go into our SRC and we can see that there's an app folder and we get a lot of files out here. So we have an app component.css file, we have an app component.html file, we have an app component.spec.ts file. So all of these .spec.ts files are basically used for testing purposes. We're not going to be concentrating on testing but rather more on developing an app. So this is none of our concern for now you can feel free to actually go ahead and delete it. Now, if you go ahead and open up app.component.ts, you can go ahead and see that there is a bit of code written out here. So there's an import line from the first thing. We can see that it's importing something called components from a library called Angular slash core. There's also this decorator out here that tells Angular that this is a component. It has a selector, it has a template URLs, it has styles URLs. And in the class, you can see that there is a variable that says title and it says first app. Now, this really doesn't make sense to a beginner, but just wait on when we will know what all of these things mean from components to a class and everything else. So, first of all, let's go ahead and see what this app that Angular ships with looks like. So, to do that, go ahead and open up your terminal. You can simply do that by dragging it up and down. And out here, what you want to say is ng hyphen hyphen open, uh, which basically makes your default browser open up. And all you want to say is serve. So this command basically serves the app that is in the development mode right now, and it will serve it on a local host at port number 4200. So it's compiling at the moment. So let's go ahead and see what it actually looks like. Let's give it some time to compile and should open up the app for us automatically. Let's close off this one. Let's keep the documentation open. Let's close off the Node.js. Let's close off my mail. Okay, so this is the first app. Okay, so as you guys can see, we are greeted with a welcome screen. As you guys can also see, it's on a local server. This is not hosted at a global scale. This is just for your testing purposes as a developer. So you can see that it says, welcome to the first app. Now, if you go ahead and see out here, it says title equals first app. Now, if you go ahead in the HTML part, you can also see that there is this little place where title is referenced back again. 
So as a developer, I think you can make some sense that these three files, appcomponent.es, the appcomponent.html, and the appcomponent.css is kind of interconnected with each other. So yeah, this is basically what an Angular app looks like. Okay, so this is basically the application that Angular ships with. It's a very welcoming application. It says, welcome to first app. It has some useful links such as the tour of heroes link. It has a link to the command line interface documentation and a few of the Angular blogs. Now this is of really no use to us if you want to learn. So let's go ahead and actually fiddle around with this file that comes along with Angular when you create your app. So if you go ahead and look at the app component.html page, it looks deceivingly similar to what we see on our screen out here when with this app that Angular ships with. So as you guys can see, it has an H1 that says welcome to and title and out here you can see welcome to first app. So basically we can say that the title out here which we saw in the TypeScript file which is said title equals to first app and that gets converted out here. Above that we also have a few links and basically it's an unordered list. And also if necessary there is some styling that goes along too. But at this moment there is no styling that is available. So let's go ahead and tinker around with this application just to give you an idea um, how Angular actually works. So Angular is basically divided into components and Angular app. So out here what you see is the app component. So every component has three files. It's basically it's it's a template. So it has its own styling. So that is app.component.css. It also has its template. So the styling is CSS. The template is app.component.html. And the logic, the business logic that goes inside this thing is in the app.component.ts file. Now there is also this app.module.ts file and I'll get to that just in a moment. But for now, what you want to do is go ahead and just delete all these stuff that is there in the app.component.html file. Now don't forget to keep your terminal running which is serving this application. So every time you go ahead and save, it basically saves it and you can go ahead and see that it has reloaded it and we have nothing out here to be honest. So let's make this page a little more interesting. So firstly, let's give this just an input, let's say. So we want a div and in this div, we are gonna have an input of type text. Now every input should also go with a label and this label is for name. So we can give this type name equals name out here. Right, so let's make this a little less confusing for you guys. Let's call this first name. Right, and out here you see if we go ahead and save it, we should get an input out here. We can type stuff out here, but it really does nothing even if we press enter and stuff like that. So we can also have um, a paragraph out here, which an output out our name for us. Please don't pay much attention to the syntax for now. Just try and understand what is happening in the background because we will get to the syntax just in a few moments. So we wanna display the name out here. So to display the name, we need to create a variable called name. So go ahead and go to your app.component.ts file and change this name, the title to name. And out here, let's change it to my name. So we're gonna say Aria. So let's save that. Let's go back and save our HTML file. And as you guys can see, Aria is coming out here. But if we still type something in the input, nothing actually happens. Now what I wanna do is, whatever I type in the input should automatically be reflected in this paragraph below it. So we can do that very simply with so-called tool that Angular ships with. Now these tools are called directives and we will get into directives just in this tutorial. I'll be teaching you how to make use of inbuilt directives like the one I'm gonna be using right now. So let's go ahead and use this directive. Now pay no attention to the way I am writing this because syntax is something that can be dealt with later on. So for now, what we want to do is start up square bracket and then an open parentheses bracket. That is the normal bracket. And what we want to say is ng model is equals to name. So name should be in your double quotes. Now this will tell Angular that whatever is being typed out here is going to be stored in a property called name. And we are also going to be displaying the same name down here in this paragraph. So let's go ahead and save this. And let's go ahead and reload our file. And you surprisingly see that the input part that we had has suddenly disappeared. Now what we want to do to realize our mistake is go ahead and say inspect. 
if you go into the console, it says uncaught error, template parse error. So it can't bind to ng model since it isn't known property of input. Okay, so basically, Angular can't figure out what ng model is. Now, this is because we have not imported the functionalities of ng model. Now, I said that this is an input model and it comes shipped with Angular. But the way TypeScript works is that you have to go and tell TypeScript everything you are importing that you will be needing for your app to be running. Now, all your imports to this is actually done in the module file. So, things that need to be imported when you are running this is done in the modules file. So, as you guys can see, we are importing a few stuff already that is by default. So, we are importing the ng module from Angular slash core. And uh, we are also importing the browser module from Angular slash platform browser. Now, to actually make the magic of ng model happen, we need to import something. And this is at the rate Angular slash forms. So, everything ends with the semicolon. So, basically, in TypeScript, you need to tell TypeScript where everything is, particularly. So, Angular slash forms. And what we need to import is the forms module. Now, this was telling TypeScript that we are going to be using this, but you also need to tell Angular that your forms module needs to be imported. So, you can do that by just copying this name and putting it in the imports array out here. So, put a comma, here, press enter. And type in forms module. Go ahead and save your HTML page also, just in case. And now, what we see out here is we do not get any error, first of all, and we have this nice little input box. So let's close this. We also have this nice little input box. It says ARIA in the paragraph, it also says ARIA in the input box. Now, if I were to delete that, everything in the paragraph also automatically gets deleted. So if this was not a single page application, for example, Reflecting the changes you made to the input would probably take you to reload the page, but that is not with angular You can go ahead and simply type your name and everything will happen like it's magic and it'll appear down in the paragraph below So that was all about installing angular setting up your project and we set up our project We saw how the shipping app actually looks like and then we kind of fiddled with it And this is how an angular app basically works. You have components and then you also have modules. So modules are like sub packages, like any app would be divided into sub packages. An Angular app is divided into modules. Now, modules contain components, and this is the component out here that we worked with just now. It is called the app component. Also, another thing that I want to bring to your notice is if we go ahead and open up the source code, what you see out here is it's basically an HTML page, but there's this weird app root element out here it almost seems like we have built our own custom element below that what you see is a bunch of script imports that angular does for you so that angular works properly but the main interesting part is this app root element now if you remember we had seen this app root element in our app.component.ts file and we see that we have a selector called app root now, the page that gets loaded into the browser is actually this index.html page. Now, out there, you see that we have created this app root thing. So, basically, app root out here is like a selector. So, basically, this will help you understand how an Angular app gets loaded when we get to that. So, index.html is basically the file or the source code that you see out here. It also happens to have this app root custom element. Now we built this custom element using our components and we told our component that the selector for this custom element will be app root. And the template of that component is stored in app.component.html, which is basically this file. And also the component has some styling, which it at the moment doesn't have any. If it would have any styling, it would be in this app.component.css file. And basically that's it. And we have our app.component.ts file, which makes sure of the logic that is working properly. So basically this is how Angular works. It's a bunch of components. Now let's go ahead and this was our first app that we created. Now let's go ahead with our next topic and that is what is TypeScript. Now you really saw that we are using something a little different from JavaScript. It's basically not JavaScript, it's TypeScript. So what exactly is TypeScript? 
Well, TypeScript is just a superset of JavaScript. It is a strongly typed object oriented compiled language. It was designed uh, by Microsoft and it is basically a superset to JavaScript. So anything that is included in JavaScript is definitely included in TypeScript, but the reverse can't be actually said. So everything in JavaScript is there in TypeScript because it is a superset, but everything in TypeScript is not there in JavaScript. So TypeScript is basically used when you want to create a JavaScript based application that can actually scale at an industrial level. Because when we're talking about TypeScript, it basically compiles down to JavaScript and this compilation is done by the angular CLI. So if you want to go ahead and uh, learn the nitty gritties of TypeScript, you can go ahead and check out TypeScript tutorial out there on the web. There are plenty of them. TypeScript is really easy to learn. And even if you don't want to learn TypeScript, I think it's easy enough. If you know JavaScript, you can catch it up along the way. It's basically like JavaScript, but having classes, interfaces and stuff like that. So with that out of the way, we can move ahead to our next topic and that is integrating external CSS into our angular application. Okay, so for the purpose of integrating an external CSS, we are going to be working with bootstrap 3. So bootstrap if you don't know is a CSS framework. So let's go and see what bootstrap does. So this is bootstrap uh, we are on bootstrap version 4 right now but i will be using version 3 for this purpose of this demo so you can go ahead and see what bootstrap does out here on bootstrap's official site i also have a bootstrap tutorial you can go ahead and check that out too it's basically will show you how to use bootstrap in its various forms and formats okay so now we are only going to integrate bootstrap into our project so to do that all you have to do is go out here and open up another PowerShell command. Out here, what you want to do is type in the commands npm install and dash dash save, and you want to say bootstrap at the rate 3. What this will do is download all the files of bootstrap 3 and store it in this node modules folder. So, node modules folder is anything that you use from the node package manager. If you download some external package, it will be saved in your node modules. After that, after it's downloaded, I will show you how you can integrate it into your project that you are working on. Let's give it some time to actually download the node modules or what we have here that is Bootstrap 3. Okay, so we have actually downloaded Bootstrap 3. Now you can check that by actually opening the node modules folder and going down to B double O. So A, B, C, D, B, um, should be somewhere here. Okay, it seems I can now find it there. Let's go ahead and check it out on our desktop. So we have Angular tutorial, first app, no modules, and there should be a bootstrap out here. Yep, below bonjour. So it should be below bonjour. So let's go ahead and find bonjour out here. So this is our bootstrap folder that we had just downloaded. Now out here we have a few folders. So under this bootstrap folder, go into the dist folder that stands for distribution, go to CSS, and all you have to do is copy this, right click on it, and copy the relative path. Now all you have to do is go into Let's let's minimize this a little so that it becomes easier to work with. Now all you have to do is go out here, go into styles. This is the angular.json file. On almost line number 27, you will see that there is a styles array. So out here, all you do is put a comma, just press enter, and put in the address of the bootstrap.css file. Now beware that when you copy the relative path, you have to actually go ahead and change this all to a backslash. So just change all of these to backslashes and you should be ready to go. So let me just show you guys. This is without actually having bootstrap installed. So this is the app that we have created. Now if we were to just go ahead and inspect, we can go ahead and see that in the head part, there is only one style that is says text slash CSS. This other styles is just a way of telling Angular that there's a source mapping of all the CSS styles. 
Now, at this moment, you can see that this is the global styles to this file. Now, once we actually go ahead and save our angular.json file, and then what we have to do is actually go ahead and node where we were actually serving, hit control C, and then what you want to do again is serve it again. So basically, save your angular.json file, stop serving your application onto the server, and then save all your files, and then start up a new fresh serve process again. So to start a new fresh serving process, all you have to do is go ahead and type ng uh, new, or you can just say n. Oh wait, we're not creating a new component. All we want to do is say ng hyphen o and serve. So remember, this has only one style at this moment. So now let's see how we can actually integrate Bootstrap if we actually could integrate Bootstrap into our project. Okay, so our application has actually compiled and let's go ahead and see, let's go ahead and inspect our page. And if you go into your head part, you will see that there is a new style that has been added. So this says that Bootstrap version 3.4.1 has been added and now you can use all the styling that comes along with Bootstrap. For example, if I were to put this division inside a class called Jumbotron, this would give it a specific type of styling. A Jumbotron is not exactly meant to be used like that, so let's go ahead and change it to a container. Now, if you want to know about all these Bootstrap classes that I'm using, you can very well go ahead and check out my Bootstrap tutorial that I have up on Edureka's site. Okay, so let's remove this. We are not doing the styling properly at this moment. Let's get back to this. Okay, looks like we have actually broken something, but what I wanted to show you is that we actually have Bootstrap going at and our Bootstrap is completely working. So this is Bootstrap version 3.4.1 for us. So that is, guys, how you would add an external CSS file to your project. Okay, so our next topic for today is how Angular actually loads. So if we go back to our code editor and uh, we analyze all the files that we've seen. So first of all, you have three component files. That is the component styling file, the component template file, and the component um, TypeScript file. Now, if you were to go back to your page where your application is loaded and you would inspect it, or to be honest, you have to go and see the source. So in the source, you see that there is, is this app root element. Now, how does the app root element know that it has to insert an input box and a paragraph out here? Well, let me just explain that first because this is a very important concept. This will help you how in learning Angular because you're getting to the root and fundamentals of how Angular is working. So firstly, the page that is getting served by the ng serve process is this index.html file. Now in this index.html file, we have somewhat of a custom element with the selector of app root. Now, if you were to realize, we have tied in this app root selector out here in this app.component.ts file. In this app.component.ts file, we have a decorator method. We have a decorator class, I'm sorry. And in this decorator class, we have said that the selector is gonna be app root. Basically, it saves a string as a selector and it gives it a value that it, this is going to be used for recognizing an element on an HTML page. We have then also said that the element will have its templating in an app.component.html file. So very basically, when an app root component is present on your HTML file, Angular knows that it has to serve these three files out here. These three files out here, the app component files, it knows because it's tied in with the selector. Now, if you go ahead and see it out here, there is a module file also. Now, before we get to the module file, I'd like to tell you that the first piece of code that is actually run is always the main file. So out here, the main file is the main.ts file, and out here you see this line out here. So out here in this file, basically there are a few imports. So one is to enable production mode for development purposes, but the most important line out here is platform browser dynamic, and it's a bootstrap module. So in this bootstrap module, we are passing in the app module as an argument. So since the app module is being passed as an argument, the app module part is actually invoked out here. 
and out here you see it has another bootstrap array so this bootstrap doesn't actually refer to our bootstrap css framework we just included bootstrap means what should be run first when you are actually running an application so out here we are saying that we want to run the app component and the app component here happens to have this html file the css file and this typescript file which are also tied into the index.html which is app root selector so whenever this app root selector is found on this html page it is going to actually serve these three files and that is exactly how an angular app is loaded onto your screen so this workflow is very important for you to understand such that uh, you know where you are going wrong just in case in future debugging processes we will be having a very detailed lecture on debugging in the future so please hang on for that so this part that i just explained will act as a precursor of knowledge for the future videos which will need you to understand how an angular application is actually being presented to you on your screen now moving ahead we are going to go ahead to our next topic and that is components now what we have here under this app folder is a component now components are the building blocks of angular everything that you see on your screen using angular is basically a component so imagine there is this website that you see on your mobile phone and it is a website built by angular now everything on angular will be starting with the root component and they will obviously contain sub components and even more sub components after that so basically it is a tree of components now if you were to remember my flutter tutorial if you haven't watched that please go ahead and check that out flutter is amazing and you should be learning it today well in flutter i had said that application built using flutter is a tree of widgets now the same analogy can be put to web page that is built using angular as a tree of components it's basically a unit or a building block and each framework gives it, it gives its building blocks a different name so for flutter it's a widget and for angular it's a root component or just components in itself so what we did out here is that we had a component now let's say that we want to create another component how do we do that well all you have to do is go ahead and right click on your applications folder and what you want to say is you want to put in a new folder now let's call this folder um let's say we want to have a component called servers so let's call the servers and out here what we want to do is we want to create the server files so out here we are going to create a new file so we are going to create a new file and this file is going to be called the server dot component dot html so why did we choose this naming process well when you are building an industry level applications you tend to forget what is what so naming something appropriately so out here you know that this is the server dot component dot html file this gives us very good information for example it is a server it is a component and this is the template html file now in this template html file we could be putting anything for example let's just put an h3 and we could say that this is the server component that you are viewing so if this is coming on our screen we will know that there this is a server component now we can we also need to add a new file out here so to serve this file we need a typescript file first of all so what we need to do is create a new file and this will be the server.component.ts file so ts stands for typescript now if you were to go ahead and check out the app component.ts file out here you see that there is an import and then there's a class so first of all we are going to try and replicate this because that is also a component and we are making our component manually so we will know what we want to do so first of all we want to say export class and let's say server out here let's see the naming fashion of what how it is used so it says app component so to make it more clear that this is a component we could just use something of a naming structure like server component Those are brackets now we said export because we want to be using this class everywhere else so this was your way of telling angular that this is a component but this is not where it actually ends you also need to tell angular by actually putting a decorator so add rate component will tell angular that this is indeed 
a decorator. So out here, if you were to go ahead and again look into your components file, out here you see that we have to open the components part and type in the selectors. Now basically we, what we want to put in in this component is we want to say how we want to select this. So we're going to say selector and our selector will be let's say a server. I'm sorry, that's not how you do it. Let's just go back. And as you guys can see, our things are becoming much more easier because of this IDE. Things are getting imported into our file system. Now, what we want to say out here is our selector will be, we have to pass a string, so it is going to be server. Now, we can actually call this a server, but that is not the proper naming fashion. So, just to make sure your selector doesn't actually go ahead and clash with any inbuilt selector or some selector that might probably ship with angular all you want to do is call this app server so you just put a hyphen in between and you call this app server now another thing that we need to do is pass the html file so we can say template url so let's see how we can actually use the template url part so you see that it is a template url and we have to pass in the components.html so out here, let's go back and let's say template URL and all we have to do is pass server.component.html. Now let's see if we are missing out on anything. You can always go back and check there. So we have to do, put the dot and the slash just to tell it that it is in the same parent directory. So dot slash server.component.html. And for now, we can skip on the styling because there is no styling involved. So we do not put a semicolon here because this is basically like an array. So let's go ahead and save that. So that saved successfully. And now what we can do is go back into our app component file an HTML file. Let's go ahead and delete all this. Now what we can say is let's put an H1 to know that we are in the app component file. So this is app component that we are looking at. Now, if you guys remember, we have used a selector out here that our selector for this will be app server. So whenever we put an app server type of selector, then H3 should be rendered, which says this is the server component that you are viewing. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go back to our app component and let's say app server. So since we have put our app server here, what we should be able to do is so since we have put an app server there, an H3 should be actually rendered there. Now let's go ahead and check if that actually happens. Let's save all our files. Let's save that. Let's save this. Now what you see out here is nothing is actually getting loaded. There is no H1 and there is no S3 either. Now this is because we have forgotten to actually put it in our modules. So if we see that nothing is actually getting loaded, there is no H1, there is no H3. So let's go ahead and inspect and let's go into the console. And if you go ahead there, you'll see that app server is not a known element. And the beautiful part of Angular is that it also gives you a solution most of the time. So if app server is an Angular component, then verify that it is a part of this module. So this gives us an idea that there is something missing in the app modules part out here. To know that what this actually does so if we were to look at our app modules typescript file we would see that there it kind of looks like a normal typescript file there are a bunch of imports in the beginning then there is a decorator which is the ng module decorator and it has a bunch of arrays now in these arrays we have understood what the bootstrap part does it basically tells which component should be loaded or which service should be loaded when our app is loading for the first time now we also need to tell angular that there is another component that you should be aware of this is not done automatically if you are creating your servers and components manually so what we need to do is go ahead and tell angular that there is a server component so if we put a server component we also see that there is another import line that has been added. So out here, this is TypeScript. This is the way you tell TypeScript that there is a server component. And this is the way you tell Angular that there is a server component. Now, if we were to go ahead and save that, 
we can now see that there is two parts loaded one says that app component and the other said this is the server component that you are viewing if you were to go ahead and inspect you would see that this is a head then this is a body and inside the app root we will have the app server component that is running inside the app server we see that there is an h3 which is basically this part so this is how you can create your components manually and then add them to your project and add them successfully too so that angular and typescript both understand how your components are being made now you can also add a styling to your components by just adding a styling folder i mean a styling file so you will be calling this the server.component.css so this is going to be a css file and out here we can just say since we have an h3 we can say color will be let's say blue let's go ahead and save that and now what we need to do is go into the typescript file and we also need to give the styles url and this is going to be so let's go ahead and see how styles are actually put this is put in an array so that's exactly what we're going to do out here so what we want to say is let's just copy this out because it's going to be the css file in the similar fashion let's go ahead and paste that in and just change this to css let's go ahead and save that and now if we go ahead and load it we will see that our styling has also been applied to our component so this is the server component this is the app component which makes it very clear now if you are actually a guy who likes things to be much more automatic and seamless like me worry not because angular gives you the power to create components and not worry about if they're included in your module and everything just through the cli so if we were to go to our powershell part and we were to actually run a command that says ng generate component and we could say let's say so we have a server so we need somebody to let's say sub server so sub server now what the cli will do is it will go ahead and create everything that you need for your component so we see we have a sub server folder out here the sub server has a sub server.css file and this also has a sub server.component file now only we can go and put this so it has a component file has a paragraph that said sub server works there's also the testing file which we didn't create there's also the components file out here i mean the typescript file and as you guys can see it says app sub server so that is a selector that you use it with so let's go ahead and use this so we go ahead and put this into our servers html file and we can just say app sub server let's go ahead and save that and now what you should see is that there is a sub server works out here so basically what you did was you created a component through the cli and you basically just used it this is how you are going to be using most of your components creating most of your components and that is through the cli i just wanted to show you how you can do it manually too just so that you know how a server is written i mean how a component is written and what each line of code means when a component is also written now if you were to go ahead and compare this there is a constructor function and there is this ng on in it we will get to these parts later in our playlist because for now, if I were to go into the nuances of ng on init and a constructor, it would only create chaos and confusion in your mind. So that was about components for now. So it's time for our first assignment. Okay, guys, so that is how you use and create components using the Angular CLI. Now, coming back to the server component that we created, I would like to bring to your notice a few different things that you can do. So first of all, let's go ahead and analyze the selector part. So if you have any experience with web development, you will know that a selector is basically a way of selecting stuff or elements on your HTML page. Now, when we say app server like this out here, this could be anything. This could be a property. This could be a class or this could be an HTML element too. For now, this is an HTML element. But let me just show you this can also be used as a class. So let's see. We say it's dot app server and let's go ahead and save that 
So this is going to be dot app server. Now let's go ahead and find where we actually used our server. So we have used it app server like this. Now if you were to comment this out and let's say we put in a div that had a class and it said app server. Now as you see this is the server component that you are viewing and the sub server works. So let's go ahead and inspect that. Let's go into the body. That's the app root and then there's a div which has a class app server instead of an app server component. So what we did was that we created an app server and we made the class a selector. So the selector is basically a class now. Now the class can also have its own styling and that is basically how you do it. Now instead of actually writing your template URLs like this, you could also, let's command this out, you could also say something like a template. So your template could be just a template and you are going to put your template in these quotes. Now this could be something like subserver. Okay, so this will basically put the app subserver in this template. So instead of a template URL, you could be using a template too. And instead of a styles URL, basically you can do some inline styling. Now, before we go ahead with our next topic, what I would like you all to do is solve an assignment for me. So this assignment will test how good you are at creating your components. So let's go back and just change everything back to the way it was. So let's save it. Let's save this, let's save this, save everything. So out here we can just say app server again. And now that creates an app server for us. Okay, so this is save. And now I want you guys to do a basic assignment actually. So let me just write down the instructions for the assignment. Okay, so for your first assignment, this is exactly what you are going to do. So as you guys can see on the screen, I have put down three instructions. So first of all, what you have to do is create three components called red, green, and yellow. Now we have to use them in the app component part, and then we have to give them some appropriate styling and probably an appropriate message. So you guys can pause the video out here and go ahead and try and create these three components and then come back if you actually are successful or not also and check out the solution that I will provide you guys. Okay guys, so that was the first assignment I just gave you all. So I hope you guys had paused the screen when I told you that I'm giving you guys an assignment and I hope you guys actually try to solve it because in this part we are going to try and solve the assignment I just gave you. So this part you can use to see how correct you were. Well, it was a pretty easy assignment. So I hope most of you guys got it because that means I could successfully teach you how to actually use components. So for the solution we have created out here angular folder that says assignment one and it has nothing in it. So let me just go ahead and open it with Visual Studio Code. Out here if I were to go ahead and go to my source folder into the app folder and just go ahead into the spec.ts into the TypeScript file rather and we were to go ahead out here and I were to serve this, you would see that there is nothing. Okay, so if we were to just serve this file out here, you would see that it is the normal application that ships with Angular. So let's just ng open and serve. Okay, so as you guys can see, it says welcome to assignment one, and this is the basic application that Angular ships with. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna delete everything and we are gonna start from scratch. Now let's go back and see what we actually wanted to do. So what we have to do is create three components called red, green, and yellow. So let's go ahead and do that first. So to do create these elements, first of all, let's go ahead and delete all this garbage that we do not need, save it again, and let's just keep the title. So to keep the title, just pay attention to what I'm doing. Keep the title, this is very, you don't need to do this to get the assignment correct. All you need to do is make the components. So this is just me being fancy with you guys. So this, or we could say welcome to assignment one. Make this an H1 so that it looks better. Yeah, so welcome to assignment one. So that's it. 
Now what we have to do is create three components. So to create three components, what we want to do is create a new terminal in Visual Studio Code so that we can create the components really easily. And out here we want to type ng generate component red. And we're going to do this for three different times. So we're going to have the red component. We're also going to have the blue component. And we're also going to have the yellow component. Now, since we are doing this with the CLI, our app dot module automatically gets updated with red, blue and yellow. Now, all we need to do out here is use them because that is a second part. We have to use them in app component. So our app component is out here. This is our app component. So what we can do is say app red. This will produce the red part. This will produce the app and blue part. And this will produce the app yellow. Let's go ahead and save this. Now what we see is red works, blue works, yellow works. So we have successfully created three components and we have put them in our app component part. Now what we need to do is give them their styling. So let's go ahead and go into these separate components. Let's open up their styling files. We want to say because we already know that it's a paragraph that works there. So paragraph will have border of so since this is a blue component, we'll give it a blue border. So it'll be one px solid and blue. And maybe we can also turn the color to sky blue. I'm using very basic colors out here. Let's also copy this uh, because we're going to be using a very similar type of styling for red and yellow. So let's go into red and let's paste that. We want this to be red and this to be crimson and let's go into yellow and let's say the same thing this is going to be yellow we could use here and we could also use another color maybe a much more paler yellow let's keep it dark because fonts need to be dark actually so let's save these let's save this file let's save this file and let's save this file. Now let's go back and see how it actually is working. So blue works, yellow works. Um, we need to go and um, put up some more styling for the yellow part because that seems to be kind of going haywire. So let's go to yellow.css. Let's go here. So we have actually done this in the app component. Let's save this, go back to yellow, go back to yellow.css, paste this out here, and let's save it. So now our yellow is yellow, our blue is blue, and our red are red. We can also add some new styling to them by adding a background color. So this is also going to be a yellow, or we can rather choose some different yellow maybe. Let's make it much paler on the yellow side. Let's copy this line, put in red component.css. Okay, so for red, we can choose something of pale red sorts that makes it like that. And in blue, we can choose something of a blue sort. So for blue, we could go for a paler blue, and that should be much more paler. Let's save all of this. Now let's see. So yeah, we have a blue background, a yellow background. Why isn't our red background working? We haven't saved it, it seems. And our red background is working too. So we have successfully completed our assignment one. So I hope you guys are satisfied with the solution. I hope you guys could do it on your own too, so because that's exactly what matters. Okay, so now that we have learned about how components are the building blocks, we even made our own custom components, and we even did an assignment on one. So it's time we move on to the next topic, and that is data binding. So data binding is like communication. Well, what are we communicating? It's communication between your TypeScript file and your template. So basically your business logic and your and what basically the user sees. So suppose you click a button on a screen and you want to take some action according to that or you are retrieving some information from a calculation or from a server and you want to output that on a screen. Well, you do that with the help of data binding. Now there are two types of data binding. The first one is string interpolation and the second one is property binding. So this is the way of you outputting something onto the screen. 
So string interpolation and property binding. So let's go ahead and see how we can do them. So let's go back to our assignment that we had just done. So first of all, what we want to do out here is go to the modules and we actually want to remove all these components. Let's go ahead and just remove these components. Let's go ahead and remove these imports. And then we can go ahead and just delete these files out. Let's delete that. Let's delete this. Let's also delete this. Now let's go back to our app component and we have to remove these. So app module, we have to actually save this to. Now that we have saved it, we go ahead and see that it's just, uh, it says, welcome to assignment one. Now, out here you see that we are using this double curly braces and this is string interpolation. So what does string interpolation mean? Well, it converts anything, any variable, any string like this into an interpolated format and it shows it to you on the screen. So let me just give you a rather better example of a usage of string interpolation. So let's go back to our app component.html and out here we want to say there is a paragraph and in this paragraph we are outputting some server status. So let's say server is server with PID is go offline. So we want to actually put out something like this. So at this moment it will just simply say server with PID is offline, right? But what if our server had a certain name? So server name, let's say dash 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 with PID dash 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 is at a status of dash dash dash. Let's see. Now what we need to do is go ahead and go into our app component.ts file. So that is our TypeScript file. And now what we are going to do is create a few of what of these variables that we need. So first of all is server name and let's say the server name is Apollo. Okay, and we also need a server PID. So server PID is going to be let's say 11. And we also need a server status. And then we can set the server status to offline. So this will be a string. So that's why we just surround them with our single quotes. So mm -hmm. Now we can say something like this on our components.html page. So if you remember, we were getting the title of our general application that ships in with Angular when you make a new Angular project. You see that it says, welcome to so-and-so application. So that was done with string interpolation. If you remember, it was the curly braces that held something like title in there, right? So out here, what we can do is put some variable or even a function that will return a string or anything basically that can be converted into a string and that will be displayed out here between these curly braces. So what we can do is we can reference the server name. So our server name is basically kept in like this and then with PID. So we can put the PID out here. So this is a number. So the number can also be converted into a string. So therefore string interpolation will work in this process and we can also put in the server status of course. So we put in the server status by referencing the variable that holds the server status. Okay, so now we have done the string interpolation. So let's go ahead and see what our output looks like. So server name Apollo with PID 11, that is process ID 11 is offline. Now I had also said that we could put in a function out here. So let's go ahead and create a function. So in this function, we will basically toggle the server ID. So we can say toggle. So in this function, we will basically be toggling the server status. So we will say something like toggle server status. And this will return this dot server status equals to not. OK, so what we do out here is for toggling this, we will say equals to false. So if it's false, let's just understand that it is going to be offline. We could put in some logic to say that false will print out offline, but let's not get into that for now. So we can say something like, or rather, let's not deal with this. Let's do it the way it should be done. 
not be lazy people. Now we can say there is a status flag and it is set to true or false in this case because it is offline. Now this dot server status flag will be made true out here. So status equals to true. So we're going to make it true or rather we could make it not of this dot server status status flag and status flag now that will work properly because this will basically convert it and there should be no spaces out there and we can say if this dot server status flag equals to true so we can say if this dot status flag equals true we have to open more braces and we'll say server status this dot server status will be set to online okay and there we go and after this has been done we can just return this dot server status right so basically what is happening out here is we have set a flag okay missing white space quick fix so we can put in a triple equals just to make sure it's exactly true and not only check the eq valence that is and also check the value so out here what we are doing is we are setting a status flag to false and according to that status flag we are changing the server status to online or offline okay so now that we have put in this function we can use that function by calling it in our string interpolation method so just instead of putting our variable we can put in the function and this will change the server status to online now basically what we are doing here is really simple is it's returning a string and it's being converted into a string okay so now that we have toggled the server status to online and we did that through passing a function in the string interpolation so now let's understand how we can do property binding so every html element has some property or the other these properties list can be easily found on mdn that is the mozilla developer network so let me just give you an example of a property so let's say we had a button to toggle the server status further from offline to online again and again instead of just being toggled from offline to online hard coded into the code so let's say we had a button and let's say this said toggle server status right so if we had something like a button like toggle server status so we have a button like this out here but it really doesn't do much at this moment but let's say just for the sake of showing property binding let's say the button was disabled and you wanted this button to be actually enabled after two seconds that your website has loaded up just so that there are no discrepancies in the button press okay so we can achieve that by writing a constructor function in our class component so out here you can make a constructor so we can say set timeout so we have to first give the time after which it will be enabled so let's say two and a half seconds so it's two and a half seconds and now we have to put in a logic of actually turning this button to be enabled so let's say we have a variable called button state so button state at this moment should be true because our button is disabled first it should stay disabled and then it should get enabled so we have to say this dot button state equals to false right so now that we have done that all we have to do is go ahead and bind this property so we do property binding by putting the property in between this square bracket and then binding it to the outcome of a variable or a function so out here we can say we are going to bind it to button state okay we need double quotes for this i'm sorry not single quotes so button state now what is happening out here after the constructor is going to get executed our button state is going to become false so disabled will become false and first of all it will be true because the button state being true for the first two and a half seconds and actually let's see this in action so our page is loading and after two and a half seconds our button becomes active so let me just show that to you again it's inactive for two and a half seconds and then it suddenly becomes active so this is how you perform property binding so what we just saw here is we saw string interpolation in action we passed a string interpolation arguments with variable names and we even did a function then following that we did property binding so for property binding 
we first created a button so that we can toggle the server status but we haven't really added that functionality yet we are yet to do that but what we did was we binded the disabled property of the button to a certain variable now this could have also been a function and it will be the same way you just pass in the function with the brackets and it'll work and now what we will see is something that is our next topic and that is event binding so event binding is basically um, binding dom events to certain logic that will reside in your typescript so we want to bind our toggle server status that we had created out here because we are basically toggling the server status and then returning the server status so we can basically do that by passing an event so every button has an event called click and to click we will pass the event toggle server status with the brackets now this will become active after 2.5 seconds and basically it's not working as we wanted it to so let's go ahead and inspect it okay so it's not working because we are toggling the server status out here and what we want to do is return the server status so it should actually work to be honest so this dot server status so if we were to just output the server status out here okay so we do not have a logic out here so to make it back to go offline so else we can just add something like else this dot server status equals offline so now that we have set up our function to even display offline and because we were first changing it back to online and there was no real logic to change it back to offline again so now let's do that and now we can have a toggling happening out here so we can change it to online we can change it offline so now we have a button that can actually toggle our server status from online to offline and so forth and so on so that was event binding and property binding and we also saw string interpolation so with the help of event binding and property binding now we have a button that can actually make it offline and online but there's another way that we can do this and that is two-way binding so for two-way binding what we're going to see is basically we are going to combine property binding and event binding so let's try and do that so for event binding let's go back to our code editor and out here let's go to our html page and what we want to say out here okay so let's remove all this so we can make this server information so first of all we can have a form so basically we can have an input of type text and this will take in let's say let's put a placeholder and let's put in server name let's also put a button below this and this will be a submit button or rather instead of a button what we can do to show two-way binding is put in a paragraph and we are going to type out our server name out here and we are going to put in the server name here so server name is going to be here so this is basically string interpolation and what i am interpolating is the server name that we had created okay so this has a capital s so let's not forget that so our capital s should be out here and what we are going to do is basically use ng model so to use ng model what you need to do is go into your app module out here so in your app module what you need to import is basically the forms module so to import the forms module you have to say import forms module from other rate angular slash forms so that's it and we have to put this in single quotes and out here what we need to do is let's go ahead and see what is saying disable rule import spacing so we basically imported the forms module and this forms module will have a functionality called ng model so ng model will let us bind whatever is being typed to be actually binded to a certain variable so we can put that ng model property to our input so this ng model will be binded as an event and also as a property so we need to pass in the server name so let's see we have a server name called apollo out here so it's already pre-filled with apollo 
and let's say we want to name our server something else so let's call it the jigsaw so jigsaw could be the name of a server and as you guys can see it is being automatically updated out here so that is two-way binding so just to give you guys the difference between two-way binding and one-way binding what we can do out here is say put a placeholder so this is the same part we will have server name so what we can do is make another input and this time around we are going to put ng model as just a property so ng model with camel casing and we are going to say it will be binded to server name so let's bind it to server name and let's see what happens so now we have two inputs and everything is filled with apollo now if you see out here if i go ahead and change apollo out here it is not automatically changing in the paragraph two because it is only one way binded while out here if we were to give the name paul to our server it would automatically update it everywhere but if you were to go ahead and delete a little bit it's not really updating it out here because it's not two-way binding you need a event to actually go ahead and submit this so that your event and your property gets binded together and basically you have two-way binding then okay so that does it and just to make this a little more interesting let's make this something like h1 so we can put an h2 and let's say input server information okay so once we have that ready so we can say server name and the server id will be the pid basically so we have an input server name part and then we can display server information out here so display display server information what we can do is let's just copy this out so server pid is it the server pid i constantly forget it's server pid so that's why server pid will be presented and server status so now we basically have a small little server page going on and we have a button that can toggle the server status we have a place where we can input the server name so what we just saw out here is basically we saw string interpolation so all this output is being shown to you through string interpolation we are binding a property to this button and with the help of that we are toggling it for the first 2.5 seconds this is disabled now and this will become enabled then we saw event binding where we actually toggle the server status with the help of a button and then we also saw two-way event binding where we put in an input method or an input element and we are constantly displaying what is there in the input with the help of um, two-way binding so this brings us to our second assignment for today and in this video i would like to say that again please try and solve the assignment on your own and these are the instructions for your second assignment so for assignment two what you have to do is create a page that can take the input of a first name using two-way data binding and you have to output the name using string interpolation so again for using two-way data binding remember you have to use ng model and to use ng model you have to go and import the forms module and to your app into your apps.module.ts file and in that apps.module.ts file you will also have to declare it out there so don't forget to do all that and in the output you have to actually use string interpolation then we have to add a button to reset the name to a blank string so this should be something like property binding i guess i won't know until i solve it myself and again this button should be disabled if the name field is currently empty so i would suggest that you pause the video right here and you go ahead and solve this and if you can't solve it you can always follow along with me because i will be coding to the solution of this assignment right now so let's go back to our code editor and what we're going to do now is try and solve assignment number two so i'm going to keep on editing the assignment project that we had made i'm not going to make new assignment project so what we're going to do is basically remove everything from here let's remove everything we will also be needing some new logic so this is not going to work for us so let's go ahead and remove that we also don't need a constructor function we don't need anything we just need the class to be there and that's all at this moment i will also let ng module be there in our apps.module because we will be needing it so i'm not going to edit this out so let me just say that i have saved everything and now all we have is a blank canvas that we can start developing on so our first instruction says that we have to create a page that can take the input of a first name using two-way data binding so let's see 
you want the user to know that he is inputting his first name. So label, and this is going to be for, so it's going to be for first name. So we can say F name, something like this. And then we can say first name. And out here, what we can do is put an input that has type text and it also has a name of F name. So the label is now binded to our input. This is how you should properly always code. We also should put in a placeholder even though we have a label because that is just good practice. So we are gonna say first name in the placeholder. And now we have a place that we can put in our first name in. So we can also put in a space out here. So first name is gonna be here, right? And we also need to input our first name in a paragraph according to the second instruction. So we can put it out in a paragraph and we can use string interpolation for this and we can just use a variable called name because we are only dealing with one name, there's no last name. So we can just create a variable called name. Now we go back to our TypeScript and we create a variable called name and let's keep it blank for now. Okay, we are not gonna use double quotes, we are gonna use single quotes and let's keep it blank for now. So now we can say our name which should be displayed out here. So basically what we need to do is two-way binding. So that is pretty simple. We learned that really easily that we can do this through the ng model and we can bind it to the property of the name or rather the variable name that we just created. So out here we will have a name and we can just go ahead and start typing now and our name gets typed out here. Now the other thing that we need to do is we need to add a button to reset the name to a blank string. So first let's go ahead and create that button for ourselves. So we need a button and this button should set reset name and basically it should have a function or an event whenever it's clicked. So whenever it's clicked it should have a function that basically goes ahead and turns the name blank again. So we can have a function called reset name. So reset name is going to be our function so let's go ahead and create that function now so reset name is going to be our function and what we want to do is set this dot name equals to blank again we can actually do this without the event i guess so we can fix the missing white space let's see if we are actually if you do reset name it goes ahead and resets the name to blank so we have binded it to an event and that is the click event and we need reset name out here. We are not passing anything because it is directly being binded to the property or rather the event out here. So now we need to bind it to a property. So the property that we are going to bind it to is disabled. So the disabled property is going to now check a function basically to see if the name has any value or not. So this can be really easily done by actually saying something like name dot length zero but we are not going to try and add code out here so let's just stick to the functions actually we could actually have done a tertiary operation and basically done it in one line but why do that so let's see check name so check name is either going to return true or false so now we have check name and what we can say is if this dot name equals to equals to and we can also set state so state is true we are going to need the state variable to actually handle the disabled functionality so if this dot name is equals to equals to equals to blank what we want to say is this dot state will remain true or what we can do is if it is unequals to this what we can do is say this dot state equals to so let's go over our logic again. So if our state is true and if it is not an empty string rather, we are gonna turn our disable to false. So if it is false out there, what we need to do out here is say check name. Okay, so we made a mistake. We can't do that. Let's see, inspect, console and template. Can't bind to disable since it isn't a known property of button. Okay. So disable is not the known property because it's disabled. So that was the silly error that we had made. Now let's see, let's go ahead and load it. Okay, so check name is not a function. Okay, so let's go ahead and use check name. 
we actually forgotten to save this out here. Go ahead and put the white space there. So now we have a button that can actually set the string to a blank string again. But according to our assignment, it says that this button should be disabled if the name is empty. So this way we can actually practice our property binding. So basically we have to bind the property disabled to a function that will basically return the state. So let's say it is a function that is called check name. And now let's go ahead and create this function. So check name is going to be our function and put that in double quotes. Now let's go back to our app module out here. So let's create a state first. Now the state is going to be false first of all. And let's say we are going to have another function called check name. And in check name, what we want to do is check whether so we can do the checking part with an if statement. So this dot name, we are checking for the name if it is empty string. And if it is an empty string, what we want to do is make our button disabled. And that can be done by just returning true in our state variable. So we're going to set it to true and we are going to return it. So return this dot state. So if we return this dot state out here, we are going to have a button now that is basically disabled. Okay, first of all, we need to go ahead and check what we have done wrong. So we need to go ahead and save this. So check name is actually being passed. Now let's go ahead and reload that. So now we see that we have a button that is disabled, but as soon as we start typing, the button gets enabled and we can click it to basically put it back into disabled state and also making the first name string into a blank string. So this is the solution to assignment number two. I hope you guys had followed along with me. And if you had any doubts while solving it on your own, the doubts have been cleared now. Now let's move ahead and let's look at the last topic for our Angular basics today, and that is directives. So what exactly are directives? Well, let's head over to Angular's site and let's see what they are saying about directives. Well, it says that there are two kinds of directives out here. So one is attribute directive and one is a structural directive. So an attribute directive changes the appearance or behavior of a DOM element. So in short, a directive is basically an instruction to the DOM. Now this instruction may be to change the DOM due to some attribute or it could structurally change the DOM too. So that is a structural directive. So structural directives are basically used in places where you want to input a certain, let's say a division like out here, a division is being used with the directive ng if, and we are outputting hero.name out here. So what this is, is basically there is an if statement and we will get to what ng if means just in a moment, but this is a directive and this has instructions written in a module, which we will also get into future lectures about directives where we take a much, much deeper look into what directives are and how custom directives can be built by you. But for now, we are just going to understand what a directive does. So in short, a directive is a structure and this structure gives instructions to the DOM. So let's look what a directive looks like and how directives can be made by just reading the documentation. So to build a directive, what we have to say is let's say we give a directive as app highlight. So we have to create a directive, say ng generate directive. So this is a CLI command out here. So we can generate directives like that. But for now, what we are going to do is we are going to use some built in directives to understand how attribute directives and how structural directives are actually working. So the directives that we are going to be using are ng if, ng else. So basically if and else and ng for. So these are the three directives that we are going to be using today. And after I show you how to use these directives, I will also be giving you an assignment and that will be your last assignment for this angular tutorial. And we will wrap it up after that. In the future, we will be actually discussing every single bit that we have learned about today. That is components data binding, two way data binding directives. Everything will be done in much more detail. And when we are doing this in detail, we will have an overarching project. So we will be building a project through the course of this playlist. And by the end, you will feel pretty confident that you can go out there and pretty much crack Angular interview job out there because we will be teaching you how to build an app. And 
in the end we will also train you for angular interview questions okay but for now let's just focus on how to use the built-in directives that ship with angular so to use the built-in directives let's see what we can do so the first directive that we want to use is basically an ng if directive so let's see what we can do to show ng if so ng if is basically to show something structurally let's put up an h1 that says this is an example of ng if now we want to show something if a variable is true and we want to show something else if it is false right so we can do that by simply saying p so we will show a paragraph and let's say ng if so we are going to tie it up to an expression and we are going to call this expression a flag and we are going to say flag is true and we are going to say flag is false otherwise so out here to show flag is false otherwise we are going to use something called a local reference so a local reference is used within the ng template so for the ng template we have to give a local reference name so let's call it the else block and in the else block we want to put out a paragraph that says flag is false now we need some way to actually toggle this flag so let's create a button so we are going to say something like toggle flag and out here for toggling flag we are going to put an event and we are going to bind this event to a function that toggles our flag so we are going to call this function toggle flag okay so we have our template created now all we need to do is add the business logic for this so for all the logic that we need to do is create a variable called flag first of all so let's go ahead and delete all this that we don't need so we are going to have a variable called flag and flag will be first of all set to true now there is also going to be a function called toggle flag and in this function what we are going to do is we are just going to toggle it now to toggle this all we can do is this dot flag equals to not of this dot flag so this is a really easy way to toggle a variable and just now we can just return this dot flag so since we are doing that so now what we can do is save this and let's see how that actually works so it says flag is true and flag is false so flag is false is actually not being displayed because we have not referenced this local reference that we have created so we have a local reference and we need to create it and we do that by saying else we create the else block now let's go ahead and save that let's see flag is true and now flag is false flag is true flag is false so to make sure that we are actually putting up two different paragraphs so let's go ahead and inspect this let's go into our body let's go into app root and let's see this button so this has a paragraph created out here so let's toggle this and a new paragraph gets created which says flag is false now flag is true flag is false flag is true flag is false so this is a brilliant way to actually show something very conditionally now I can show you this is a other block that we are actually showing instead of one block being constantly just modified it is a separate block in itself so that is a very important thing to know so let's go ahead and do that again so let's save it and now let's go ahead and see what we can get so in our head or rather in the body we have the app root and now we have paragraph that says flag is true and now there is another paragraph with the id flas which is a very wrong way to spell false but it proves the point that this is a new block in itself so this is how you can use ng if now let's look at another interesting inbuilt directive that ships with angular and that is ng style so with ng style what you can do is you can give dynamic styling depending on a certain condition now if you analyze what we have out here we do have a certain condition which is where the flag is true or flag is false now what we want to do is we want to color this this is an example of ngif into red or green if flag is true or false respectively so we can do that very easily with the help of something called ng style so with ng style what we do is we give a property now this property may not be in single quotation marks so you can say color and what you can do is you can put an expression 
Now you can say something like a function that is get color and you could execute that. Now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and create this function called get color. So we are going to get the color and we are going to return a color that is probably a string according to the flag. So if so what we want to say is if this dot flag is equals to equals to true, we want to return we want to return green and if it is false, we want to return red. So let's go ahead and see so as you guys can see, this is green right now, and this turns red, and then turns green and red again. So what we did basically, we passed an expression, and in this expression, we are putting in a color, and the get color method is returning a string which either says red or green. So this is how you can dynamically add styles to your elements on your HTML page. Now another way to do dynamic styling is with the help of ng class. So what we can do out here is we can add a class to an element dynamically. So let's say we have another H2 and let's say this is just an example of ng class. Now what I want to do is we want to turn this. So the class we want to add is basically let's call it white and we want to add this when get color returns true let's say so we just want to go ahead and paste that logic out there and now what we have to do is go into the app component css file and create a class called white and this class will basically put a black border border 1px solid black it will rather let's make it a red and then we want a background color of let's say black and we want the font color to go white so this is a bunch of styling that we are adding which is basically the real reason you use classes in css so that you can use a bunch of styling together now that we have created the class let's go ahead and save all our files and let's go ahead and see what it looks like so this is what it looks like this is just an example of ng class now when this is set to false the class is removed let me just show that to you so if we go ahead in the body part and go into app root and just look at this class that will be added. So we add a class called white and then we remove a class called white class called white. And this is how ng class can be used to put in all sorts of dynamic styling into your HTML elements with the help of ng class. OK, so the next directive that we are going to have a look at is called ng4. So let me just give you guys a quick example of how to use ng4 before I dive into the last assignment of this tutorial. So ng4 is used when you actually want to iterate through an array. So let me just show you what I mean. So let's say you had a bunch of names or let's make something very viable. So first of all, let's call this something like the student roster. So h1, so this is called the student roster. Now suppose you had a method, so input, and what we are going to say is placeholder is name and out here we also want to display the name so all the name of the students we will want to display so student roster and there will be a button to say submit so this will say submit student name and this will have a function so whenever we click it we want to add the name that we just entered into let's say an array so we can say add is the name of the function now what we want to do is go ahead and first of all create a student roster so student roster is equals to let's say let's add some pre-built students so aria and let's say rohit and let's say opasana now what we want to do is let me just fix these white spaces up. Now what we want to do is we want to display the student roster and then we also want to add to the student roster every time the button is clicked. So we have a function for that and it's called add. And basically what we want to do is we want to push an element. So that could be a current name. So current name could be blank for now. And let's leave it like that. And what we want to say is this dot student roster dot push we want to push in this dot 
current name. So what this will do is this will push in the current name. Let's go ahead and make a place so that we can display it. Now the whole point is that we want to display it in one single item. We do not want to create, let's say, a paragraph for every time this list has to be populated. So what we can do is we can simply create a list item and out here we can just say ng4, let's say names in the student roster. So student roster. So is that how we had named it? Student roster, and that's exactly how we had named it. And what we want to display out is the names. So what we have done right now is we are pushing in something, but what exactly are we pushing in? Well, we need to add that to our input. So what we need to do is say ng model and we are going to ng model this into the current name. So now that we have done that, now what we want to do is we just want to interpolate the name out here. So this will just display the names. So this is going to be names. Let's go ahead and save that. Let's see that if it displays the names. So we have names Arya, Rohit and Upasana. So let's say someone like Rahul also joins the class. And we can say submit student and Rahul is now added to the student roster. Okay, so this is how you can basically use ng4. We have one list item and basically it is going around and circulating through everything that is there in this array just out here. So now that we have seen the usage of ng if, ng if else, and ng4, let's go ahead and do our last assignment. Let's not forget we also saw how we can use dynamic styling. So we are also going to incorporate that into our assignment. So let me just go ahead and type out the instructions for your assignment. Okay guys, so this is your last assignment. I will again remind you that for assignments, you have to pause the screen and try and do the assignment on your own. And then you can compare your solution with the code along part that comes after the assignment. So for assignment number three, we have create a button to toggle a paragraph display. The paragraph could be saying anything. So after that, we have to log the number of times the button was clicked. Okay, so it says button out here, but its button was clicked. And after the fifth click, we have to give some specific style to the log. Okay, so this seems like a pretty easy thing to do. What we have to do out here is basically get rid of everything that is here. And let's first create a button that says toggle display. And then we can add a paragraph that says Lorem Ipsum. So Lorem Ipsum is just a random paragraph. So let's go ahead and see this. So this says toggle display, but toggle display at this moment does nothing. So we have to put a functionality into the click. So click will basically return true or false. So we can bind this to a function that let's say toggle display. So this will return true or false. So we have to go ahead and create the toggle display method first. So toggle display. And what we want to say is this dot state, let's say. So let's create a state variable first. So state is going to be true. And toggling is basically what we had learned that we have to turn it into something that it is not. So this dot state equals to not of this dot state and that should do it for us so this will toggle the display so now that we have toggled the display now all we have to do is bind this logic so we say ng if and we only want to show this if state is equals to equals to true so if that is what we have done correctly we are toggling the display and this is true now what we need to do another thing is according to the instructions of the assignment is that we have to log the number of times the button was clicked. So what we need is basically a counter to count the number of times we have clicked the button. Now every time the button is clicked, we want to actually increase the counter and we can simply do that with an incremental statement. So this dot counter. Now what we want to do is we want to say out here we want to create a paragraph and this will have ng4 and so click of Click so rather counter. So for ng4, this needs to be pushed into an array. So we are going to say button click. Okay, so there's another way to do this. We don't really need a counter, or rather, we can make counter into an array itself. And 
when this is clicked all we need to do is say this dot counter dot push a counter dot length plus one so we are going to say this dot counter dot length plus one so the length initially is zero so this should just go ahead and add it to this counter now what we want to do is we also want to cycle through this array of counters so clicks in counters and what we want to do is we want to print out the click information so let's see so now that we have actually put the logic to push the length of a counter into our array we need to do and cycle this array so to cycle the array we are going to create a paragraph and we're going to say ng4 and we're going to say clicks of counter and what we are going to try and interpolate out here is the counter or rather the clicks and let's see if that works so out here we have our display we're going to click it once click it twice and we can see it goes on and on and on and we have kind of created a counter and this is kind of logging it all down now that we have set up our counter for our toggling all we need to do is follow the last instruction and that is after the fifth click we have to give some specific style to the log okay so we can do this with the help of ng styles so ng styles let's see we want to make the color of our font blue only when get length is more than five so get length is a function so this will return some value or the other so let's go ahead and create that too so get length is going to react and create if let's see this dot counter dot length is greater than four then we want to return the string blue else we want to return the string black so now we have a function that returns something and we have binded that function with the color style with the use of ng style directive so let's go ahead and see if this works for us so let's toggle the display one two three four five and that has turned our list into a blue list just after five so this is how you would approach the solution to assignment three Let us start with what is react.js. React is a declarative, efficient and flexible JavaScript library for building user interfaces. And also it lets you to compose complex UIs from small and isolated piece of code called components. Right, I'll make it more simpler and introduce react to you. React is just an open source JavaScript library that is used for building user interfaces. So it was developed and it is maintained by Facebook and it is widely used by many companies and organizations worldwide. React.js allows developers to build the reusable UI components that can be easily combined to create complex and dynamic user interfaces. So this makes it easier to manage the code and reduces the time and effort required to build and maintain the applications. So why it is so easy because react uses a virtual dom that is nothing but the document object model so this dom will be keep track of the changes to ui and update only the part of page that need to be updated so which can be result in improved performances this virtual dom approach also makes the react as high effective and fast so even with the large and complex user interfaces so finally, I will tell you that React.js is a powerful and flexible front-end library that enables the developers to build fast, efficient and dynamic user interfaces. With that, we will see why it is so popular and the features of React.js. So I'll start with the main important feature that is reusable components. So here in React.js, the one of the most important feature is considered as the reusable components. So in React, it is the ability to create the reusable UI components. So these components can be made easy by combining to build the complex UI interfaces. 
by reducing the amount of code that need to be written and making it easy to maintain and manage. So at the end, so this kind of feature will lead you to faster development and reduce the time to market your projects. And the next feature is virtual DOM. Here React uses the virtual DOM as I mentioned previously. So which acts as an intermediary between the applications and the actual DOM. So the virtual DOM keeps track of the changes to the UI and updates only the part of the page that need to be updated rather than updating the entire page, right? So this can be greatly improve the performance of the applications and it ensures the fast and effective updates. So by using this uh, virtual DOM, the next feature comes that is the fast and efficient. By using the virtual DOM and other performances optimizations, React can be very fast and efficient, even with the large and complex UI interfaces, right? So this can lead to improve the user experiences and it reduce the load times. Nowadays, if you see, React is widely adopted. Why? Because it is easy to learn. React has a relatively small learning curve compared to other front-end frameworks and libraries. So this can make it accessible to the developers of all levels of experiences and can help to reduce the time and effort required to get started with building applications. And also you need to keep in mind that the React has large and growing community of developers and users, which means there is a wealth of resources, tutorials and support available to help the developers get started and overcome some of the challenges. So these kind of communities can also help drive innovative and development, making React a strong and evolving platform. The next benefit is popularity and adoption of React. Here, the React is widely used and popular with many major companies and organizations, which are using for their web applications. So this popularity and adoption can help ensure that the React will continue to be developed and supported by making it a reliable platform for building applications. So I hope you all also will join the community. And the final one is improved user experiences, right? Here, by allowing the developers to build dynamic, interactive and some responsive user interfaces, React can greatly improve the overall user experiences of application. So this can lead to increase the engagement and satisfaction by making the application more successful and effective. So I hope you understood why it is so popular with these features, right? Now let us jump into the setup environment. So as you know, React is a JavaScript library for building the user interfaces and it requires few tools to get started, right? So the first one is Node.js here. React requires Node.js to install on your system. Like Node.js is a platform for running JavaScript code outside of the browser. So you can download this latest version of Node.js from the official website that is nodejs.org. So I'll show you. Now go and type nodejs.org and you will get into this site and you can see here the latest version is 18.14.0 right you need to click on that and you need to follow the installation instructions for your operating system so i'm using windows so i already have node.js so we'll just verify go to comment prompt and just type node and you will get the version so I had installed 18.12 version. So that's fine. You can install the new version if you don't have. Right. The next one is to install Visual Studio Code. So you know Visual Studio is a code editor. You can go to the visualstudio.com. So you will get into this site and you can install for Windows or any operating system that you are using for. 
so this is also a simple installation you can click on it and follow the installation instructions also you can use sublime text and atom also so i would recommend you to install visual studio code or any code editor that feels comfortable so once you install both of the prerequisites then we will move on and create a project directory for that go to terminal or command prompt so i'm using command prompt now i will initialize the project by typing npx create react app then give space and mention the project directory here let me give my hello world right hit enter so as you can see a new react app is created wait until the configuration is getting over so as you can see everything is installed successfully and you can see happy hacking over here right now that we have a react project set up you can start the development server in your terminal by navigating to your uh, project directory so i have navigated to the project directory and just type npm that is node package manager and start so by doing this uh, you will start the development server so this will start the development server and you will be able to view your react app in your web browser in local host 3000 as you can see our uh, react app has been successfully shown here right so by following these steps you should now have a fully functional environment for development react app you are now ready to start building your own react app and explore all the features and benefits of this powerful library called react now that we just saw how to install the react and other prerequisites now we will look into the tool chains so i have some of the popular tool chain listed over here and uh, we will see here the first one is create react app so this is an officially supported command line tool for creating react projects so it set up a basic react project with all the required dependencies and a development server so it will allow you to start building your app right away now the next one we have next.js so this is a popular framework for building the server side rendered react application so this includes the features like automatic uh, code splitting, optimized performance and easy integrations with other technologies like TypeScript and GraphQL, right? So the next one is Gatsby. So this is nothing but it is a static site generator that uses React to build fast and efficient website. And the final one we have is Redux. So it is a state management library for JavaScript applications that provides a centralized store. And it reduces to manage and update the application state in a predictable way. So this is a popular state management library. So that's often used with React. And also it provides a way to manage your application state in a single centralized store and making it easier to manage and debug your applications. So these are few just examples for popular tool chains with React. The exact tools that you choose will depend on your specific needs and requirements for your project. With this, I hope you all understood the tool chains. Next, we will move on to how to create a Hello World app. So you know that we have already created a development server over there. So we will start there itself. You can see this is a simple React syntax for Hello World. It's just have import React from import and we have a React DOM and we have just in one Hello World in a H1 tag. So now that we have a development environment set up, right? So let us write Hello World application now. So let us go to Visual Studio Code. So as you can see, I have opened Visual Studio Code and just 
go to the files here open folder right you can see my hello world and select folder so with that you will get that folder inside your visual studio right so you need to just uh, go to index.js into the uh, src file so here uh, i have just uh, written the import react from react and import react dom and i have the element over here that is h1 and i have just um, rendered this in the root so if i run this i should get this hello world in h1 tag so this is how you write uh, a simple hello world program in react now we will jump into the core concept of react that is component so what are components components are independent and reusable bits of code uh, they serve the same purpose as javascript functions do so it works in isolated and uh, written html right so in other words we can say that every application you will develop in react will be made up of the pieces of components yes that's true right so what are components in general so they are uh, building blocks of react js applications right so they allow you to split your user interfaces into reusable independent pieces that can be composed to form the complex uis so there are two types of components in react js one is the functional components the other one is class components here functional components so these are uh, stateless components that only receive the props as an input and renders html so they can be defined using the functions that returns jsx that is nothing but the javascript with the html syntax right now if you look into the class components so these are stateful components that can be managed their own interval state and have access to the lifecycle method so they are defined using a class that extends the react dot component class so here components can receive the inputs in the form of uh, props and can manage their own interval state the state is an object that holds the data specific to a component and it can be updated using the set state method react js components can also manage their own behavior for example by handling the user events and making the api calls so when a component state or props changes here the react js will automatically re-render the component okay and by allowing your application to stay up to date with the latest data here the components in react js are designed to be modular and reusable so this will allow you to build the complex applications by composing the simple independent components for uh, examples of the components a button component that displays a text label and triggers a callback function when clicked right so a form component that renders input fields and handles the user submission so that is upon the forms and the next one will be card component that displays an image title and description etc right so these are the examples of the component so at the end of this session we will be looking into a project it is of to do list project so i will be explaining all of these components and buttons how they work everything so stay tuned so this is all about the theory in the components now let us just move into jsx in react right jsx is an extension for javascript that allows the developers to embed the xml like syntax within their code by making it easier to write the components and templates so it is self explanatory now let us directly jump into what is jsx so as i said jsx is a syntax extension for javascript that makes it easier to write the components so it was developed by facebook and it is used in many popular frameworks such as react okay now with this jsx you can write the components using the syntax that are resembles the html right 
by making it easier to read and understand. And if you see some of the benefits of uh, using GSX is it improves the readability and maintainability of the code. And also it allows for a reusable components and it can simplify the complex UI logic. Okay. Now, if you see the GSX syntax, so it uses XML like syntax, right? For example, the following code shows you like how to create a button using GSX. So this is a simple syntax for creating a button. And if you see the next one embedded expressions. So here JSX also uh, can also be used to embed the expression within the components. So by using the curly braces here, you can see we have used the curly braces, right? So these are if you want to embed some of the expression inside syntax, then you can use curly braces for this. And uh, JSX is most commonly used in React where it is used to define the components. To use JSX in your React projects, you will need to install a transpiler such as Babel. So which will convert your JSX code into regular JavaScript that can run in your browser. So if I want to conclude what is JSX, it is nothing but a powerful syntax extension for JavaScript that can make it easier to write the components in the React. So uh, with its improved readability, reusable components and ease of use. So it is a great tool for building complex user interfaces. So I hope you understood GSX. We will move on to embedding expressions. Okay, what is embedding expression? Like how do you embed expressions inside the React? So embedding expressions in React, it refers to the incorporating the dynamic values such as data from state or props. So if you can see here in the below example, as you can see, we have uh, uh, the constant name as Edureka uh, and the element is welcome to. So here we have embedded the name over here. So uh, here I will be getting the output as welcome to the name has edureka so here this value will be embedded inside this name inside this curly braces okay that is what this embedding expressions means so this will allow you to create a dynamic and interactive user interfaces okay for example the values might be changing in some of the applications right so that will be added here in the curly braces so that is the simple logic behind that so here I will give you another example here. So I have a piece of code. So this example here, uh, as I mentioned you in the earlier example, I had Edureka over there. Here I have John Duke. And this name will be embedded inside this hello John Duke. For example, uh, you get any mail from any websites. For example, you get a mail from Edureka, right? So here uh, they will be just uh, sending you mail by telling hi and your name. For example, if I get hi Tejashwini and they will be some messages, right? So that hi, that name is there, no? So that will be dynamically changed each time. So in case I get any mail, it comes in my name. And if you get any mail that comes in your name, that the name will be changed dynamically according to the persons. And you can even embed any valid JavaScript expressions within the curly braces. Here, uh, this includes the things like arithmetic operations, uh, function calls, ternary operators, etc. So if I show you another example over here. So I have some constant number over here. For example, I have a number 1 and number 2 and 10 and 20 respectively, right? So here uh, the output shows the number of sum of number 1 is 10, right? So here the number 1 is 10 and the number 2 is 20 and it will give you the sum of both number 1 and number 2. And it is important to note that when embedding expressions in React, you should only use the expressions that are guaranteed to be side effect free such as simple calculations, string concatenations or array access. So here uh, you should not use expressions that causes side effects. So for example, the function calls or set state 
within the curly braces so has this can lead to unexpected behaviors uh, and additionally it is a good practice to keep your expression simple and concise to improve the readability and maintainability of the code so we have next topic that is rendering elements so in a react js rendering elements refers to the process of displaying the ui components on the screen so unlike browser dom elements the react elements are plain objects and are cheap to create here the dom takes care of the updating the dom to match the react elements an element describes what you want to see on the screen right I, as i said previously so here an element is a plain javascript object that represents a part of ui so when the react updates the element it updates the ui accordingly so whatever it it is been changed it automatically change in the screen also right so here we call this root dom node because uh, everything inside it will be managed by a react dom so if you can remember that uh, i have created hello world program previously right so i have mentioned root over there so whatever i change inside the element so everything will be changed through this root okay now let us look into rendering list rendering list in react js refers to the process of displaying a list of elements on the user interfaces using react component right so this can be achieved by mapping over an array of data and creating a react component from each item in the list so if i make it more simple for example you will often want to display some of the multiple similar components from a collection of data right so you can use this javascript array method to manipulate any array of the data so here i have shown the image over here right here to do's is an array of to do items see to do's is an array of to do's items the to do list components map over this array and creates a list of items that is inside the li for each to do items and this key prop here you can see the key you no know? so this property is added to each list item to make sure that react can efficiently update the list if the data has been changed this key property tells react which array item each component corresponds to so that it can match them up later right so this becomes an important if your array items can move next we have conditional rendering in react you can create a distinct component that encapsulates behavior you need then you can render only some of them depending on the state of your application here conditional rendering in react is a process of rendering components based on certain conditions or state the state of component can change dynamically and react allows you to conditionally render components based on the state of your application here react uses javascript to control the rendering of the components to perform conditional rendering you can use the javascript control structures such as if else statement ternary operator and switch statement conditional rendering in react works the same way that the condition works in javascript use this uh, javascript operators like if or the other conditional operators to create the elements representing the current state and let's the react update the ui to match them next we have handling events first let us define what are events events are actions or occurrence that happens in the browser such as a user clicking on a button a page finishing loading or an element being updated react allows us to handle these events and respond to them with the specific actions in react we handle events using the event handlers an event handler is a function that is executed when an event is triggered as i said if a user clicks on a button or etc to create an event handler in react we use the syntax 
on event name which is equals to in a flower bracket we use the function name okay where on event name is the event where we want to handle and the function name is the function that we will be executing the event in is triggered as you can see here we have the syntax difference between the html and the react code okay so here as you can see in html we have the events that are named using the lower cases but in case of react we use only camel case where that is the valid syntax in react and in html you can pass a function as a string as you can see in the example here we have a button where this is a event handler on click edureka and the button name is edureka so when the person clicks on the button called edureka the function will be changed or updated automatically so when it comes to react it is done with a jsx then you can pass a function has the event handler here i have given the same example but you can notice it is in the camel case on click and we have embedded the expression in the name of edureka right so let us take an example of a button component that increases a counter every time it's clicked here the component will have a state count that will store the value of a counter when the button is clicked we will call the handle click function that will be increasing the value of the counter right if you can see here here is a function and i have two parameters that is count and set count i'm using the use state over here so here this will act as an handle click function where it will be increased the value by 1 every time the handle click is called okay so here as you can see i have mentioned a button over here so let us take a look at the output you can see click me button over here so if any user clicks on it the handle click function is triggered and you will get the output or the value to be increased by 1 so you can see here you have clicked one times okay fine now i will click another time here and you can see the changes over here right so this is how we handle the event over here next we have binding event handlers the first and foremost common way to bind the event handlers is by using the arrow function in the on click property here event binding tells the browser that this function should be called whenever this event is triggered or in other words whenever the event is triggered the function which is bind with the event should be called here for example let's say we have a button in our component and we want to handle the click event of the button let me take the same example over there okay in this example we are using the arrow function you can see here right so this arrow function is to bind the click event of the button so whenever the button is clicked it will log the message button clicked in the console so this is one of the way now we will move on to composing components in general what is composing components okay imagine that you are building a website and where your website will be containing some of the components such as navbar search bar some of the text some buttons etc right so here those components are not built together they were built separately and they were put into uh, your website by composing all the components that you have already prepared right so that is the same logic applied over here so uh, components are the piece of isolated code right so those are composed into a website so for example we will look into the code here you can see we have import react and you can see some of the to do list components over here and you can see the submit button and its function and you can see the form over here where we will be having the inputs like text 
submit buttons everything right so here these are small components so these are put in together and made it to be a website so as you can see here we have a text field to add your uh, task to do list task for example learn react so i will hit enter and i will just add task so if completed task it should go away if not uh, it is always incompleted right so if incompleted task is clicked you will get a motivation quit and you will have a delete task so this is the project that we are going to work so here this text this input field these buttons are each component so these are each components that i have put into and made a website so this is called composing of components right so as you can see here we have single components for example let's imagine this as a button this as a text this as an input field okay so these are put it together and made the website here from passing data from a parent to child component we use props right so here props data is sent by the parent component and cannot be changed by the child component as they are read only right here we have the props and here we have state so whatever components that is sent by props that cannot be changed by the state over here because it is props is a parent component and whereas state is a child component where these child components are only to be read only next we will move on to props and state we will explore what are props and states and their differences in react props in short for properties and they are used to pass data between the react components here react's data flow between the components is unidirectional it is like from parents to child only where props are the arguments passed into the react components here the props are passed to the components via html attributes where props are passed to components via html attributes in simple props allow you to pass data from one component to another component as an argument where state holds information about the components here let's imagine uh we have a parent that is props and a state that are children right where here the props will assign some of the information to the uh, state or uh, the props will pass data from one component to another component where the state will be only containing the informations now finally we will move into life cycle hooks after that we will see on a small project here each component in react has a life cycle which you can monitor and manipulate during its three main phases that is mounting update and unmounting phase now let us look into detail of each phases let's start with the mounting phase here mounting means putting elements into the dom react has four built in method that gets called in this order when mounting a component the first one is constructor the second one is get derived state from props the third one is render and the last final one is component did mount here the render method is required and always be called and the others are optional and will be called if they are required then we have update phase a component is updated whenever there is a change in the component state or props here the react has five built in method that gets called in this order when the component is updated right so the first one is get derived state from props the second one is should component update the third one is render the fourth one is get snapshot before update and the final one is component did update here as i mentioned before render is a required method where others are optional and the final phase is unmounting phase 
So this unwinding phase in the life cycle is when a component is removed from the dorm or unwinding has react like to call it. Okay. Now react has only one built-in method that gets called when the component is unwound. That is component will unwound. So here this method is called when the component is about to remove from the dom. Now let us jump into the example. Now let us start creating a to-do list project where I will be showing you how to create a text field and a button to add task, complete task, incomplete task and delete task. So when the completed task is triggered, this button is clicked, the score here will be updated to 2 or updated to 1 plus because it gives you some motivation that you have completed the task for today, right? So next button is incomplete task. Here you can see the incomplete task. So if you click on this incomplete task button, some of the motivation quotes will be displayed to you to give you some motivation to complete that task. Then finally, we have delete task. For example, if you add this task without knowing or uh, if you don't want to add this task in your list, then you can delete this task. So by deleting the task, you will not get any score or any um, motivation tips, right? This is the project for today. Let us see how uh, this is being created. So I'll go to the uh, Visual Studio code. So let us create a to-do list project. Now I will just import React from React. Okay. After that, I will be exporting it. Now let us initialize the constant over here. So for this, I am writing to do list with an arrow function over here. So here I will be using the use state hook four times. So one is for to do's and another one is for task and the third one is for score and the fourth one is for quits. So as I mentioned you in the output of the to do list we have a to do and a task bar and we have a score if you complete the task you will get one score and uh, if you click on the incomplete task you will be displayed a motivational quote right for all those i will be using four u state hooks okay so here as you can see i have to do's and i have set to do's and task, set task, score, set score, quits and set quits. Okay. For all those, I'm using the use state. And also I have mentioned some of the motivational quits. It will be displayed randomly whenever you click on the uh, incomplete task button. Right. So here this block of code is a functional component in the React which using the hooks api called the to-do list okay now first uh, let me display some of the forms that is the uh, input text and the submit button so for that i will just write so as you can see here i have a h1 tag which shows the to-do list over here okay and i have h3 tag which shows the score here and I have embedded the score over here inside the curly braces, okay? And I have mentioned the on submit over here. So this is the event handler. So whenever the uh, user submits or clicks on the submit button, so this handle submit will be triggered. And as you can see, I have the input where I have the text as an input type. And I have the value for task. So you can see I have embedded the task over here. So whenever the task is added over here, it goes to the use state over here for the task. So it will be automatically added in the task and it will be displayed in the browser. So this code is a React component that returns a JSX from a to-do list applications, right? 
so it defines a div with a background image and has a heading and score displayed so as i mentioned we have a heading and the score displayed and we have a background image and it also has a form for adding a task that includes an input field and a submit button so you can see we have an input field and a submit button over here right the form submit event is handled by the handle submit function as you can see here a list of to do's is displayed using a map function over here and that loops over the to do arrays so each to do is displayed as a list item with the text of the task and the three button for marking it has a complete marking it has incomplete and a delete button okay so here handle complete handle incomplete and handle delete so here handle complete incomplete and handle delete these functions are triggered when the respective buttons are clicked as i mentioned it earlier so the complete button and the delete button modifies the state of the to do arrays so as you can see the complete and the delete task uh, these buttons modify the state of the array list for example i'll just add another one learn react native so as you can see here the complete and the delete button will modify the state of the array list whereas uh, this incomplete button will randomly display the motivational quote for example so here if you click on the incomplete task here you will get an uh, motivational quote this will be random because uh, here in the code we have mentioned four of it four or five of the motivational quote so if you click on the incomplete task so it will display you the random quote so here you can see this code defines two functions that is handle submit and handle complete right so here which are used to manipulate the state of the to do list component here in the handle submit the function is called when the form is submitted so it prevents the default from submission behavior using a prevent default function right and then updates the state of the to do list component so it does this by adding the current task to the to do array using the set to do list and you can see here in the handle complete function it is called when the to do item is marked as completed so it updates the state of the to do list and component by removing the components to do item from the to do array and updates the score by one see you can see i have mentioned the score if the complete task is clicked then the score will be updated to plus one so if you look into incomplete task handle so here i have mentioned the random index where it will see the quotes length and it will display in the alert box so whenever this is clicked the random quote will be displayed in the alert box so we have come to the handle delete event the handle delete is called when the user wants to delete a task right so here it takes an index of the task to be deleted as an argument so it creates a new array like new to do's which is a copy of the current to do array and removes the task by calling the slice method on the new to do array so finally it updates the to do state with the new to do list and with that i have just added few of the css here i have used uh, inline css and here i have used the internal css here for each button i have displayed some of the colors and the uh, sizes for it and finally if you look into the uh, output here we have the uh, h1 tag that is to do list and the h3 tag that is the score and if the completed task is clicked the score will be updated to 1 and uh, here if you add a new task over here so if you click on incomplete task so here you will have the uh, motivational quote will be displayed 
and no score will be updated or decreased because uh, it is nothing to do with the score button and if you delete this task and that also nothing to do with the score button too so this is the simple to do list application what is node.js node.js is a javascript runtime built on chrome's v8 engine take the javascript codes and compile it in time to machine codes to build fast and scalable network applications now different browsers use different engines to run their javascript code microsoft edge for example uses charka firefox uses spider monkey chrome uses v8 chrome's v8 is by far the fastest javascript engine there is so the creators of node.js used this very same v8 engine and used it outside the browser directly on top of our operating system problems that node.js overcomes let's say there are two users which send a request to a server both of them want to update a resource on the server let's say some record in a database traditionally the older systems like java they are multi-threaded but a single thread can only execute at one point in time two threads can't run simultaneously so that means at any given point in time only one request can be processed so while one thread is working the other threads have to wait so let's say the request by user 1 takes 5 seconds and user 2 also the request for user 2 takes 5 seconds thread 2 has to wait for 5 seconds for thread 1 to complete so in the case of user 2 the request 2 would actually take 10 seconds to complete because for the first 5 seconds it was just waiting and the thread which is used for one request cannot be used for other request at a given point of time which means if a task is assigned to thread 1 it can only be assigned to a new task once the earlier assigned task is finished so if let's say a scenario where all the threads are busy a lot of users came online at the same time all are trying to access the application all the threads are busy so now when the new users come they have to wait in this case you might think well we should have more threads number of threads depend on the computing power which means your cpu so if you want more threads it means you need either another cpu or a bigger a larger cpu in both cases it will cost more so how can we overcome this problem using node.js node.js solves all these problems by what they call it as a single threaded non-blocking event driven asynchronous programming now in the earlier case in java we saw it's multi-threaded over here node.js is single threaded that's the very nature of javascript but what we have over here is non-blocking IO and event-driven system. What is non-blocking IO? Take this example. We have three users, all three users sending requests to the server at the same time. And let's say, for example, we know the request one will take 35 seconds to complete. Request two will take just five seconds to complete. And request three would take 15 seconds to complete. In earlier scenario, what would happen was the request two would execute only when request one was finished. And request 3 would execute only when request 1 and request 2 both are finished that would happen in a linear fashion one by one so user 2 and user 3 although they have smaller tasks but because a bigger task was being run before them they would have to wait because of the asynchronous nature of javascript what happens is whenever there is a request that goes into the operating system or into a system that is outside the node.js for example database in this scenario node.js the code doesn't wait on that line so let's say there is a line in the code which executes a query the query again goes to the database which is outside the node.js execution environment the code execution doesn't stop at that line it just moves on to the other next lines of the code but in case of node.js what we do is when we call the query we also pass in a function which is called as a callback function now this word callback would be used a lot of times in understanding node.js or when we see the further modules so whenever the query is executed the execution is finished the callback the function that we passed in along with that query would be called automatically which will return us the result of the query same can be the case with other kinds of tasks that we do let's say reading a file so this is asynchronous event driven and non-blocking io in this case what would happen is let's say the server receives these three requests request one now when the request one is being processed the database query it will take a long time 
it immediately moves on to the next task request 2 request 2 it goes to the database and request 3 comes in again that goes to the database now the callbacks are executed as and when the event is received from the database that hey my task is finished it is the data you wanted it is the result that you wanted so in this case what would actually happen is request 2 would actually be finished in 5 seconds then request 3 would be finished in 15 seconds and then request 3 would be finished in 35 seconds so finishing all these three requests would actually take 35 seconds in other the older scenarios what would happen is request 1 would take 35 seconds request 2 would take 35 plus 5 that's 40 seconds and request 3 would take 35 plus 5 40 40 plus 15 55 seconds so here as you can clearly see node.js has a advantage over the older and other systems let's see at some of the companies that use node.js many companies use node.js these days but these are one of the largest and most well-known companies that use node.js netflix paypal uber godaddy linkedin ebay netflix being the largest in this case largest meaning in 2019 almost 12 to 15 percent of all the internet traffic in the world was netflix like take everything all the apps being used all the websites being used consider everything 12 to 15 percent of all the traffic that is on the internet was netflix netflix uses node paypal one of the largest payment processors in the world hundreds of billions of dollars of transactions being taken place paypal uses node.js uber the largest driver network in the world they use node.js linkedin the largest professional network in the world they use node.js on their mobile app as we can clearly see node.js is winning is popular being used in a wide variety of companies welcome to the hands-on session for module one we will have a look at installation of node.js and visual studio code so if you go to the node.js website in the download section we can see that all the downloads are available we have the windows installer the mac os installer also node.js being open source there is source code available as well we have the windows installer for us 32-bit version 64-bit version lts means long-term support this is the recommended version and also there is the current version current meaning all the latest features which have been recently developed will be in the current version but for development purposes the recommended one is the long-term support version we know this version let's say the current lts version 12.16.2 will be supported for long time so depending on which kind of os and cpu you have you can download 32-bit or 64-bit installer usually these days people have 64-bit computers so once you have it downloaded you can start the installation we'll open the visual studio code website visual studio code is also a open source ide developed by microsoft it's one of the most popular ides for web development these days and that too is available for all major operating systems windows linux mac so yeah we can download that as well you can keep these all checked by default no need to change anything this add to path this node.js does it automatically for us but uh, that actually means once the installation path of node is added to the path variable of windows environment variables we will be able to run the node command from any directory in the command prompt so that's what it basically means which it's checked by default so just keep it that way we don't need this as of now it's okay if it's unchecked so basically you can just install with whatever default is checked or unchecked just you can press click on i agree and just click next 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 and uh, install it visual studio code is also downloaded we can start installing that these days not all softwares are installed in the usual c drive program files directory in modern operating systems of windows like windows 8 windows 10 onwards many are installed in the c drive users the current user directory app data local there's even app data and some other directories so they are installed over there also node.js installation is done and this is up to you checking these two add open with code add open with code action to windows explorer that would mean whenever you do a right click on any file or any folder 
that would give you the option of open with code. So let's say you right click on a .js file, a JavaScript file, it will show you the option to open with code. And when you click on it, it will directly open that file in Visual Studio Code. So it's up to you if you want it. The add to path is checked. You can keep it that way, no problem. Register code as an editor for uh, supported file types. And checking this would mean that all the .php, .js, .ts meaning TypeScript files, Python files, and also I think Java and C++ and C files all would open in Visual Studio Code by default. And that's up to you if you want to do that. Yeah, so Visual Studio Code has a very rich extensions library where you can install a variety of extensions to support a variety of development platforms. As you can see, some of the popular ones include a wide variety of range, Python, C, C++, C++, C Sharp, a lot more. Even things like React, Vue, Angular, Node, JIT integration. So a lot of them are available to be installed in Visual Studio Code. So have a look, install the required ones. That will make your life much, much easier. Do look at the number of installs extension already has. For example, this ES6 code snippets has 3.2 million installs, average five star rating. So you can be assured that this is a really, really good extension. Let's have a look at the node installation that we did. Let's open the command prompt, check the node hyphen V meaning. And so, yeah, it's 12.16.2 in Windows. If you're not sure about the options, you can just type in forward slash question mark. That's for the Windows commands, not the others. For this, this would work. A help that will open the help for the commands for the command options. You can go through it, whatever options are available. Also, along with node. We will have the npm installed as well. We have the Visual Studio Code set up, so all good, ready to go. Now we'll be looking at node modules. Module is a functionality which is organized in a single or multiple JavaScript files and can be reused throughout the Node.js application. There are three kinds of modules. The first is core modules that are pre-packaged with the Node.js installation that are basically built into Node.js. Second types of modules are the NPM modules or the node package manager modules. These include a group of modules or packages developed by other developers, which can be used in your application by installing them. NPM, by the way, is the largest repository of open source modules that is online today. And lastly, user defined modules. These are the modules which are created by you, which you want to reuse in the rest of your application. So user defined modules basically are the ones that are limited to only your application, which are custom built by you for your application. Syntax to import a module. So here we have two kinds of syntax, the ES5 and ES6 syntax. ES basically means ECMAScript, which is the original name for JavaScript. Right now, the latest syntax that is in use is the ES6 the, or the ECMAScript 6 syntax. And the one prior to that, which was more widely used was uh, ES5. So this is the syntax for both of the versions. The, the require function specified here will return an object or a function or a property, or it can return any kind of a JavaScript type, depending on whatever is specified in the module. So as you can see with ES6, we have the import keyword. The ES6 syntax looks much more better. These are the different core modules which are built into your Node.js. So once you install Node.js, you can directly use them in your code without installing anything additional. Let's look at them one by one. FS it stands for file system. It handles the files. You can read and write files using that. So here's an example of writing data into a file, just two lines. So the first line you need to import the module. And in the second line, we are specifying the name of the file. If that file already exists, it will be overridden. If not, it will be created. The second argument, this is a test file. That is the data to be written to the file. So in the first line, we say const fs. It's good practice to make the objects or the variables as constant and not to use var or let. Const would uh, ensure that object fs is not changed accidentally in the code below. The require fs returns an object or a function or a property depending on whatever is specified in the model. But in this case, it runs an object and that object has a set of methods that we can use to read and write files. We can name anything, the, the variable that we have, the, the const 
you can name it anything but traditionally it's a practice to name it the same as the name of the module which is fs once you run this you'll see that a file called app.txt is created if it's not already there and it will have the data this is a test file running a node.js using node is pretty easy you go to the command line you go to your terminal and just type in node space your file name and that's it you will see that the file is executed you can verify it's working you know, go back to the code change the second argument of the write file sync method and see if your file gets updated second type of core module path it handles the file paths and directories so again this is a very essential module used at a lot of places so this deals with the paths obviously we will be working with a lot of files and this module gives us a lot of methods that can be helpful so here for example we first import the module require path we have a another string variable that has a path to the app.txt file and for example we have four methods over here dir name base name ext name and is absolute dir name would actually give us the path of the file so over here in the full path as you can see it starts with c users Elishwarya, desktop vs node.js async app.txt so that whole path is the path of the file called app.txt and dir name would give us the only the path without the file name as you can see the output is given over here second method base name would only give the last part of the path so the path has these slashes the forward slashes this is the last part so basically it would give us the file name also it could be a path only you know without a, a file name at the end but whatever it will give us the last part of the path in this case we have app.txt ext name would give us the extension which in this case is .txt and is absolute would return a boolean a true or a false that the path is absolute or not in linux the absolute paths they start with forward slash meaning the root and in case of windows they start with either c d or e or any drive letters that you have so moving on to the next module which is the buffer module it handles binary data buffer is a global object in node.js so we don't need to import it using the require keyword like we did in the earlier modules so buffer handles any kind of data but internally it handles binary data unlike the other string or array methods here this handles it at binary level and so it's faster for string manipulation compared to the other traditional string methods so here we have created two objects from strings one is just the number one two three four five six seven eight nine but in the form of a string the other is hello so in the first line we are copying so copy the data from one buffer to another syntax buffer dot copy target here buffer one is the target target start so we start at 2 so what will happen is we'll copy hello which is buffer 2 into buffer 1 at 2 so we'll start at so it will be 1 2 h e l l o so the output will be 1 2 h e l l o 8 9 so that we'll be able to see the output in this console.log then we have a buffer.concat which basically concatenates both of buffers the both of the objects so in buffer 1 we already have 1 2 hello 89 so then buffer 2 will be copied after that so it will be 1 2 hello 89 and hello again and buffer 1 dot equals so this is just compares both of the objects which is false in this case and then buffer dot compare which basically gives difference between the strings so let's say the difference let's say we take for example abc and abcd the difference is just one letter so in those kinds of cases the compare method is better to use so where we can see what's the actual difference between the two objects anytime we want to use this as a string so buffer one buffer two they are in the form of buffer objects and they are not strings so we, we need to call the method dot to string whenever we want to use it as string so as you can see this is the output for the first first method that we ran dot copy the buffer dot copy this is the output for the concat this is the output for the equals and this is compare and as you can see these are totally different for the difference the, for the comparison the output came as minus one one of the most important and widely used modules the core modules is http module so anytime 
you are creating a web application using node.js this is the module that is used this module lets you create http server with just four or five lines of code in case of other technologies backend technologies let's say php you need a server for example you need apache or nginx php itself doesn't give you a server in case of dotnet applications you need the iis server but here in case of node.js you don't need an external server node.js itself with these four or five lines of code is a http server a full functioning http server let's see how it's created so first we import the module uh, require http with just one line create server we create a server so this function is a callback function to this server so once the server is created this callback function is executed it gives us two objects request and response request object would give us any data that's incoming with the incoming requests for example cookies let's say a person has filled up a form so any post data or any get data get data is the data which are the url parameters and response object can be used to send in response so this response dot write hello world would actually go as output to the browser write head this is used to write the headers headers is additional information that we can send to the browser before sending the actual response so headers can have cookies headers can have yeah content type so here content type is text slash plain otherwise browsers take content type by default as html text but yeah browsers these days are very advanced and they detect the kind of data coming in and response dot end is used to end so this is basically telling the browser that okay nothing more is coming here the response has ended the listen method we can pass in a port number in real world scenario for the real servers for http servers the port number is 80 it's reserved but for development purposes we use port numbers like 8080 8000 etc etc next core module is url it's used to pass urls again a very important and widely used module so let's take for example we have this url http colon slash slash localhost 8080 default.htm so this url has a lot of parts http over here this can be http or https so that tells us which protocol it is then we can have a domain name over here let's say google.com or facebook.com or youtube.com call on 8080 that's the port number in most of the sites the port number for http sites is 80 for https sites is uh, 443 and then we have the path after this so slash default.htm and once there is a question mark after that are the url parameters or the get parameters we have two over here year and month with values 2019 and february so url dot parse we pass in the address the url dot parse will pass the address and return a url object as properties so once we run this method the returning the object that we have will hold all these parts which i just explained in the form of properties host includes the host name with port number so that will be localhost 8080 path name would give the path of the source file so that will be default.htm search will be the query parameters over here these one after the question mark so here they are the output next uh, core module is util which stands for utility again very important very widely used util has a lot of methods which can be used in our application one of the most widely used is format which is used for string formatting for example over here we have this text called congratulate percentage s on his percentage dth birthday so util.format we pass in the string and then we pass in the parameters which will then be replaced in that order so percentage s would be replaced by john percentage d would be replaced by 11 so this you might have seemed familiar to what you studied in c or c++ if you know them if you know those languages percentage s tells that there will be a string which will be placed over here percentage d is used for integers so yeah very easy to understand method util.format and output you can see over here congratulate john on his 11th birthday the last module we're going to see today is os the module that gives us the information about the underlying operating system so we call the require method gives us the os object for example we have two methods over here platform and architecture platform it tells us which kind of operating system is this node.js running on in our case it's windows so gives win32 
architecture it will tell what kind of cpu do we have is it a 32 bit or 64 bit cpu in this case it's x64 which means it's 64 bit so importing your own files we have a basic example of a user defined module that would basically return us the date for this we'll create a file let's say named date.js and we'll type in the code below the first line for our own debugging purpose is console.log your module is assessed now and then we'll create a function which returns the date object and we'll assign it to a variable called my date time for this file to actually act as a module we need to write one line at the end of the file that is module.exports equal to my date time you should write this line at the end of the file which you want to be a module and write it only once module.exports you can assign it a function or an object an object can have multiple properties those properties can be functions or values whatever you want but for simplicity for this example we have a function to use it we'll use the require method but the only difference between the core modules and user defined module over here is we need to give the path of the user defined module file over here so let's say we are writing this code in app.js and the date.js the our module file is also in the same directory then we just need to write the dot slash date.js let's say it was inside a directory called my modules then the path that we would write inside the require would be dot slash my modules slash date.js so we need to specify the path of the module file in this case in user defined modules and once we get the date object we can directly run it like this since we know that this module passes us a function not an object also another thing to notice over here is that we don't need to know the name of the function that is inside date.js whatever you assign it to you can use it directly like this when you run it in the terminal what you will notice is your module is assessed now that line is executed when you import the module so this line would tell us that okay our module is imported fine we can use it and this is the output of the console.log line now let's look at importing npm modules so why do we need npm modules the reasons are pretty simple why invent the wheel again if it's already done npm lets us use the modules created by thousands of other developers around the world so in case you have to write your own codes go to npm check out the kind of requirements you have if there's an npm module already for that you can use it directly also the npm modules are tried and tested by thousands of developers many of those modules are open source and there is a whole community using it testing it so you know it's tried and tested you can believe in it you can trust in it and also as node js progresses and there are new versions those node modules the npm modules are also updated time and again to support the newer version of uh, node js to be able to use the npm modules we would need a package.json file in our application directory and we need the command line tool called npm npm comes built in with node so whenever you install node so in the command line you can use node to run your js files and also you have the npm command line utility to be able to install npm modules and create node applications you the package.json required for the node applications to create the package.json file it's a simple command you need to run in your terminal called npm init it will walk you through creation of the package.json file it will step by step ask you for the name version description etc of your application some of the things are listed over here which you will see in any package.json file the name of the application the version description the main file node application can have multiple javascript files but again the main file or the entry point of your application has to be one javascript file which in usual cases is either app.js or index.js so once you run the npm in it you will see the package.json is created now our application is ready to accept npm modules we can basically install npm modules in our application directory before seeing that let's take a small overview of the package.json file it mainly has two kinds of data you would have noticed that the package.json file is nothing but a json data with keys and properties it has two kinds of properties listed over there one is the metadata of the project it consists of properties to identify the project such as the name version description license author etc other is the functional metadata 
that requires properties such as the entry point of the module, the dependencies. So whichever additional NPM modules we install, those will be listed in the package.json as dependencies. For the demo, we'll be looking at this NPM module called chalk. It's used to style the string in the terminal. In whatever the console.log terminal outputs that we have, we'll be able to style those as well using chalk. This is a screenshot of the NPM site showing the chalk module. You can see it's a very popular module. You know, you can have a look at the number of weekly downloads, the version, the license, number of open issues, the link to its GitHub repository, its dependencies. So there are three NPM modules on which chalk is dependent on. Dependence, there are 40,000 modules on NPM which depend on chalk and the number of versions it has had till now and the command to install it, which is simple npm i chalk. So either you can say npm i or npm install, whatever you want and the package name after that. Optionally, you can also give the version number. So just saying npm install chalk would install the latest version of chalk. But after the add symbol, you can specify the version number. If you want to install, let's say a specific version number. So running this command would install the package into your application directory. When you run this command, package manager uses package.json file as reference and installs all the listed modules from the npm server. You will see once you install your first npm package, you will see a folder, a directory called node underscore modules created in your application folder, which would contain all the npm modules which you install. And also whatever dependencies. So as we saw in the screenshot, talk has three dependencies. So those three dependencies will also be installed in your node modules. Also, you would see additionally a file called package lock.json. It contains extra information like version of dependency and where it is fetched from and many more to access it faster. So you don't need to touch the package lock.json. It's created automatically, updated automatically as in when you run more npm commands. All you need to take care of is the package.json file. You can go into package.json file any point in time and you know update your meta information like the name, description, a version number of your application. Also, you would notice that package.json, once you install the chalk module, the package.json file would have inside the dependencies property will have chalk and the dependencies of chalk also will also be listed inside that. And then once you have it installed, you can use chalk anywhere in your application simply by saying require and then the package name, which in this case is chalk. So once the NPM module is installed, you can simply run the require method, give it the name. And also in the case of NPM modules, just like the core modules, you don't need to give any path. Just specify the name and it will fetch it for you. So console.chalk.green, I am a green line, chalk.blue.underline.bold with a blue substring that becomes green again. So chalk has multiple methods for styling the output that you get in the terminal. You can style the output that you give in the terminal. You can give colors, you can underline it, make it bold, etc, etc. It's a nice module to have for the debugging output, especially for debugging output. introduction on databases. Now putting into definition, databases are basically a collection of organized information that can easily be accessed, managed or even updated. Now database systems are very important to your business as I've mentioned earlier because they can communicate information related to your sales transaction, product inventory, customer profiles or even market activities. Database is usually managed by a system which is known as database management system. Now there are several advantages of using database like it reduces data redundancy, it reduces updating errors and increased consistency. There is a great amount of data integrity and independence from applications programs. There is improved data access to users through use of host and query languages. Together, the data and the DBMS along with applications that are associated with them are referred to as database systems, often shortened as database. Now let's understand some of the advantages of using database. As I've mentioned earlier, it is extremely easy to update data and maintain data. The next thing is data security. Now there is high security management for each of the data or databases that is used here. Now database security refers to a range of tools 
that controls and measures a design which is designed to establish and preserve database confidentiality and integrity and availability. The next thing is there is a uniform data management and administration, which means there is concurrent access and recovery from crashes. Many users can access or even update the database at the same time without any interference. The next thing is data access and auditing. Now data auditing involves observing a data so as to be aware of the actions of database users. Usage of database will allow you to access and audit your data. Basically database administrators and consultants often set up auditing for security purposes. For example to ensure that those without the permission to access information do not access it. Now there are types of databases used for storing data. First thing is centralized database. Basically centralized database is a type of database that stores data at a centralized database system. It comforts the users to access the stored data from different locations through several applications. Next we have distributed database. Unlike a centralized database system it is distributed all over the system and data is distributed among different database systems of an organization. These database systems are connected via communication links. Next we have relational database. This database is based on the relational data model with stores in the form of rows and columns and together forms a table. Further we have cloud database. A type of database where data is stored in a virtual environment and executes over the cloud computing platforms is known as cloud database. Here are AWS. Microsoft Azure among the few comes into picture. Up next we have object based data model approach for storing data in the database systems. Next we have hierarchical databases. It is the type of database that stores data in the form of parent child relationship nodes. And then we have network database. It is the database that typically follows the network data model. Here the representation of data is in the form of nodes via links between them. Finally, we have NoSQL database. NoSQL database is a type of database that is used for storing a wide range of data sets. It is not a relational database as it stores data not only in a tabular form but in several different ways. It came into existence when the demand for building modern application increased. Therefore, NoSQL represents a wide variety of database technologies in response to the demands. With that, we shall move ahead and understand what is MongoDB. MongoDB is a document database with the scalability and flexibility that you want with the querying and indexing that you need. Put into definition, MongoDB is a document oriented, no SQL database used for high volume data storage. It is an open source document oriented database that is designed to store a large scale of data. It is basically categorized under the no SQL or not only SQL database because the storage and retrieval of data in MongoDB are not in the form of tables. Basically MongoDB table is developed and managed by MongoDB itself. There is a corporation which develops MongoDB known as MongoDB.inc. Now this is under SSPL or server side public license and initially it was released in the year 2009 of February. Now as I've mentioned it does not involve any table or SQL. Rather it involves a basin format. Since MongoDB uses no SQL the format of storage is BSON which is similar to JSON format. Now here I might also add that MongoDB is a document database with the scalability and flexibility that you want with querying and indexing that you always need. Now this is an official definition given by the creators. Basically MongoDB stores data in flexible JSON like document meaning fields can vary from document to document and data structure can be changed over time. So basically data model maps to the objects in your application code will make the data easy to work with. Ad hoc queries, indexing and real time aggregation provide powerful ways to access and analyze your data. 
I'm sure you might be wondering what these are. Here, we'll look at all of the features of MongoDB in our features section of today's video. With that, let's move on and understand why exactly do we need MongoDB. Now, here are the few reasons as to why we need to use MongoDB. The first one, MongoDB is basically built on a scale-out architecture that has become popular with developers of all kinds of developing scalable applications with evolving data schemas. Now, the next thing is that MongoDB makes it easier for developers to store structured or unstructured data, and it uses JSON-like format to store documents. Now, this format directly maps to native objects in most modern programming languages, making it a natural choice for developers as they don't need to think about normalizing the data. Now, MongoDB can also handle high volume and can scale both vertically or horizontally to accommodate large data loads. Basically, MongoDB was built for people building internet and business application who need to evolve quickly and scale elegantly. Companies and development teams of all sizes use MongoDB for a wide range of reasons. Now, these reasons, we'll go ahead and look at it. First reason being document model. Now, document data model is a powerful way to store data and retrieve data in any modern programming language, allowing developers to move very fast. Next thing, we have fully scalable. Basically, this means that MongoDB's horizontal and scale-out architecture can support huge number of both data and traffic. Next, it gets us started fast, which means MongoDB has a great user experience for developers who can install MongoDB and start writing code immediately. The next thing is deployment options. MongoDB is available in any major public cloud such as AWS, Azure, Google Cloud through MongoDB Atlas. In large data centers through the Enterprise Advanced Edition or free through Open Source Community Edition. Now, finding community. Due to extreme development nature of MongoDB, MongoDB has developed a large and mature platform ecosystem. It has a wide range of community of developers and consultants. Now, with these ample reasons given, I don't think you need any more justification as to why we need to start using or learning about MongoDB. I hope this session is getting interesting now. Hence, with that, let's look at the features of MongoDB. Now, as I've already mentioned, MongoDB is a scalable, flexible NoSQL database. It has high number of good features and most important features. The first one being ad hoc queries. Now, ad hoc queries for optimized and real-time analytics is a main and important feature of MongoDB. While designing the schema of database, it is impossible to know in advance all queries that will be performed by the end users. In this case, ad hoc query is a short-lived command whose value depends on a variable. Each time an ad hoc query is executed, the result may be different depending on the variables in the question. MongoDB supports field queries, range queries, and regular expression searches. Queries can return specific fields and also account for user-defined functions. This is made possible because MongoDB indexes BSON documents and uses MongoDB query language. The next thing is indexing. Indexing is used basically for better query executions. Now, the number one issue that many technical support team fails to address with their users is indexing. If it is done right, indexes are intended to improve search speed and performance. A failure to properly define appropriate indexes can usually and will lead to a mirage of accessibility issue such as problems with query execution and even load balancing. MongoDB allows you to index and it can be created on demand to accommodate real-time and ever-changing query patterns and application requirements. They can also be declared on any field within any of your documents, including those nested within arrays. Next thing is replication. Replication is basically used for better data availability and scalability. 
When your data only resides in a single database, it is exposed to multiple potential points of failure, such as several crash, service interruptions, or even good old hardware failure. Basically, in MongoDB, replica sets are employed for this purpose. Primary server or node accepts all write operations and applies those sum operations across secondary servers replicating the data. And if the former primary node comes back online, it does so as a secondary server for the new primary node. The next thing is load balancing. Now at the end of the day, optimal load balancing remains one of the holy grails of large scale database management for growing enterprise applications. Now MongoDB supports large scale load balancing. The platform can handle multiple concurrent read and write requests for the same data with best in class concurrency control, locking protocols that ensure data concurrency. Basically, MongoDB ensures that each and every user has a consistent view and quality experience with the data they need to access. Sharding is one of the main things. When dealing with particular large data sets, Sharding, the process of splitting larger data sets across multiple distributed collections or shards, helps the data distribute and better execute what might otherwise be problematic for the queries. Without sharding or scaling, a growing web application with millions of daily users is nearly impossible. All operations in sharding environment are handled through a lightweight process called Mongo's. Mongos can direct queries to correct shard based on the shard. Now here, I've briefly gone across all the features of MongoDB. First one being ad hoc as discussed. The next is indexing and replication, load balancing and sharding. With that, let's move on and understand the applications of MongoDB. Now looking at the applications of MongoDB, the first one that we have is content management systems. Fundamental of MongoDB approaches and practices are introduced in content management use cases, which would be done using familiar, simple examples and problems. The method for modeling user comments on content like social media and blog spots are introduced by storing comments. A model is proposed for designing a website content management systems by metadata and asset management in MongoDB. The next application is product data management. Now basically for e-commerce website, product data management and solutions, one can use MongoDB to store information because it has flexible schema well suited for the job. One can also manage a product catalog and learn practices and methods for modeling from the product catalog document. Operational intelligence. Basically, MongoDB is beneficial for real-time analytics and operational intelligence use. Now, one can learn storing log data document to know about the approaches and several ways to store and model machine-generated data with MongoDB. Several other few applications of usage of MongoDB are balanced features, which means one can use MongoDB to get multiple balanced features. For example, that one wants to use some features like queuing, map, FTS, but don't require it a lot, which is easily possible through MongoDB. Consistency over availability. If one prefers consistency over availability, then he can get a specific version of consistency in MongoDB applications. Denormalizing the data. Re-denormalizing the data is tough to do and also very expensive. Also, you will not be able to change the shard keys when you are running MongoDB. If you want to use a blend of secondary indexes and key value looks up, then you can use MongoDB, but you cannot use it for too many secondary indexes because it will start scaling poorly. The next thing that we have is data on single server. One of the best features of MongoDB is that it was made intentionally suboptimal to enable sharding on a single server. Next advantage is ideal for querying. As discussed earlier, if the rate of querying is very strong to the database, then MongoDB is ideal. Ideal for documented oriented. MongoDB is the right choice only when there are few relations and one wants to scale it. Polyglot database system. 
MongoDB has an excellent capability to pick up the best part of all the databases, which makes it even more amazing to use as large-scale systems that are not using only a single database. Finally, we have something called as mobility and scaling. MongoDB is very scalable and flexible, which gives fantastic database solutions to deal with different kinds of environments. With that, we jump into the final session of today's video, which is companies using MongoDB. Of course, this might interest you as some of the top-notch companies use MongoDB as their database. eBay being one of the multinational company that provides a platform for customer sales, it is currently running a large number of projects in MongoDB like merchandising categorization, cloud management, metadata storage, search suggestions, etc. MetLife is one of the leading companies that we have heard. It uses MongoDB to benefit programs, annuities, insurances, etc. There are more than 90 million customers in Middle East, Europe, Asia, Latin America, Japan, and even United States. MetLife is using MongoDB not only for that, but also for its advantage of customer service application called The Wall. Now, Shutterfly is one of the most popular online photo sharing and it uses MongoDB to manage and store more than 6 billion images, which has a transaction rate of up to 10,000 operations per second. Now, Shutterfly earlier used Oracle, but later transitioned into MongoDB. Aadhaar, India's unique identification project, which has the biggest biometrics database in the world, MongoDB is being used here for database. It uses to store massive amount of demographic and biometric data for more than 1.2 billion Indians. MongoDB is being used for storage of images in the Aadhaar project. EA is an online multiplayer game that is using MongoDB database for its game called FIFA Online. MongoDB can easily handle complicated things that need synchronization with each other entirely. Why do we need REST API? Now consider a scenario where you're using the Book My Show app. I'm sure that you know all of you must be using Book My Show app on a regular basis, right? Now obviously when you use this app, you must have observed that you know the application needs a lot of input data as the data present in the application is never static. So what I mean by that is when you consider the Book My Show app, all the time the movies are getting updated on daily basis. Even the show times and the places where the movies are shown or maybe not just with respect to the movies but also with respect to the events, the data keeps getting updated on a regular basis. So where do you think we get this data from? Well, this data is received from a server or most commonly known as a web server. So the client requests the server for a required information via an API and then the server sends back a response to the client. Over here, the response sent to the client is in the form of an HTML web page. Now, do you think this is an apt response that you would expect when you send a request to the server? Obviously no, right? Just imagine yourself. If you're searching for a data for a specific movie at a specific place and a specific time, do you expect an HTML page back as a response? Well, I'm assuming the fact that you would also say a no, right? So since you would also prefer the data to be returned in form of a structured format rather than a complete web page, the data returned by the server in response to the request of the client is either in the form of a JSON format or in the form of an XML format. Now both JSON and XML formats are sent because you know they have a proper structure in which the data is represented. Now if I talk about the JSON formats and the XML format, so as you can see on my screen, so for example, let's say you know we want to find out the data of the movies which are coming soon at a specific city. So what you can simply do is if you just send a request of this particular information to the client, the server returns the data in either the JSON format or the XML format. So the JSON format it shows as as you can see on my screen. So basically there's a city and then there's movies categories and in the category you have coming soon. When you come to the XML format, in the XML format section, you basically have cities, movies, and then again, we have a category section which shows coming soon. So over here, if you observe the JSON format has basically format of an object where, you know, the object values are returned to the user and coming to the XML format, the XML format follows a hierarchical data structure in which the data can be returned. Now, this sounds quite simple, right? 
but the only issue which is present in this framework is that you know you have to use a lot of methods to get the required information from the server even if the data is returned in a simple format that is the json or the xml format the only problem till now is that you have to do a lot of work to get your data back like you know you have to put in a lot of do post do get methods and then you have to request for the data to be returned and so on for a single information this sounds fine but Imagine the scenario where you continuously are requesting for data and then you have to look into so much of methods. Now this obviously becomes cumbersome. Now to avoid such kind of scenarios what came into picture is the rest API. So the rest API creates an object and thereafter sends the values of the object in response to the client request. So now that you know the need of rest API next let's look into what exactly rest API is. So what is rest API? Now as I just mentioned rest suggests the fact that you can just create an object of the data requested by the client and then send the values of the object in response to the user. Now let's say you know if you want to find out a scenario of a specific movie let's say you know if infinity war is playing at Hyderabad at a specific place let's say you know at IMAX and then timing at 10 30 in the night. Let's say if you want to find out this particular data. So to find out this particular data what will happen is a client will send a request to the server that you know he wants to find out the data that you know the movie Infinity War is playing in the city Hyderabad at IMAX at 10:30 or not. So when the request is sent to the server, what REST API does is that you know it creates an object of this particular request and then it finds out whether you know it plays or not. So it searches for the data in the server for the client's request. If it finds out that you know the data is present. It just sends back a response to the client with the values of that particular object. So now if you observe over here what's happening you're creating an object and then you have some values of the object and what's happening is that the values of the object are sent to the client. So that's basically the state of an object is sent to the client. So each and every time you don't have to generate a new object. So what happens is you're just passing the state of an object to the client. So since you're just passing the state of an object that's where the term representational state transfer comes in. Now if I have to define rest for you then representational state transfer or rest is an architectural style as well as an approach for communication purposes that is often used in various web services development. This architectural style of rest helps in leveraging the lesser use of bandwidth to make an application more suitable for internet and is often regarded as the language of internet and is completely based on resources. Apart from this it's also a stateless client server model that you can understand about. So rest is really simple guys. It's just an architectural style as well as an approach for communications purposes that is often used by various web services development. So now that you know what rest is let's look into the features of the rest API. So the features of rest API are as you can see on my screen. It's more simpler than so it has a proper documentation and it gives you proper logging of error messages. So before the rest came into picture what we had was so. So after rest API took over the world then you can just say that you know you can use the rest API in a much easier way than so. Coming to documentation so it comes with a good documentation so that you understand each and every step of how you can create a rest API using various technologies various frameworks and how you can embed them for your applications. And finally coming to error messages when I say error messages it has proper logging information of the errors. So for example let's say you know you're creating a rest API using a specific framework and then you're stuck somewhere. What happens is you get a proper message about the error that's coming up so that the user can understand what's the error about and can debug it. These were the features of rest API. Now let's move forward and understand the principles of rest API. Well there are six ground principles laid by Dr. Fielding who was the one to define the rest API design in 2000. So the six ground principles are stateless client server uniform interface cacheable layered systems and code on demand. So talking about stateless what I mean by stateless is that when the requests are sent from a client to the server it contains all the information that is required to make the server understand it. So it can be a part of a URL or query string parameters body or even headers. Now the URL is basically used for uniquely identifying the resource and the body holds the state of the requesting resource. Once the processing is done by the server an appropriate response is sent back to the client through headers status or response body. Coming to client server 
when I say client server, what I mean by that is that you know it has a uniform interface that separates the clients from the servers. So separating the concerns basically helps in improving the user's interface portability across multiple platforms as well as enhance the scalability of the server components. Coming to uniform interface to obtain the uniformity through the application, REST has defined four interface constraints, which are resource identification, resource manipulation using representations, self descriptive messages, and hypermedia as the engine of the application state. Coming to cacheable, in order to provide a better performance, the applications are often made as cacheable. It is done by labeling the response from the server as cacheable or non cacheable, either implicitly or explicitly. If the response is defined as cacheable, then the client cache can reuse the response data for equivalent responses in the future. It also helps in preventing the reuse of stale data. Next, moving forward with layered systems, the layer system architecture allows an application to be more stable by limiting the component behavior. This architecture enables load balancing and provides shared caches for promoting scalability. The layered architecture also helps in enhancing the application security as components in each layer cannot interact beyond the next immediate layer they are in. And finally, coming to code on demand, the code on demand is an optional constant and is used the least. It permits a client's code or app list to be downloaded and extended via the interface to be used within the application. In essence, it simplifies the clients by creating a smart application which doesn't rely on its own code structure. So now that you know the principles behind the REST API, next let's take a look at the methods of the REST API. Now, all of you might be working with the technologies of web, right? So what do you do? You work on crude applications. So when I say crude, I mean that you know we create a resource, we read a resource, we update a resource, and we delete a resource. Now, for example, if you consider the URL that you can see on my screen, what it says is that you know https and then bookmyshow.com slash noida slash movies. Now, if you observe over here for quite a long of time, I've been saying the word resource. Do you know what that means? Well, resource is basically what you want to do. So, for example, let's say you know we want to search for the city noida and then movies. So if you consider the URL that you can see on my screen, if you hadn't put it like this, then you would have searched it like, you know, search is equal to Noida and then you put one more query parameter of movies. So basically you would have to put two query parameters that is Noida and movies. And before that you had to put the URL, but obviously that doesn't sound like a resource, right? Because you always cannot just put question mark and then you cannot keep putting the query parameters. Instead of that, you can just use these URLs like, you know, with slash you mentioned the first parameter and with the second slash you mentioned the second parameter and so on. So that's basically how your data structure might also be defined in the server. So that's what basically I mean by a resource. So when I say resource, resource is something that a client wants to know or maybe the data that client is looking for. So now to do these actions, that is basically to create a resource, read a resource, update and delete the resource. You can actually use the HTTP methods, which are nothing but the methods of REST API. So for creating a request, you can use the POST method. For reading a request, you can use a GET method. For updating a resource, you can use the PUT method. And for deleting a resource, you can use the DELETE method. So all these methods together are basically the HTTP methods. That is the POST, GET, PUT, and DELETE are the HTTP methods. So now that you know what is REST API and what all you need to mind in order to deliver an efficient application, let's next look into how you can create a REST API. So for this practical demonstration, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a simple crude REST application using Node.js. So to build the application, basically I'll be using Node.js, Express.js, Joey, and Nodemon. Apart from that, let me tell you that you know I'll be using the WebStorm ID to write and execute the codes. So you can use any ID according to your convenience. So let's start by, you know, creating a REST API using Node.js. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically create a project directory in which, you know, I'm going to have all the project related files. So let's say, you know, I just right click over here and then let me just create a project directory. Let's say demo for REST API. Now, basically this project directory is initially blank as you can see on my screen. But after a while, once I install all the required libraries and packages, you'll see that you know package.json file and package log.json file automatically created. I'll open my command prompt 
and then what I'll do is I'll navigate to my demo folder. So if you observe over here, my demo folder was an E directory and the folder name is demo for rest API. So what I'll do is I'll just type in E and colon over here and then I'll mention CD and type in demo for rest API, right? So automatically I'll navigate to my project folder through the command prompt. Now what you have to do is you have to first initially install node.js so to install node.js it's really simple you have to go to their official website and then you have to choose the LTS version based on whatever is your bit like Windows 32 bit or 64 or maybe other kernels according to that you download your version double click it and automatically node will be installed so since I've already installed node in my system I'll just open the version and show you so as I type in node hyphen hyphen version you can clearly see that I have the version 10.16.0. So that means our node is installed. Now, what we have to do is you have to basically call the NPM package to initialize the NPM modules into your system. So, to do that, what you will do is you will type in NPM in it. So, this will basically initialize all the NPM modules into your system. Once you do this, what you'll see is basically you'll be asked to enter the details for your project. For example, let's say package name to be demo, right? Oh, it says you cannot put in capital letters, right? So I'll just type in demo over here and then version let it be 1.0.0 only. So I'll just click on enter description. Let's say we mention it's hands on for creation of rest API after that entry point. This is the main thing that you basically have to enter. So remember the fact that you have to mention the entry point file. So over here, I'm going to mention it to be script.js. So this is basically from where our process workflow is going to start. And then after that, we just click on enter. After that, you'll see you have test command. I'll just click on enter, get repository, enter, keywords, enter, author. Let's say I put in my name. And the license to be the same. So after that, it will ask you for a confirmation. So basically the project name to be demo version 1.0.0. Description to be hands on for creation of rest API main to be script or JS and then so on. So if it's okay, I'll just click on Y and enter. So whatever you defined till now is basically the metadata for your project. So if I shift back now, you will automatically see that, you know, the package file has been created. So now if I go back to my command prompt, what you have to do is you have to next install express.js to install express.js. What you have to do is you have to mention npm I and then mention the library name that is express. So you will automatically see that you know it is getting downloaded. So let's just wait for it to be installed. So the express is basically a web framework which can be used along with node.js. So this is a web framework which allows you to create restful API's with the help of helper methods middle layers to configure your application. After that similarly you'll have to install Joey. To install Joey, I'll type in npm i j o i, right? So once I mention that, you'll see that you know Joey library is also getting installed. Joey is basically used to validate your information whether it's in the right format or not. So all the time you don't have to validate your server. You can just directly install this library, and this library will validate the information for you. After that, you also have to install NodeMon. So to do that, what I'll do is I'll just type in npm i hyphen g I'll mention NodeMon and click on enter. So as you can see, NodeMon is also getting installed. So let's just wait for that to happen again. So as you can see, NodeMon has also got installed. Now NodeMon is basically used to keep a watch on all the files with any type of extensions present in the folder. That is basically the project folder. Also with NodeMon on the watch, you don't have to restart the Node.js server each time any changes are made. So basically what happens generally is that if you don't use NodeMon, then you have to restart the server anytime you make a change. So with the help of NodeMon, you don't have to do that. Automatically NodeMon will implicitly detect the changes and then restart the server for you. Now once you're done installing all these frameworks, let me just open the package.json file and show you. So if I just open the package.json file with WebStorm. All right, so let me just zoom in a little bit. So as you can see when I open my package.json file what you clearly see that is whatever metadata that you had entered when you were initializing your npm module right so that's basically demo and the description and then what's the main file and so on. So this was about the package.json file guys. Now what you have to do is basically you'll have to define the entry point for your application right that's basically a workflow. 
Now to do that, you have to basically define the script.js file that you had mentioned in your package.json file. So to do that, what you'll do is you'll go to your demo folder over here, right click over here, and then let's say we create a new JavaScript file. We'll name it script.js and then we'll click on OK. Now in the script.js file, let me just put in the code that I've already coded and then I'll explain you step by step what's happening. Right, so now let me just zoom in a little bit. All right, so as you can see, this is basically my script.js file. So don't worry, I'm going to explain you each and every step and then you'll understand clearly how we are sending information to the client and how the server is sending us back the response. Initially, as I told you before that, you know, we had installed Express. So what we're going to do is first we're going to import Express. So to do that, what you'll do is you'll mention const and Express and then equal to require Express. You're basically assigning it to a variable express over here and then you're just importing that particular library over here similarly goes for joey so both these libraries are imported to your file now what you have to do is you have to create an express application right so to do that what you'll do is you'll basically use this particular variable that you had created over here that is basically express and then assign it to the app variable so further what we're going to do is we're going to use this app variable to understand the application and do various actions on this application right so we're going to use this so now when i say we're going to use this particular variable so basically you have to make sure that you know that particular variable is using it right so for that you'll just put app.use and then you'll mention express.json because we want to use a json file what i mean by json file now for any application to work you have to put in a database right you can either use mysql mongodb or any other kind of databases so over here i'm not going to connect it to any such databases i'm going to just use a json file which has a list of the data that we, we are going to enter and that will be stored on our server so the data is basically stored in the json format so that is the reason we'll be using express.json now talking about server so when a client sends request to the server initially the server has to be running so for that it needs a specific port so what i did was i assigned a port environment variable automatically to 8080 right so basically what's happening is that you don't have to assign it again and again when you use an environment variable automatically what i did was that you know the server will be running on the port 8080 and then to just give an output that you know yes the server is running or not I've just printed a log message saying the listening or the port and then port number will be mentioned that will be basically 8080 over here. So to make sure that you know the server is running and then you know the server is connected to our system that is basically our application from where we want the data to come. So we will just use this command saying app dot listen and we'll basically make the server listen to the port that is 8080 over here and then we'll display the message. So that's with the server. Now, if you observe, I've told you one thing over here that is a client will send the request to the server, right? And the server already has a set of data. So to basically define that data, I've created an object of customers. So over here, that is basically the object of customers which have a specific name that is basically title and an ID. So this particular data will be initially stored into our server and then we can play around with the data based on whatever request that we send the server will return the data that is with giving data to the server. After that, let's start by, you know, understanding basically the HTTP methods that I just discussed with you. That is get, put, post and delete. So what I'm going to do in this hands on is that I'm going to basically get all the data from the server. Then I'm going to basically find an information of a specific customer. Also, I can delete information about a customer. And finally, I can also update information about a customer. So let's understand the same. So initially, let's start with the get method. So if you remember from our presentation that the get method was basically to read the resource. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mention a URL and then what I'm going to do is if I just type in a URL then automatically a message should be displayed, right? So over here I've mentioned the URL to be slash. So whenever it is localhost colon 8080 slash automatically this will basically send a message that you know welcome to Edureka's REST API. Now over here if you're seeing what is the parameter so basically request and response are the parameters that are used in the get method apart from that when I say app dot get what I mean is that you know basically we want our handler to handle all the requests on a specific URL now this URL that I've mentioned is according to my convenience it is completely users perspective what URL they want to mention so you can mention slash even then the code would work and even then you would display the output 
so over here request is basically what is sent from the client side and response is basically what is sent from the server side so request over here will be the url so whenever i type in localhost colon 8080 slash automatically a request from the client side will be sent to the server and whenever the server identifies this particular url this particular message would be displayed coming to the next method that is app.get and then we have mentioning in the url api customers so now what i'm going to do is i want basically the list of customers so that is basically whatever list i have mentioned in this particular object so for that what I'll do is I'll again similarly mention the URL that is basically localhost colon 8080 slash API slash customers. So whenever a client types in this particular URL what I want in response is basically the list of customers that we had mentioned and we had stored on our server side right. So that is basically all the five details. So to do that what I'll do is I'll mention the command rest send and mention customers over here. So that is basically returning our customer object. Now let's say you know we want to get the information of a specific customer. Let's say you know we want to get the information of ID of Josh, right? So basically his ID is two, right? So what I've done is in the URL I've mentioned that you know it will be slash API slash customers slash ID. So whenever you send a request from the client side, what you have to mention in the URL is basically localhost colon 8080 slash API slash customers slash two. So whenever you send this request. A response will be sent from the server side showing you the details about the second ID that is basically titled Josh and ID to be two. So don't worry. I'm going to show you all the outputs when I run these codes. So before that let's just understand these codes step by step. So now if you're wondering how is this happening right? How is the rest API understanding the fact that you know we have to search for the ID two in the server side. So basically that's happening through this particular line over here. So basically we assign the customer object to customer dot find and then what we're doing is whatever query parameter that we're passing in the URL is basically checked with the customer ID. So for example, let's say customer ID 2 is present only if it is successful it will return the data else. Let's say you know there's no specific customer ID. For example, let's say we have only five IDs over here, right? Now let's say you know if someone just types in slash six. So basically he's searching for the sixth ID and you know that you know there's no sixth ID present. Then what happens is that a 404 error will be displayed. Saying that oops can't find what you're looking for right. So basically this is also user's perspective of how you want to display the data. So over here I used 404 error. So that is basically the status I'm checking if the customer is not found and then you display this particular message. So that's what is happening when the customer ID is not present. Now I hope that you know you've understood the get method. Now let me just run this code and show you the outputs. So to show you the output and test the application what I've done is I've used postman. So postman is basically a chrome plugin which is used to send the request to the servers. So I've already installed that otherwise it's really simple to install guys. So what you can basically do is you can just click on the plus button over here and then you can mention the URL. So as I was telling you you have to mention the local host colon 8080 and let's say we mentioned slash and then over here you basically have to choose the method. So over here I'm choosing the get method. Now before I hit on send what you have to do is you have to start your server right. So for that what I'll do is I'll go back to my command prompt and then I'll mention node script dot js. So once I mentioned that you'll clearly see an output that you know listening on port 8080 that means our server is up and running. Now if I go back over here and then if I just click on send you'll see that you know we get a display message saying welcome to Edureka's rest API. So that's what you basically saw over here right. So whenever we mention a slash you'll see the output as welcome to Edureka's rest API. Now let's say you know we mentioned slash API slash customers then according to our code we have to get the list of customers. So I'll switch back and then I'll mention API slash customers. And let the method to be get again and click on send. So once I click on send, you can clearly see an output that you know we have got all the five details that we had mentioned in our script.js file, right? So that's basically the list of customers. Apart from that, we also saw one more thing that you know if you want to get information about a specific customer. So let's say you know we want to get information about the third customer. So that's basically ID3. So I'll just put on slash over here and mention three and click on send over here. So when I click on send, you'll clearly see an output that title Tyler and ID 3. So that's how basically the get method works. And that's how basically your API is helping you to connect the client request to the server and so that the server can send back the response to the client. 
now let's move forward with the next method that is the post method so if you remember from your http method you'll see that you know the post method was used to create right so whenever you want to create a resource you use the post method so now let's just create a new data right so let's say you know we want to create a new data and then we want to push it to our server so for that what you'll do is you'll use app.post so app is the same variable that you had created over here that is basically for our application variable so app.post and then what you'll do is you'll mention slash api slash customers and then what you'll do is you'll just mention the title if the title is fine and if it is validated so basically when i say validate customer what i mean by that is we have created a function to validate information about the customer so only if the information is present in the correct format the customer information will be validated and yes the customer information will be pushed into the server or if it's not then automatically there will be an error thrown so over here basically our function validates the customer information and our condition is basically that you know the title should be minimum of three characters right if it is less than that then obviously it will see that you know it is not a valid information and then it will throw an error so that's what is basically happening so if i go back to my post method over here you'll see that you know if we'll use this function of validate customer and then if it is validated what will happen is automatically the customer id will increase by one and title will be stored by the title that you mentioned so basically that's what is going to happen over here so remember the fact that since our customer id is incremented automatically you don't have to mention the customer id in your request you just have to mention the title and then if the title is greater than 3 that is basically it has a minimum character values of 3 then it will move forward and then automatically the data will be pushed into the server so when i say push automatically it has to increase the stack right so initially our server had five values in its stack now we want the sixth one also to enter so for that what we'll do is we'll use this function of customer dot push customer right so basically we'll push the new value of customer object into the customer and then we'll increase the stack once it is done we'll just send a response again back to the client saying that you know that particular id has been created into the stack So let me just do the same over here. I'll just shift back my postman, and now let's see. You know, I put post over here, and then I go back to API customers, and then what I do is I go to body over here, and then choose raw, and let's say I copy this part, paste it over here, and let's say we mention the name to be Mark, right? So Mark is basically having four character values, so that means this customer information should be validated. So over here I'll mention title mark and then in the text option I'll just go and add json right so basically this will be identified as a json object and then what I'll do is I'll click on send so once I click on send you'll see an output that you know automatically id generated is 6 so that means we had 5 and then automatically it got incremented by 1 now if I go back to the get method over here and then I click on send you'll see the information of all the six values that we have stored in our server so basically our stack has increased so that's how guys you can use the post method also now moving forward with the put method the put method is basically used to update an existing resource so if the resource is not found it's again going to throw an error but yes if the resource is found it can definitely update so let's see the same how that's happening so to update a resource let's say you know we consider an example of updating a specific customer id's name right so let's say you know we had all the six ids right so for example let's say we update from customer 3's id and then we mention the name to be tyler patterson right so for that what i've coded is basically that whenever app dot put that is basically app is again the same object that you had created over here that is the express application whenever it is with a put method and has a specific url that is api customers and then you mention the id whichever id is you want to update whenever the client sends this particular request what happens is that initially it is first found whether the customer exists or not for example let's say you know we mentioned the id to be 7 so we know that you know it, it's not present in a stack right so what happens is it will throw an error so over here i've put in the 404 error and then i've mentioned the text to be not found right so it basically says the customer is not found so there's no resource with the id 7 so obviously you just can't update any resource like that but yes if the customer is found so for example let's say we are taking third one so the customer will be found then what will happen is you'll just validate the customer so in your input let's say we'll put tyler patterson then whenever you mention this title automatically that title will be updated for the third id now after everything is done 
the server has to send a response back also right so for that this particular command is used that is response sent customer so basically the customer object is updated with the new values and then the response is sent back to the client so let's look into the same so what i'll do is i'll take the third one and then i'll mention the title to be tyler patterson and then i'll choose the method to be put over here and then i'll click on send once i click on send if i scroll down you'll see the output that you know the title is tyler patterson for id3 right so now if you just want to look into the stack what i'll do is i'll go to get remove this id over here click on send over here again and then you'll see the updated list that you know the id3 has been updated and the new value is tyler patterson so that's how basically you can use the put method to update your resources now finally coming to the final resource for guys that is the delete resource so the delete method is basically to delete any specific resource so it, it's as simple as the name suggests so to do that what i've done is i've chosen this app dot delete and then i've chosen the url to be api customers id so what i'm going to do is i'm going to mention a specific id let's say the second id i want the data to be deleted for the second id so that's what i'm going to send at the request as and then what will happen is first initially again a condition will be checked whether you know the customer exists or not for example let's say the id2 doesn't exist then automatically again an error will be sent back saying that you know not found but yes if the customer exists then what happens is you basically have to remove that particular data right so you basically splice from that particular data all the data that is present in id2 is removed and automatically the stack is pushed forward right initially you had six values now you only have five values right but yes remember the fact that you know the id doesn't get updated automatically over here the id remains the same well i leave it forward to you guys to explore how you can update the id automatically whenever a resource is removed from the server so apart from that finally after the data is getting deleted we want the server to send a response back to the client right so for that we again use rest.send customer that is basically our object now i'll shift back to my postman and then i'll just choose this option of delete and let's say you know i mentioned the id to be 2 and then i'll click on send so once i click on send you'll see an output that you know title josh and id 2 will be deleted so when i go back to get method and put customers over here and remove the id you'll see we get the data of 13456 but the second one is missing that's because you know the data has got deleted so that's how basically guys you can use various http methods that is basically the rest api methods to communicate with client and server and to understand how a request from the client is processed by the server and how the server sends back the response the need for github it is extremely important for software developers to work on a web based platform to share their projects and collaborate with other developers this platform must be a version control system that is it must enable multiple people to simultaneously work on a single project each person edits his or her own copy of the files and chooses when to share those changes with the rest of the team this application must also be capable of hosting millions of programmers and hobbyists that download and evaluate each other's work github is one such platform of choice for developers that can host multiple programmers and review their code github has several competitors for instance gitlab GitLab is an open source web interface and source control platform based on Git. Whereas Microsoft Team Foundation Server is an enterprise grade server for teams to share code, track work, and ship software for any language all in a single package. Bitbucket on the other hand stores all of your Git and Mercurial source code in one place with unlimited private repositories. So what really makes GitHub so powerful and popular among developers? GitHub is an open source platform and the community is really what fuels it. Moreover, GitHub is the platform of choice for developers from various large corporations too. Microsoft is the number one contributor to the system, but there are also Google, SAP, Airbnb, IBM, PayPal and many others. Exposure and insight that you can get on GitHub are simply unmatched by any other platform. Here you can discover code written by others, learn from it and even use it for your own projects. Versions control on GitHub works very much like Microsoft Office or Google Drive. 
It simply tracks all the changes made to your code and who makes them. You can always review the detailed change log that neatly hosts all of the relevant information. Using GitHub eliminates the need for complex corporate security solution because everything is on cloud. The platform protects code branches, verifies commit signing, and controls access. Now that we know why we need GitHub, let us understand what is GitHub. GitHub is a Git repository hosting service that provides a web-based graphical interface with many features. A repository is usually used to organize a single project. Repositories can contain folders, files, images, videos, spreadsheets, anything your project needs. Let's say, for example, a team wants to work on a particular project. Here, they can simultaneously write and update the code to a central repository which is present on GitHub. So, GitHub is a highly used software that is typically used for version control. It is helpful when more than just say one person is working on a project. For example, a software development team wants to build a website and everyone has to update their codes simultaneously while working on this project. In this case, GitHub helps them to build a centralized repository where everyone can upload, edit and manage the code files. Most software projects have a bug tracker of some kind. GitHub's tracker is called issues and has its very own section in every repository. Issues basically are a great way to keep track of tasks, enhancements and bugs for your project. Moving on, people often get confused between the terms Git and GitHub. Now let me clearly explain the difference between them. Git is simply a version control system that lets you manage and track changes within your project. Whereas GitHub is a cloud-based service that lets you manage Git repositories. So basically Git is the tool and GitHub is the service. Now that we know the difference between Git and GitHub, let us move on and understand how these two work hand in hand. We already know that Git is a version control tool that will allow you to perform all kinds of operations to fetch data from the central server or push data to it. Whereas GitHub is a code hosting platform for version control collaboration. GitHub is basically a company that allows you to host a central repository in a remote server. Now, without any further ado, let's get started with the demonstration on how to use GitHub. So for this demonstration, we're working on the website version of GitHub. There's another version of GitHub that is the desktop version, which you can download it to your personal computer. So we're simply going to search for GitHub in our search engine. The first link will lead you to the official website of GitHub. So I'm going to click on that. So this will redirect me to the main homepage of GitHub. As you can see, there is a search GitHub option. There are also two buttons that says sign in and sign up. If you're new to GitHub, you can simply enter in your credentials. That is a username, email, password and sign up for GitHub. But if you already have an account like I do, I'm simply going to click on the sign in button and it'll redirect me to a page where I have to enter the credentials. That is my email address and password. I'm going to do that now and I'm going to click on the sign in button. Now, this is the main page of my account. As you can see, I have no repositories. It's all new. It's all fresh. But if you're not new to GitHub, you can view all of your repositories on the left hand corner. Now, before we move on, I'm going to explain you all the features that are present within GitHub. So you can see a search bar here. So the search bar will allow you to look for profiles, certain keywords, look for different kinds of projects that are available on GitHub, all of those can be done using this bar here and you can see four options next to the bar that says pull request issues marketplace explore pull requests we learn later on in the session but the issues in marketplace we won't be discussing in this video for now the explore button on the other hand is an extremely important and interesting button so once i click on that it'll redirect me to a page with some activities that are going on around in github you can see here they're trending repositories they're trending developers. Basically, this is a feed that will allow you to interact with developers and other people, collaborators from all around the world. Basically, in Instagram, too, you have an explore button, which will allow you to interact with different people from all around the world. So the same concept is implied in the GitHub explore button, too. So you can explore topics, you can explore trending repositories, developers. Basically, it's an interaction with other people from different parts of the world. 
so i hope that's clear now the most important part of the session are the three buttons that are available in the right hand corner of the navigation bar so you can see there's a bell icon there's a plus icon there's a pixelated icon on the right hand corner so the bell icon allows you to read notifications of your activities that occur in github so that's what it really is you can see the inbox will allow you to view all of the notifications you can also view the unread notifications by clicking on this unread button as of now i don't have any notifications so there's nothing available you can also group these notifications by the date or repository by clicking on this group by button here you can also view your saved notifications by clicking on here and the done button on the other hand will let you mark all of your notifications that you're done with your previous notifications so these are the three important buttons you'll have to know in this bell icon and the filters are not necessary as of now so i'm not going to discuss that this button on the other hand will allow you to manage note your notification settings and your subscriptions too so that's all for this bell icon the next important button is this plus icon as you can see there are five drop down options that appear here the first one being new repository followed by import repository new gist new organization new project so new repository we've already discussed previously in this session a repository is a place where you create your files for your project it's basically a storage space right so your repository can directly interact with your git right so the new repository option will allow you to make files a repository to your github account right the git on the other hand the tool that which we use to make local repositories in our personal computer can be directly pushed on the local repositories can directly be pushed on to your github account so that's what the new repository button allows you to do so but the new project on the other hand is a place to track issues features and other tasks that are related to the code within the repository you can also connect with the devops build and deploy process assign people to tasks and so on by using this button that is the new project button so the difference between the new repository button and the new project button is that projects in github are only a part of github but not git but the new repository option is a part of github and git so that's the main difference between new repository and new project i hope that's clear so the next button will drop me down some interactions that i can make with my profile so if i click on this your profile option it will redirect me to a page where i can edit my profile i can really create my identity using this page so here if i click the edit profile i can add a bio about myself i can add the company in which i'm working in the location at where i am the website twitter username etc all of that i can add here all of the information about myself i can also view the repositories i'm working on currently or the repositories i worked in, in the past projects that i'm working on the packages and the entire contributions i've been making on github from the last year so basically it allows me to build an identity or it will help me build my profile on github so i hope that's clear now if i click on this button and if i want to sign out from a profile i can simply scroll down and click on the sign out button here and this will sign me out of my account so that's all for getting started with github these are the basics on what github is and what each of the button and options really do now if i want to move back to the main page of my github profile i can simply click on this octocat that's github's logo so i'm just going to click on this octocat logo and here i'm back to my main page now before we move on and work on the different operations and options within github and learn different things about github i'm going to give you a brief overview on how to download the desktop version of github so i'm simply going to search for github desktop on my search engine and i'm going to click on the first link that's available on this page now i can simply click on this button that says download for windows 64 bit that's compatible to my current version of my personal computer if you have a mac you can simply click on the mac version and download it to your desktop but as i've already mentioned previously that we're going to work on the website version so i'm going to simply switch back to this Now let's quickly move on to the next part of the session. Create a repository. So firstly let us understand what a repository is. It is simply a storage space for the correct project that you're working on. GitHub is a very popular central repository that allows you to share your files, 
whereas Git allows you to create local repositories that are present on the system you are working on. So you can basically push your local repository into GitHub and share it with other collaborators via the central one. Now that we know what a repository is and how it works, let's go on to the demonstration part and create our first repository. So you can do this in two ways. Either you can click on your create repository button that is present on the left side, or you can, as I've already mentioned in the previous part of the session, you can click on to this plus icon and you can click on the new repository option. So this will redirect you to a page that says create a new repository. You can add your repository name. I'm going to name my repository as Edureka and it's available. All of your repository names must be unique from one another to identify them easily. You can also add a description, which is optional. I'm just going to add the description. This is my first repository. And a description allows people or other collaborators to understand what your repository is all about. But as a good developer or a good programmer, you would definitely want to add a description and give an overview of what your repository is all about. There are two options now available that says private or public. Now you can choose your repository to either be public or private. So the private one lets you decide who can access your profile. Whereas the public one lets anyone view and access your repository, but you can choose who can commit to it. That's the difference between public and private repository. I'm going to let my repository be public as of now. Now, if you scroll down, you can see that you can initialize your repository with three options. The first one being add a readme file. The second one being add a git ignore file. You can always choose a add a readme text file to your project, which often contains information about the project and other necessary details the user must be aware of when he or she is accessing that particular project. Now I want a readme file for my repository. So I'm going to click on this button here. That's going to check it. The next option is add a dot git ignore file. So this file will let you ignore a list of files when the user is pushing files to GitHub. That's what this option really does. But I'm going to let this be unchecked for now. For your repository to truly be open source, you will need to license it. So others are free to use, change and distribute the software. You can simply click on choose a license option and pick your, the required license for your project. There are several licenses like MIT, GPL, Apache license 2.0, BSD, etc. But for this repository, we don't really need a license. So I'm going to untick this too. And now you can see there's a piece of information that says this will set master as the default branch, but I'm going to ignore this for now. I'm going to explain about branches later on in the session. So this is all you have to do to create your first new repository. You add a name, you choose a description, you add an optional description, you let your repository be either public or private, and you initialize your repository with either of these three options. And I'm simply going to click on my create repository option. Now this will redirect me to a page with all the information and the files that are currently present in my repository. You can see here my repository name is present here with the optional description that I gave. And the number of files currently we have only just one file that's the readme text file and that's present here. So this is all we have. Congratulations. You just created your first repository. Now you can see there are some options that says issues, pull requests, actions, projects, wiki, security, etc. We don't have to really talk about all of these right now. We will just learn about one option that says code here. So this is really important. If you click on this button, you can see that there's a link that is available here and HTTPS link. So if you copy this link and paste it on your Git terminal that's present on your computer, you can download this entire project directly to your local system. So that's what the link is for. I hope that's clear. And the next option that says open with GitHub desktop will allow you to open this entire repository in your GitHub desktop version. And you can also the last option that says download zip will allow you to download this entire repository in the form of zip files. So all of your project files will be within that zip file. So that's all you have to really know about your repository. And I'm going to click on the readme text file that's available. It will take me to another page with some extra information about that file. You can see currently we have two lines and the memory space that is allocated to this file. So we currently have two lines that is Edureka and this is my first repository. And you can also see the number of contributors to this project. That is just one. That's just me for now. And you can view the history of the commits or the changes that have been performed in your file. 
So we'll come back to that part later on this session, but you can move back to your main page of this repository by clicking on the name button here. So Edureka is the name of my repository. So I'm going to click on that. So now I'm back to the main page of my repository. Before we learn how to create our first branch, let us understand what branches are. Branches allow you to work on other features that can be included and merged with the master branch if required. So what is the master branch? The master branch is the main branch where your project resides on. So all of the changes, all of the activities that you do with your main project lies or is on your default branch that is named as the master branch. So what really GitHub allows you to do is it allows you to create additional branches. So on these additional branches, you can work on the other features or you can experiment with your project. And if you're happy with this, you can simply merge these features to your main branch. That is your master branch. This is what branches are really for. So they simply allow you to work on other features. That's what branches are. So let's move on to the demonstration part and look at how we can create our own branches. So now if you look on the left corner, you can see a button that says master. So currently we're on the master branch and there's only one branch and the master branches have already mentioned is the default branch. So when you create a repository, you're automatically creating a master branch. So this is where your project will be residing on. And now if you want to create another branch, say let's name this branch one branch. So this is what I want to name my additional branch. I'm simply going to name it and I'm going to click on the enter button. So it will redirect me to a page. So this is the exact replica of your master branch and you can work on this branch. You can work on any other feature or you can add something. You can remove something. You can really experiment on this branch. And if you're happy with this, you can merge back this feature or the experimentation that you've been working on to your master branch, right? So you can see there's a readme text file. It's exactly the same. There's the name of your repository, the description of the repository. You can click on the readme text file and everything's the absolute same. You can quickly switch back to the main page. But the only difference is that you're currently on a branch named branch one branch. You're not on your master branch. Now, if you want to switch back to your master branch and work on it, you can click on this button and you'll find the master here. You can click on that and it will take you back to your master branch. Here you can work on your project. So the currently two branches, you can see that and everything's normal. Everything looks simple. That's all for branches. It's really easy. I hope it's clear. So you can look for branches here on this bar here that's present here. You can also create new ones in the same option. So that's all for branches. Let's move on to the next part of the session. Make a commit. Now, what are commits? Commits simply record changes to one or more files in your branches. So basically they save the changes that you're making in your project. Git always assigns each commit a unique identification, which is called SHA or a hash that identifies the specific changes. So for any changes are made to your project files, you can simply go back and look at the version history or the history of the each commit you've performed on your project files. So that's what really commits are all about. It's extremely easy. Let's go ahead and make our first commit. Now I'm going to switch to my branch one branch and I'm going to make my first commit. I'm going to click on my readme text file. That's the only file currently in our repository. So we'll make the change in the readme text file. There are three really important icons that are present in the right corner. As you can see, the first one is a PC icon that says open this file in GitHub desktop. So if you click on this file, this entire file will open in your GitHub desktop version. The next one that is the pencil icon will allow me to edit this particular file. That is my readme text file. And the third icon is a bin icon, which will allow me to delete this file. Now what we'll be working on is the pencil icon. That's the edit this file option. I'm going to click on this and I can simply view a space or a file that will allow me to make changes to my readme text file. I'm going to add another line here that says this is my first commit. This is what I want to add to my readme text file. And if I want to preview the changes, I'm going to click on this preview changes button. You can see that this is my first repository. This is my first commit. This is my first commit is the additional piece of information that will be adding to my readme text file and it's highlighted in blue. So we know that that's the additional information. I'm happy with this change. I'm going to switch back to my edit file. I'm going to scroll down 
And if I want to add in description about the change that I'm performing to my file, I can do that. A good programmer would always add a description to the change that he's making to the project file. So other collaborators, when they view the commit or they view the change, they can read the extended description and understand what the change is about. So that's a good habit that you must follow. But as of now, we're not going to do that. So I'm going to leave this blank. As you can see, there are two radio buttons that are currently available. The first one says commit directly to the branch one branch. This will allow me to make the change or save or make the commit directly to my branch one branch only. So the change that I'm making currently is only implemented to my branch one branch. The second option allows me to create a new branch for this particular commit and start a pull request. We're not going to talk much about this option right now, but the first option is extremely important. So we we'll let this be stuck on to the option that says commit directly to the branch one branch. And I'm going to click on the commit changes options and this will simply implement the entire change to the file. You can see that the change is implemented. The additional piece of line that says this is my first commit is added to my readme text file. Now the interesting part is if I switch to my master branch, the change is not implemented in my master branch. So the change is only currently present in my branch one branch. And now if I want to view the history of the changes that I've made, I've already mentioned in the previous part of the session that the history button will allow me to do so. So I'm going to click on this history button and you can see that I made my first commit 23 minutes ago and I made my new commit 41 seconds ago. And there is also a hash number, unique hash identification number that allows me to distinguish between both of these changes. So all of my commits that I'll be making on this branch will be available here. So that's the main point of a version control system, isn't it? Understanding and keeping a record of all the changes that we're performing in our files and our projects. So this is gives full justice to the word version control. So that is what GitHub is all about. Now that we learn how to make our first commit to let's move on to the next part of the session. Open and merge pull requests. So what are pull requests? Pull requests let you tell other developers about changes you've pushed to branch in a repository on GitHub. So once a pull request is open, you can acknowledge and review the changes with collaborators and add follow up commits after which your changes are merged into the base branch. So there are two ways to create a pull request. The first one being pull requests from a forked repository and the second one being pull requests from a branch within a repository. Currently in this demo, we will work on the second one that is pull request from a branch within a repository. Now I'm simply going to switch to my demo part. Okay, now currently I'm on my master branch. I'm going to click on this pull request option that's here. Now it says branch one has had recent pushes three minutes ago compare and pull requests. I'm not going to click on that. I'm going to simply click on the new pull request option here. So this will allow me to compare the changes. There's a base branch and a compare branch. The base branch is the master branch and the compare branch. I will compare my master branch to my branch one branch. So this notification says that the merge between the branch one branch and master branch is definitely possible. So it's a green signal. So if I scroll down, I can view the difference between both the branches. So the left hand side indicates the information that is present on the master branch and the right hand indicates the information that is present in my branch one branch. Plus sign indicates the additional information that is present in my branch one branch. I'm happy with this. So I'm simply going to scroll up and create the pull request I'm going to click on that. I can also leave a comment and I can preview the change. That's not necessary for now. So I'm going to go ahead and create the pull request. Now this will redirect me to a page. So this page says that the pull request has been opened and now I can choose to merge this pull request. That is. I can merge the branch one branch to my master branch. So it says this branch has no conflicts with the base branch. Merging can be performed automatically and that's good news, right? So I'm going to click on merge pull request and I'm going to confirm my merge update my readme text file. I'm happy with that. So I'm just going to confirm it. Now it says pull request successfully merged and closed. You're all set. The branch one branch can be safely deleted. I'm not going to delete the branch. I'm going to compare both of the branches and see if my master branch is exactly the same 
as my branch one branch. So I'm going to click on this Edureka. I'm going to go to my main page of my repository. So my master branch has the additional piece of information that says this is my first commit. Now, if I switch to my branch one branch, it has the exact piece of information. So the information that was present in my branch one branch has been successfully implemented to my master branch. So that's all for the pull request part two. We've reached the end of the demonstration part. Now let's quickly look at the case study of how Microsoft implemented GitHub. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of Microsoft. Microsoft Corporation is an American multinational technology company. It develops, manufactures, licenses, supports, and sells different computer software, consumer electronics, personal computers, and other related services. So initially, Microsoft was against the use of the open source because they held very tightly to the internet protocol. They were completely hesitant to adapt to this new concept of sharing code to the entire world. But in 2010, they rethought this entire scenario and now Microsoft is one of the biggest contributors to open source. Today, about 2,000 to 25,000 Microsoft engineers maintain TypeScript, .NET, Windows Terminal, DARP, Helm, and more than a thousand other open source projects. So first what they did was they released new processes in measured containment. But later on, they released only licensed software. So here, developers can learn from the company's source code, but they couldn't really build on it. Eventually, the stigma died, and now even closed code like .NET is open source under an MIT license. Teams realize that they need to accept contributions to get feedback and learn from other developers. To organize and understand this approach, Microsoft created their open source programs office, which enables distribution and centralization of knowledge. So the OSPO provides the resources and maintainers to manage thousands of repositories and contributors effectively on GitHub. Even though Microsoft invests in its tools, they expect other individuals and organizations to lead the way. Microsoft believes that GitHub's value isn't in any one feature, but its entire community. GitHub is the place to collaborate. It's where everyone is and where most of the entire world's open source is already happening. It's not just a feature, but the whole thing. Why do we need Maven? Okay, so new programmers, especially Java programmers, they have this question like, why do we need Maven for building project when we have Eclipse? So what Eclipse is? It is nothing but an IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Eclipse provides an environment for developing your project. That's it. It doesn't build your code, but Maven is used for building the code. And there's one more thing that I would like to tell you that suppose you're working on a project and most of the Java projects, they require you to work with third party libraries. For example, if you're working on a Spring MVC project, there are numerous dependencies that you need for these projects. Dependencies are nothing but the libraries or the Java files. So for Spring, there are 10 to 12 libraries that you need. So to use these libraries, you first need to download them and then you need to add those to your project. This is a tedious task because all of this needs to be done manually. There's one more problem here. Suppose you're working on Java 8 version and for some reason you need to upgrade your project from Java 8 to Java 9. In this case, you again need to download and add these dependencies for the latest software version. So this is not at all a good practice where you have to do things manually. So this is where Maven makes your life easier. Maven can solve all your problems related to dependencies. You just need to specify the dependencies that you want in a pom.xml file of Maven and Maven will take care of the rest. So even in the later stages of the project, you need to upgrade the version of the software that you're using. Maven will handle all such issues elegantly. For example, like even if there's a change in the version of the software, you need to make the change in the pom.xml file of Maven. And that's it. Maven will automatically download it for you. This is the reason why we need Maven. So before Maven, we had this build tool called Ant. The problem with Ant was we had to write very long scripts for executing our tasks. For example, you have to define what your tasks are and when you need to execute those tasks. So this was a problem with Ant. Then came the Maven framework and Maven is widely used in the software industry as of now. So now since we know why do we need Maven, let us have a look at what Maven is. Maven is a powerful build automation tool that is primarily used for Java based projects. 
Maven addresses two critical aspects of building software. First, it describes how software is built, and second, it describes the dependencies. It uses conventions for build procedure, and only exceptions need to be written down. An XML file describes the software project that is being built, its dependencies on the other external modules and components, the build order, the directories, and the required plugins. It comes with predefined targets for performing certain well defined tasks, such as compilation of code and its packaging. Maven dynamically downloads Java libraries and Maven plugins from one or more repositories, such as the Maven Central repository, and stores them in the local cache. This local cache of downloaded artifacts can also be updated with the artifacts created by the local projects. Public repositories can also be updated. Maven can also be used to build and manage projects written in C Sharp, Ruby, Scala, and so on. The Maven project is hosted by the Apache Software Foundation, where it was formerly part of the Jakarta project. So, this is Maven in a nutshell. So, now let us discuss the Maven architecture. As you can see in this diagram, these are the various components of Maven architecture. This is the local repository or the local machine that you work on. This is the central repository and this is the remote repository or the remote web server. So whenever you specify any dependency in the pom.xml file of Maven, Maven will look for that file in the central repository, this place. Okay, if the dependency is present in the central repository, Maven will copy that dependency onto your local machine. But if it is not present here, Maven will fetch it from the remote web server or the remote repository using internet. So internet is very much mandatory for using Maven. This is how Maven architecture or Maven works. Now let us talk about the Maven lifecycle. The Maven build follows a lifecycle to deploy and distribute the target project. There are three built-in lifecycles, that is default, clean, and site. The default is the main lifecycle as it is responsible for the project deployment. The clean lifecycle is used to clean the project and remove all the files by the previous build. And site is used to create the project's site documentation. Each lifecycle consists of a sequence of phases. The default build lifecycle consists of 23 phases as it is the main build lifecycle of Maven. On the other hand, the clean lifecycle consists of three phases and the site lifecycle is made up of four phases. So since we now know what Maven lifecycle is, now let us deep dive into what Maven phases are. A Maven phase represents a stage in the Maven build lifecycle. Each phase is responsible for a specific task. Here are some of the most important phases in the default build lifecycle. Validate. This phase checks if all the information necessary for the build is available. The compile phase compiles the source code of the project, whereas the test compile compiles the test source code. The test phase is responsible for running the unit tests of the application. The package phase is responsible for packaging the compiled source code into a distributable format, that is the WAR format or the JAR format. Integration test is the phase in which process and deployment of the package is needed to run the integration test. In the install phase, you install the package to a local repository, and in the deploy phase, you copy the package to the remote repository. So these were a few important phases of the default build lifecycle. Phases are executed in a specific order. This means that if we run a specific phase using the command such as maven test, so all the preceding phases before maven test will also be executed. For example, if we run the deploy phase, which is the last phase in the default build lifecycle, that will execute all the phases before the deploy phase as well, which is the entire default lifecycle. So now let us talk about the Maven goals. Each phase is a sequence of goals and each goal is responsible for a specific task. When we run a phase, all goals bound to this phase are executed in order. Now let us have a look at some of the phases and default goals bound to them. As you can see in this diagram, this is the format of specifying the goals. The compiler is a plugin and compile is a phase. The compile goal from the compiler plugin is bound to the compile phase. The compiler test compile is bound to the test compile phase. Showfire test is bound to the test phase. Jar colon jar is bound to the package phase. So this was all about the Maven goals. Now let us talk about Maven plugins. A Maven plugin is a group of goals. All execution in Maven is done by plugins. 
a plugin is mapped to a goal and executed as a part of it a phase is mapped to multiple goals and these goals are executed by a plugin we can directly invoke our specific goal while maven execution a plugin configuration can be modified using the plugin declaration for example compiler plugin compiles the java source code as you can see in this diagram the compiler plugin has two goals namely the compile and the test compile we will get to know more about the plugins in the demo that we will execute in some time moving on we will now discuss the various advantages that maven has to offer maven's primary goal is to allow a developer to comprehend the complete state of a development effort in the shortest period of time while using maven doesn't eliminate the need to know about the underlying mechanisms maven does provide a lot of shieldings from the details maven allows a project to build using its project object model that is the pom and the set of plugins that are shared by all projects using maven providing a uniform build system once you familiarize yourself with how maven project builds you automatically know how all maven projects build saving you immense amounts of time when you try to navigate among many projects maven provides plenty of useful information that is in part taken from your palm and in part generated from your project's sources for example maven can provide change log document created directly from source control cross reference sources list of mailing lists managed by the project the dependency list and the unit test reports which includes the coverage as maven improves the information set provided will improve all of which will be transparent to the users of maven other products can also provide maven plugins to allow their set of information alongside some of the standard information given by maven all still based on the pom file maven aims to gather current principles for best development practices and it makes easy to guide a project in that direction maven also aims to assist project workflow such as the release and the issue management Maven also suggests some guidelines on how to lay out your project's directory structure. Once you learn the layout, you can easily navigate any other project that uses Maven and the defaults. Maven provides an easy way for Maven clients to update their installation so that they can take advantage of any changes that has been made to the Maven itself. Installation of new or updated plugins from third parties or Maven itself has been made trivial for this reason. so these were a few advantages of maven so guys now let us have a look at the demo project which we will build using maven for this project you need a few things pre installed on your system like you need java you need maven and also you need an ide most preferably eclipse on your system so i have already downloaded and uh, installed these things on my system and here as you can see this is the eclipse ide and here i have created a project okay so i'll show you how to create a project in eclipse specifically maven project okay so here you click on file new maven project so here you check this box like create a simple project skip archetype selection archetype is nothing but a template which is provided by maven for building projects okay so as of now you can create a simple project click on next okay so here are a few things that we need to talk about the group id the group id is nothing but the unique identifier that owns the project here you can specify anything like com.edureka for example in my case so now coming back to the artifact this will be the final name of the compilation unit of your project so you can specify like since my code is written in selenium like i've written a selenium code along with test ng so i will write something like maven.selenium dot test ng okay version indicates the version of the created artifacts like if your project deals with the multiple versions then this is a very useful parameter to deal with such versions the default packaging is jar and you can also change it to pom or war okay and here you have to provide the name of the project okay so in my case let us type dummy project okay here it says maven selenium test ng already exists so what we will do is maven dot test ng dot selenium okay good to go click on finish okay so as soon as you click on finish this is our project maven dot test ng dot selenium 
so if you click here you will see a hierarchy of folders so this is the best part of using maven so maven prefers convention over configuration so now let us talk about these folders src main java src main resources so this is the place where you write the application code like if you are developing a web application you write that code over here in the src main java and all the resources that you need for developing this code are present here in the src main resources and it is also the responsibility of the developer to write the code for developed application you know test the application so for testing purpose the code is written here src test java and whatever the resources are that you need for testing the application those are present in the src test resources folder so this is the jre system library and this is the pom xml this is the most important part of maven project okay so we will come to that part later uh, one more thing that i would like to tell you that these are the various java libraries and the version of java that you have downloaded must be compatible with this one like for example on my system i have java 12 okay so here it shows some other versions as you can see on the screen yeah you should click on this one workspace default jre jdk 12.0.1 okay apply and close okay so now let us talk about few of the elements of palm.xml file this project is the root element of the palm xml file the version here specifies the version of the artifact that is created and snapshot indicates the work is in progress and the name of the project as you can see here is dummy project okay so these were a few elements of the palm xml file right now we have mentioned nothing in the palm.xml file okay so we will add dependencies and plugins here in this palm.xml file so now let us have a look at the code that i have written okay what this code does is this is the selenium script for testing a web application basically i have written a code in which you automatically open a web browser you navigate to a url specified and then you try to fetch the title of the web page that you navigate to and then you try to match that fetch title with the actual title i mean there's a comparison between the expected title and the actual title if both the things are the same then the test case is passed else the test case fails so this is exactly what i have written in this code and this code is written in this package as you can see in the src test java in this package i've written this code demo class dot java as you can see here on the screen okay so this is the code so now we will talk about the various phases now we will try to run this script as you guys must be knowing selenium is the main tool for testing web application but it has limitations such as test case management and report generation hence most number of times we integrate selenium with test ng test ng generates structured test reports and test ng is also useful for performing unit tests test ng provides us with test annotations for managing the test cases so here since we are using the test ng framework we need to convert this java file into test ng so whenever you click this you will see that there's one more xml file created here called text ng.xml so this file is nothing but it contains the name of the class that you have created that is demo class so that's it in the palm.xml we have to specify since we are using selenium and test ng we have to specify those dependencies in the palm.xml file okay so yeah as you can see these are the dependencies selenium and test ng and how do you get these dependencies okay so simply go to mvn repository okay so simply type here selenium okay so you can see this selenium java you need to select a stable version of the selenium as of now this is uh, 3.141.59 so you have to click on that okay so here you can see maven and you need to copy this dependency thing okay these five lines and you have to paste it in the palm.xml file okay selenium java and the version okay so i have to write here the version 3.141.59 i hope it's the same yeah 3.141.59 okay so this is the thing that you have got from mvn repository also similarly for test ng you have to search for test ng 
up over here org dot test ng okay so click on test ng stable version 6.14.3 click on this copy these five lines of maven dependency this thing and you need to paste it over here i've already done this just the version number is different okay so what is the version that is available here the latest one 6.14.3 also apart from the dependencies since we are testing the application you also need two plugins which is nothing but the compiler plugin as the name suggests it is used for compiling the source code and the show fire plugin which is used for unit testing so you also need to add these plugins under the build tag okay as you can see here this entire thing you need to add here in the pom xml and once you add those you have to simply save it using control s that's it so now it is the headache of maven to download it for you and use it in your project now we will try to run the various phases of maven okay so to run the various phases as we discussed earlier for example if we want to run maven clean what maven clean does is it cleans all the previous project builds that have been created not by us maybe by some other user or something else okay so here i will click on maven clean so how to reach there right click on the project run as maven clean and now you will see the output on the console okay so as you can see here it shows build success also guys note down a few things that work in the background like maven clean plugin this is the thing that is working in the background for cleaning the project okay since we are testing this application we will try to run the maven test okay since now i'm trying to run the maven test since we want to test the web application this will also execute all the previous lifecycle phases of maven which exist before test so now let us click on maven test and see what happens okay you can see the browser okay so it shows build success tests run one failure zero error zero skip zero okay so we are good to go guys this works perfectly so we have already seen how to execute this test code and now we have to do the similar thing using command prompt you can do this even without using an eclipse id so what we will do is we will get the path of the pom xml from here let's right click on pom xml file and the location okay so this is the thing that we need to copy since now we have copied the path okay we have to navigate to that path we are at the location of the pom xml file and now we can run the same commands which we did through eclipse such as mvn clean press enter let us see what it does it shows build success everything is working fine now we will test the code using mvn test test okay so let us see what happens okay so it is installing all the libraries that are required for this project the build is success and test has run successfully no failures no errors nothing okay so this works fine Let's first talk about why we need continuous integration. Let's talk about a scenario where we are not using continuous integration. Now, when we work in a development team, there are multiple developers. Now, all the developers work on different different components for a project or for a code. A developer A may be writing code thinking scenario, let's say Python 1.0, and developer B will be writing code thinking of a scenario 1.2, 1.3, and so on. One of the biggest challenges that we face in an industry is how to make sure that all the developers codes get collaborated and that we are having properly release getting deployed that is the biggest challenge in the industry now another challenge that most developers fail is debugging now whenever you write a code there are a lot of bugs and issues now the code is often written thousands and thousands of lines now if you don't have any proper continuous integration mechanism or a packaging mechanism 
you'll see it takes days, even weeks and months to debug your code to make it 100% bug free. Now that is a challenge that really makes the development process very slow. So how to test the code? Now testing used to be a monotonous task. Now there are teams used to spend months of a life cycle to make the code, complete the test code and make sure it's bug free. Now what used to happen is guys, two things. One is you are not able to deliver on time and secondly, business never see value coming out of the IT. If businesses see IT not adding value, IT is not delivering product on time, they will start rethinking and giving a second thought. Why do we need to invest so much money in the IT industry or in the IT software? These things were hampering big time in the development and release of modern day deployment software cycles. In the modern day world, we want to make sure our deployment cycles are robust. We're able to get the main need of the market and deploy the product as soon as possible. But with this approach, we're not using the CI tools. It used to take six months to develop a product, deploy a product and make it bug free. Now things change drastically when we start using continuous integration. Now using continuous integration, we can deploy codes at the quickest. Amazon for instance, deploys code every 11.6 seconds. Now how is that possible if you ask? It's because they are using the continuous integration mechanism. Using CI tools like Jenkins, where we can automate the process like building, packaging, deployment, testing and so on so that we can do all these things with the click of a button in a matter of seconds. CI process helps us to deploy multiple releases parallelly. Now in one day, we can do thousands and thousands of releases without impacting our environment and making sure these releases are in line with our requirement. The CI tool has an awesome notification mechanism where it notifies instantly of any success or failures happening so that if I have to debug the code or troubleshoot it, I will know exactly at the pinpoint location where it is failing. You can do multiple notification management mechanism like an email and SMS, any ITSM tools. Now all those modern ways of notification are possible using the CI tools like Jenkins. Now we integrate these CI tools like Jenkins with modern day build and packaging tools like Maven and Gradle so that we can automate the common problem which developers spend most of their time on. Now developers spend half of their life cycle like packaging their code, code review, code deployment, unit testing. Now all those things can be automated and can be done with the click of a button using these CI tools. Now what is continuous integration? Now we have talked about how it helps to save time, how it helps to save the energy and how it helps to make release more frequent and it helps us to streamline the process. Now what actually is continuous integration? Now if I go traditionally continuous integration is basically you can say a process that helps us to combine or make the smoothen the automation of tasks like compiling the code, doing the testing and deploying the code into our life cycles. So how does this continuous integration work? So developers who works on projects generally commit their code in any version tools like GitHub, GitLab, GitBucket, SVN, etc. So using continuous integration, we pull the code from the version control system like Git for example. Now we automate the process like code compiling, code testing, code review and then finally deploy the code in the lowest lifecycle environment. You can say continuous integration is sort of a development practice where developers pull the code from the version control system and make the code deploy in the lower lifecycle environment. Now the beauty of using this CI tool is we can automate the process in such a way that whenever a developers make a new commit or a new change in the version control system tools, we can create a sort of a pipeline and the pipeline automatically picks the code from the VCS tools and compile it and then deploy the software. Another good thing about it is it does not require any human intervention. So once I have set up a pipeline, then I don't need to worry about running the code again and again or making any changes. It automatically happens in a fully automated process as I mentioned a while back. Now we can use the process whenever a new commit happens or you can run it on a scheduled basis or something. Now CI or continuous integration was first time proposed in 1991 as part of the extreme program concept. At that time, it was not adopted so well, but in the modern day industry, it has become the bread and butter of smoothing up release or for our development process. In a modern day world, continuous integration can be said as a practice of merging all developers, working copy to a mainstream where you can develop and deploy the code multiple times in the same day with as many changes as possible. Now, there is no limit of how many lines of code. It can be tens and thousands of lines of code, which can be compiled multiple times throughout the duration. Let's see a case study where we try to see how things change for an organization after it adopted to the CI or continuous integration mode. Here we have picked up an example of Adobe to see how it helped in the development process. 
Adobe realized at some point at the time that they have not released very frequently. When this happened, their market percentage share was down as they were not following the continuous integration approach. Now, they were using the native method of compiling the code, debugging the code, testing the code, because of which they were noticing that it used to take up to six months release updates. Now, six months was a long duration, whereas their competitors were releasing very frequently, which was helping them to capture the market share. Adobe decided some point at a time that they need to change their software development and deployment strategies. And they tried to adopt the continuous integration mechanism. Once they adopted the continuous integration mechanism, they found that the response time was a lot better and a lot faster. Now, they were able to deploy the updates more frequently with every time a change was made by a developer or a new release was being released. And it helped them reduce the response times and they were 60% more faster. The development teams were getting more effective and they were able to really deploy losses far more in a better and structured way than what they were doing without using CI. You can see how CI helps industry. Amazon is the best case scenario. Amazon in modern day scenario, deploy codes every 11.6 seconds, almost five times every minutes. Now this is all possible using the continuous integration. Now what is Jenkins? Now we've talked about what is CI. We've talked about why we need CI. Now let's talk about what is Jenkins and how does Jenkins fit in this particular picture? Now Jenkins is an open source automation server which helps us to automate the process of development relating to testing, deployment packaging and others. It is a server based systems that run on software Apache Tomcat. Now it support VCS store like Git, Bigbucket etc. It also support build automation tools like Apache, Maven and it helps to make and facilitate our continuous integration and continuous delivery process. Now, Jenkins was first released in the year 2011 and it's completely open source software as a part of the MIT license. Jenkins is a plugin based profile. In Jenkins, you have got plugin which basically used to interact with different different tools and components. In Jenkins, plugin are primarily released in language other than Java. Plugins are available to integrate Jenkins with most version control system tools and most databases. Using these plugins, we set up purposes, for example, unit testing. Now you can do compiling, you can do packaging. Now you can create some reports. Now you can do some lodging. Now all these things are possible using plugins and Jenkins. Another important component that we've talked about in Jenkins, apart from plugins, is Jenkins notification, which we call it as Mailer. Using Mailer, guys, we can configure email notification. For instance, you can configure scenario. For example, you want mail notification when bill is successful. Now, all these things can be done using Mailer as the Jenkins component. Another important component in Jenkins is the SSH agent. Jenkins also follow a typical master-slave topology. Now, why do we need a master-slave topology and a CI tools like Jenkins? Now, when you work in the organization, we have got multiple teams which you want to build and deploy their own pipeline or deploy their own software project codes. Now, teams don't want the piece of code to be run on a server which is owned by some other teams. So what we can do is we can set up a master-slave topology where Jenkins may run on a server X. But you can connect multiple other servers which will act as a slave. So when you are deploying a code executing a pipeline, you can run those codes on those XYZ servers. Now, this is the beauty of using Jenkins master-slave topology. Now, another good thing about Jenkins is Jenkins can be deployed on any operating system. In Jenkins, you can use in a window mode, a Linux mode, a Mac mode, or now all these Jenkins jobs can be deployed on any operating system. It is not at all dependent. Now, both master and slave needs to be of the same operating system. Another important core component of Jenkins call is Javadoc. This is our plugin in Jenkins, which basically is a part of Jenkins core that helps us to publish results like build action, build directory, what is the expected build output, all those things that we see in Jenkins. They all are happening using Javadoc. Now let's talk about security injection. Apart from that, Jenkins have other sorts of authorization like project based strategy, metric based authorization, which help us to make Jenkins more secure. We'll talk more about this when we talk about the Jenkins overall. So as you can see on the diagram, Jenkins is pulling code from the source code control system like Git, Bigbucket, etc. To start deploying it in Jenkins, we have got a notification management system using Mailer, where if the bit is successful, we get a WAR file or a zip file. We can define how we want the build to be created 
and if it is a failure it will send the notification management to a developer that something happened wrongly with the specific code lines and you need to rectify your codes now that is the beauty of using jenkins so jenkins is still the bread and butter in the industry there are some jenkins competitors also in the market like gitlab jenkins and some others but by default jenkins is the to go tool for the ci industry so far we've talked about jenkins now let's talk about what is pipelining in jenkins now let's say i want to deploy a code the code may have certain steps like first step i'm building the code second step i'm compiling then code reviewing then packaging then deploying so how do i automate a combine of all these steps which can be executed in one go now to deploy all the scenario we have created a delivery pipeline now pipeline is nothing but it's a combination of different different steps or different tasks that we need to perform in order to deploy our code now using a pipeline instead of doing this task or code deployment manually we combine them and deploy them as a sort of one common approach of a delivery pipeline now there are multiple ways on how you can create a pipeline the two most common ways or common approaches of using a pipeline as you can see from scenario a declarative approach and the second one that is used in the industry is a scripted approach this particular is an example of a jenkins pipeline script here you are saying we are first doing a stage called build stage where we will be combining multiple tasks like first we are using java then we are printing something called echo hello pipeline then we are using maven as the build automation tool and try to deploy a package and then we are doing a shell script output of what all things are present in that particular directory structure this is a typical example of syntax of how to create a pipeline in jenkins now let's talk about the two predominant pipeline that are used in the it industry scripted and declarative now let's talk about what is scripted and declarative and how they are different from each other a scripted pipeline is a traditional jenkins pipeline approach and a declarative pipeline is a modern day pipeline approach that is used in the industry in a scripted pipeline the syntax was first strict while in declarative pipeline we use something called as groovy syntax when you use a declarative pipeline you can get a code from any version system tool like git you can create something called as jenkins file and you can download jenkins file from a virtual constant tool and that can be used to run your jenkins code when you use a scripted pipeline you define a code something called as a node block but one declarative pipeline will define a code in a pipeline block as we can see in the previous example now let's talk about what is jenkins file and how it can be used now jenkins file are like a text file where you define your entire structure and syntax of your jenkins you know only how to download the file and in particular you can just give the part of your git repo if it is true then get the credential the private repo and it can pull all the contents from there and just execute your code it is a modern deployment mechanism that we use when we work with a jenkins pipeline using jenkins pipeline we use certain things which help us let's talk about this first is code review now you do a jenkins pipeline you can easily review your code your code can be reviewed by multiple developers before being executed now how that works is in jenkins file they are stored generally in a version control tool like git you can put something called as a pull request for a code review now different members of your team can review the code before you actually pull the jenkins file and deploy it now you can do an audit trail or refer to as a long audit you can log each and every steps output that is being executed as part of the jenkins file and can see what is happening when the jenkins file is getting executed it's sort of like a verbose log then you can find a single place to store all your data or all your outputs you don't need to have developers scattered here and there and writing their own codes for executing a jenkins pipeline whole organization can approach a jenkins file methodology where code can be stored in a vcs tools and from there the code can be downloaded and can work as a single source for your entire pipeline now let's talk about the jenkins workflow in particular how does jenkins workflow work jenkins workflow always start with a version control system or you can say a source code repository multiple developers collaborate and they put their code in a source code system like git from where jenkins try to pull the data from that source control system for your system there is no mandatory or the source code needs to be git it can be big bucket svn whatever your organization uses with jenkins server now we execute tasks like build deploy compiling packaging code reviewing now all these things happen using jenkins server where your jenkins actually installed was running now jenkins server can be any operating system it can be a window machine 
Ubuntu machine, Linux machine or a Mac as well. It can be any operating system of today's modern world availability. Using this Jenkins server will execute our different different tasks and scenarios. In Jenkins server we use the mail functionality for the feedback mechanism. We notify developers the commit or the code deployment successfully or it is a failure. It also has some challenges. Now what can be done using the feedback mechanism possibly using the Jenkins server. So using Jenkins server we always first deploy the code on a lower lifecycle environment that is recommended standard practice. So what we do is we first deploy a QA server on a testing server and once the code deployment is successful on the lower life cycle then we go ahead and deploy the code on a production server. That is how the entire Jenkins workflow mainly particular interact first. So since Docker is a containerization platform, it's important to understand what came before containerization or what is the history of containerization. So before Docker came into the picture, before containerization came into the picture, there was this concept of virtualization or basically using virtual machines. So virtualization was this technique of importing a guest OS on top of an operating system. And this technique was a revelation at the beginning because it allowed developers to run multiple operating systems in different virtual machines all running on the same host operating system which nothing but eliminated the need for extra hardware resources. Now the advantages of virtual machines or of virtualization are many. Multiple OSs could be run on the same machine. The maintenance and recovery was easy in case of failure conditions. And the third point here being the total cost of ownership was also less due to the reduced need for infrastructure. So as you can see here on your screen right now, you can see that there is a host operating system on which there are multiple guest OSs running, which is nothing but a virtual machine. So as most concepts have their shortcomings, virtualization also had a few. So running multiple virtual machines on the same host OS, each to the performance of degradation. This is because the guest OS running on top of the host OS will have its own kernel, own set of libraries and own dependencies. And these take up a large chunk of the system resources that is the hard disk, processor, RAM and other resources. Another problem with the virtual machine which used virtualization that it takes a lot of time to boot up. So the problem is very critical in case of real time applications. So these drawbacks were always there. Apart from that, you also have the age old battle between development and production teams that the code works at development and does not work in productions because the developer has a system with their own set of libraries, their own kernel and the apps running on there. Whereas the production team has these resources of their own. So this is a problem that you can blame upon the difference in the computing environment. A code that runs on the developer system might not run on someone else's computer. So this led to a new technique called containerization. Basically a container brings virtualization to the OS level while virtualization brings abstraction to the hardware. Containerization brings abstraction to the OS. So what you might notice here is containerization is basically virtualization but it's more efficient because there is no guest OS here. It utilizes a host's operating system, shares relevant public libraries and resources when needed and unlike virtual machines, the application specific libraries and binaries of containers run on the host kernel. So each app has its own set of libraries and binaries in its own little container, which makes processing and execution extremely fast. Even if you have to boost a process, it takes only a fraction of a second because in case of containerization, all the containers share only the host operating system, but hold all their application related binaries and libraries in themselves. They are lightweight and faster than virtual machines. So here, as you can see, there is your host OS or your host kernel, which is shared by all the different containers. So the containers themselves only contain the application specific libraries, which are separate for each container. This is what makes them faster and they do not waste any resource. All these containers are handled by a containerization layer, which is not native to the host OS. Hence, a software is needed which can enable you to run containers on your host OS. 
And this is also how containerization solves the difference in computing environment problem. Now, a developer works on containers instead of virtual machines. The app and its required libraries and binaries all are in one container. So when it is passed on to the testing team or the production team, it does not matter whether their host systems have the same libraries. All the dependencies are already present in the container containing the app. So now that you know what is virtualization and what is containerization, and why do we need containerization, let's move ahead and talk about Docker. Why do we need Docker? So a challenge I briefly spoke about earlier is what I would like to elaborate on in this section. Now, when you have a project code in a development lifecycle, there are different, different environments. You have your virtual server, you have your staging environment, you have your production environment, you have your QA environment. Now, most of the code that we deploy today is done using VMs or virtual machines. Now, how this works is that a developer or certain developers will write the code and all of it is placed in a version control system such as Git. Now, this could also be placed in a staging server depending on your organization's infrastructure. But most organizations these days use a version control system. So more often than not, the code is placed in that version control system. Now, this code is never directly deployed in the production server. It's usually first deployed in a lower lifecycle server like your QA server or your staging server. Now, once it is successful in that, then only it is deployed on your production server. Now, this is where the chances of conflicts increase. So the same piece of code that might be running on your staging server might not run on your production server. And the reason is very simple is the difference in the computational environment. This is also known as infrastructure incompatibility. Now, in most cases, your QA servers or your QA environment, staging environment are always updated. In most organizations, that's the case. It usually has the latest libraries, latest binaries, latest jars, all that jazz. But the same cannot be said for the production environment. So in order to face all these challenges that is faced, difference in environment and lack of optimization of resources, we use Docker. So this is where Docker comes into picture. Docker does virtualization in the software level and we call it containerization as I had mentioned before. So here, as you can see, containers are bundled with their own set of libraries and binaries, but they can communicate with each other with a fixed set of protocols. The thing about containers, however, is that they do not have their own operating systems, which is a great thing because this is what makes them lightweight and function on very little resources, which makes them really fast as well. So what exactly is Docker? As you can see on your screens, there are two machines. The first one has three software applications. One is Angular based, one is React based and one is Django based. Now all of them are using common resources from the systems, libraries, RAM, processor, etc. And the frameworks are allocated a location in the memory. Now, how is it different from your machine with Docker? Since you have a Dockerized machine, you have a Dockerized system, all of your frameworks and binaries and libraries required by your Angular app, your React app and your Django app can be put into their each isolated containers, which are going to run independently from each other without interfering with another app. And the space in which you had your framework stored has opened up. So now you can add another software application there with its own frameworks and libraries, binaries, etc. And that is what Docker is meant to do. It's a tool designed to make it easier for you to create, deploy and run applications by the usage of containers. Docker is a containerization solution. Docker containers do not use the guest operating system. They use the host operating system and on top of that host operating system, there is the Docker engine. And with the help of this Docker engine, Docker containers are formed and these containers have applications running in them. The requirements for those applications, such as all the binaries, libraries, frameworks, jars, etc., are also packaged in the same container. There can be multiple containers running simultaneously. As you can see, there are two containers here in our example, and those containers have applications running in them. And you don't really have to pre-allocate any RAM to those containers. 
These containers allow a developer to package an application with all its parts, all its needs, and then you can deploy it as one whole package. They are basically lightweight alternatives to virtual machines that use the host operating system. This is basically a general workflow of Docker. So you can see one way of using Docker over here. What is happening is that your developer writes a code and defines an application requirements or the dependencies in an easy to write Docker file. And then this Docker file produces Docker images. So whatever dependencies are required for a particular application is present inside the image. Now, as we have specified many times before, what are Docker containers? Now, the Docker containers we spoke so much about are basically the runtime instances of these Docker images. This particular image is then uploaded onto Docker Hub from where anyone can pull the image and build a container. Now, Docker Hub is nothing but the GitHub of Docker. It's like a repository for Docker images. It contains public as well as private repositories. So from the public repositories, you can pull your images and you can upload your own images as well to Docker Hub. And then, as I mentioned, from Docker Hub, various teams such as your QA team or production team can pull the images and prepare their own containers, as you can see in the diagram. So this shows a great advantage of Docker is that whatever dependencies that are there that are required for your application to run are present throughout the software delivery lifecycle. If you can recall the initial problem that was there with VMs was basically that the application worked fine in a development environment, but when it reached the production environment, it was not working properly. So that particular problem is easily resolved with the help of this particular workflow because you have the same environment throughout the software delivery lifecycle, be it a developer, testing, QA, or production. Now, before moving on to the next section, let's look at a case study about containerizing the NASA Land Information System Framework using Docker. Now, developed by the Hydrological Sciences Laboratory at NASA's Godard Space Flight Center, or GSFC, the Land Information System, or the LIS, is a high-performance software framework for terrestrial hydrology modeling and data assimilation. Basically, the LIS enables integrating satellite and ground-based observational products and advanced modeling algorithms to extract land surface states and fluxes. Now, this framework was very difficult for non-experts to install due to many dependencies on specific versions of the software and compilers. This situation then created a significant barrier to entry for domain scientists interested in using the software for their own computing systems or in the cloud. In addition, the requirement to support multiple runtime environments across the LIS community had created a significant burden on the NASA team. Now, to overcome these challenges, NASA had deployed LIS using Docker containers, which allowed installing an entire software package along with dependencies within a working runtime environment. They also used Docker Swarm, which we shall learn about later, to orchestrate the deployment of the cluster of containers. This installation that used to take weeks or months was now completed by NASA officials in minutes, either in the cloud or on premises. Now, moving on, let's look at Docker's workflow and architecture. What you see in front of you is the Docker workflow. Now, the Docker engine uses a client server architecture where the Docker engine is simply a Docker application that is installed on your local machine. The client server architecture communicates using a REST API and the Docker daemon checks the requests to manage the containers. So the Docker architecture includes a Docker client, which is used to trigger Docker commands, a Docker host, which runs the Docker daemons, and a Docker registry, which stores the Docker images. The Docker daemon running with the Docker host is responsible for images and containers. We'll understand the concept of images a little later in this very section as a part of Docker components. So to build a Docker image, you can use the CLI or the client to issue a bill to command the Docker daemon, which runs on the Docker host. Now the Docker daemon will then build an image based on your inputs and save it in the registry, which can either be the Docker hub or a local repository. 
So if we do not want to create an image, then we can just pull an image from the Docker Hub, which would have been built by different users. And finally, if we have to create a running instance of any Docker image, we can issue a run command from the CLI or the client, which will create our Docker container. So this is basically the overall architecture or the overall functioning of the Docker architecture. As we move forward in the section, things will be more clear to you. So as you can see, the heart of the Docker architecture is basically the Docker engine. The Docker engine is simply the Docker application that is installed on the host operating system of your host machine. It works like a client server application, which uses a server, which is a type of long running program called the daemon process. The second point here is the command line interface or the client. The next component here is the REST API, which is used for communication between the CLI client and the Docker daemon. So now if there is a Linux based OS, and there is one Docker client which can be accessed from the terminal and a Docker host which runs the Docker daemon. We build our Docker images and run our Docker containers by passing the commands from the CLI client to the Docker image. So this was all about Docker engine and its workflow. Now let's talk about the Docker components which you will be most acquainted to hearing. You have your Docker file which builds into a Docker image, which you run, you get a Docker container, and then you store it in a Docker registry. Let's go ahead and look at all of these components in a little depth, shall we? First of all, you have your Docker file, which is nothing but a text document, which contains all of your commands that you as a developer call on the command line to assemble an image. So basically, to create an image, you'll have to write a Docker file and then build it. So Docker file basically has your set of instructions, which creates the Docker image. Next, you have the Docker image, which can be compared to a template used to create a Docker container. So Docker images are basically the building blocks of a Docker container. These Docker images are created using the build command, and these are read-only templates. You can then store them, as I had mentioned before, in your Docker Hub or your local registry. Next, after building your Docker image, what you get is a Docker container. And these are read-only templates. You can then go ahead and store them in Docker Hub or your local registry, as I had mentioned before. Docker lets you create and share software through Docker images. And you also don't have to worry about whether your computer can run a software in a Docker image because a Docker container is always there to run it. So in case of Docker images, you can use a ready-made Docker image from the Docker Hub or create a new image as per your own requirements to run in a container. With that, let's move on to the next component, which is a Docker container. So the Docker containers are the ready applications created from Docker images. It's the running instance of a Docker image and this Docker container holds the entire package needed to run this Docker application. So a Docker container happens to be the ultimate utility of Docker and hence this is the part of Docker which is most popular and most widely used. So if you talk about the applications, every application is run inside a container. So it is an isolated application platform that contains all you need to run an application built from one or more images. So finally, let's move on to Docker registry, which is a storage component for the Docker images. Now, this is where the Docker images are stored, which could either be a user's local repository or a public repository like the Docker Hub, which allows multiple users to collaborate building an application, even with multiple teams within the same organization who exchange or share containers by uploading them to the Docker Hub. It helps you control where your images are being stored and integrates your image storage with your in-house development workflow as well. Now, Docker Hub, as I mentioned before, is Docker's very own cloud repository, which is similar to GitHub, which is kind of like GitHub, but for Docker images. Hope you guys are with me so far. With this, we have seen the architecture and components of Docker. So now we are going to talk about two other components of Docker, Docker Compose and Docker Swarm. 
So first of all, let's start with Docker Compose. Now Docker Compose is a tool for defining and running multi-container Docker applications, which basically means you can run different or multiple containers as a single service. The containers are still isolated, but they can interact with each other using a YAML file, which is used to configure your application services. And then with a single command, Docker Compose up, you can create and start all the services from your configuration. A great example of this would be a microservice such as a shopping app. So for example, you can take any online retail stores app. It could be Amazon, it could be Flipkart, it could be Argeo. And the idea behind an app like this is that it's a microservice app, which basically means it has multiple services in one big application. So all of these services individually are easier to build and maintain. And when one service is failing, the entire app is not down. So a retail app like Amazon or Mintra or Flipkart or any app of your choice, it'll have multiple services like it'll have a login account, it'll have your product catalog service, it'll have a shopping cart service and a checkout service. And this is just the bare minimum. And each of these services could be scaled up or down in their own container, tested and built and fixed in their own isolated containers without interfering with any other service in that entire application. So using something like Docker Compose, you can connect all of these isolated containers as a single service. All right. And the next thing I want to talk about is Docker Swarm. Now Docker Swarm is a service which allows you to create and manage a group of either physical or virtual machines or nodes and schedule containers. Each of the nodes is a daemon which interacts with others using the Docker API. Docker Swarm is basically a technique to create and maintain a cluster of different Docker engines. Services deployed in any node can be accessed on other nodes in the same cluster. It allows for high availability of services, auto load balancing, decentralization of access, easy upscaling and downscaling of deployments and rolling updates. So basically how it works is that your manager nodes know the status of all the working nodes in a cluster. Your worker nodes then accept tasks sent from the manager node. There is an agent assigned to every single node to give its task updates to the manager. And finally, the workers communicate with the manager using an API over the HTTP protocol. And that is how a Docker Swarm works. Basically, Docker Swarm is an orchestration management tool that runs on Docker applications. It helps you end users in creating and deploying a cluster of Docker nodes. Each node of a Docker Swarm is a Docker daemon and all the Docker daemons interact using the Docker API and each container within the swarm can be deployed and accessed by other nodes of the same cluster. So if you consider an environment having Docker containers, if one of the container fails, we can use the swarm to correct that failure. Docker swarm can reschedule containers on node failures and the swarm node also has a backup folder which we can use to restore the data onto a new swarm. So with that, we have come to an end to the workflow and architecture of Docker. So now I'm sure all of you might be eager for actually doing something on Docker. So let's go ahead and install Docker. So here are the steps to install Docker on Ubuntu, on your Linux systems, on your Ubuntu systems. You will be using the command sudo apt install docker.io on your Ubuntu systems to install Docker on your system. So let's go ahead and start up with the installation. Today I am using the Ubuntu distribution running on my Oracle VM VirtualBox. So we're going to start out by updating. So sudo apt update. And this might take a little bit time. So kindly be patient. This is a good practice before making any installations, any setups on your machine. All right. As you can see, all my packages are upgraded. And now we can go ahead and install Docker. So to install Docker, we are going to use the command sudo apt 
install docker.io and then click on Y and there's also something which takes up quite a considerable amount of time depending on the speed of your machine as well as the speed of your internet so on and so forth now understand this is just one way of doing this and this is the method I am most comfortable with and that's why this is the method I will be demonstrating here there are two three other methods through which you can download docker on your machine and not just in Linux you can also install docker desktop on windows just in case you do not want to use a virtual machine and you can also use a cloud platform such as an ec2 instance to run all of these docker commands that i shall be showing you later in this session So now we are going to start and enable Docker using sudo systemctl. Okay, with that, we have started and enabled our Docker machines. And now we are going to go ahead and check out our Docker version that's running. And as you can see, this is the Docker version and this is the Docker build that we are running. All right, so moving on, we are going to get to our hands on section. In this section, we will learn how to create a Django project setup using Docker and deploy it on our local host for that remember you need to have a github account and docker installed on your machine just the way i showed you right now we're going to build a backend rest api with python and django we're going to create a new github project that we are going to use to store the source code for our recipe app api now this is a wonderful way to show the versatility of docker now I found this project while browsing through GitHub and I came to a conclusion that this was a wonderful way to show how eclectic, how versatile is Docker as a tool. So the first step would include initializing a new project on GitHub and coming back to your Linux machine and navigating to where you wish to store your API. There we are going to create our Docker file using an editor. You can obviously use the VI editor or nano editor if you please. They're using the editor in our working directory. We are going to be creating our Docker file, our requirements file, and our Docker compose file, which is our YAML file. And then we are going to run our app on the terminal. So this is the basic breakdown of how we are going to create our Django project setup using Docker. So let's go on straight to our demo machine and put all of this into action. So we are going to navigate to GitHub and we are going to create a new public project or repository on GitHub. So let's create a new repository and let's call it Docker Demo API App. And in the description, we're just going to write Demo App Setup. We're going to keep this public and we're going to initialize this with a readme file. All right. So let's go ahead and create our repository. So as you can see, this is a blank repository, Docker demo API app, just the readme file there. So here on our repository page, I'm going to click on this green button code button and copy the URL from here from your clone or download option. We're gonna copy this to our clipboard so that we can clone this particular repository using our terminal. I'm gonna move on to the terminal and I'm gonna load my terminal and navigate to the directory where I want to store my app. 
so maybe I'll just save it here I'm just gonna clone this repository to my local machine all right and that's done now you can go ahead and change your directory to the repository so now I'm going to use the command ls to see if my repository has been cloned yes it has been cloned you can see the docker demo api app is cloned right here on my local machine so I'm going to change my directory to this repository I just created by typing the command cd docker demo api app now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this project in the editor like I had mentioned you can use any other editor you can use the vi editor the nano editor any editor that you're comfortable with so now I'm going to clear all of this and I'm going to use the nano editor to create the docker file first So just nano and docker file there's no spaces between docker and file and i am going to put in this code over here all right so this is my docker file so the first line of the docker file is the image that you're going to inherit your docker file from with docker you can basically build images on top of other images the benefit of this is that you can find an image that has pretty much everything that you need for your project so you can just add customized bits that you need just for your specifications so we are going to create our docker file from python 3.7 alpine image now you can find this if you head over to the docker hub you can find a list of available images that you can use to base your project off of if you search for python It'll take you to a list of items where you can choose this one. So we're going to use the 3.7 Alpine image. So what it is, is that it's basically a lightweight version of Docker. And that's what Alpine means. And it runs Python 3.7. And the next line is optional. It's usually a maintainer line. But it's useful just to know who is maintaining the project so i'm going to leave that one out but you can go ahead and put in your maintainer line you can put your name or your company's name whatever name you basically use to keep track to show that who is maintaining this docker image next we are going to set the python unbuffered environment variable the way you set unbuffered environment variable now the way you set an environment variable in a docker build file is that you type env and then the environment variable that you want to set we're going to set one called python and it's got to be in all capitals unbuffered and then we're going to set it to one so what this does is that it tells python to run in the unbuffered mode which is the recommended mode when running python within docker containers the reason for this is that it doesn't allow python to buffer the outputs it just prints them directly and then avoids some complications and things like that so when you're running your Python application, we are going to install our dependencies. We are going to store our dependencies in a requirements.txt list or file, which we are going to create in a moment. So that what we need to do here is we need to copy our requirements.txt file. And what this does is it says copy from the directory adjacent to the Docker file copy. So we're going to copy the requirements.txt file. Further, we're going to copy it on the Docker image, which is what this forward slash requirement txt file means. Next, we're going to run pip install our forward slash requirements.txt. So what this does is that it takes the requirements that we have just copied and installs it using pip into your Docker image. Next, we're going to make a directory within our Docker image that we can use to store our application source code. So you have your run mkdir forward slash app all in lowercase. 
and below that we are going to type work duh forward slash app and below that we are going to type copy dot slash app space slash app. What this does is it creates an empty folder in our Docker image called forward slash app at this location and then it switches to that as the default directory. So any application we've run using our Docker container will run starting from this particular location unless we specify otherwise of course. Next what it does is that it copies from our local machine the app folder to the app folder that we have just created on our image. This allows us to take the code that we created in our project here and copy it to our Docker image. So here we have run add user hyphen capital D and user. And finally, we are going to switch to that user by typing user. Now this might be a little confusing because I've added the username user for our user. But what this command means is that it says add user which creates a user. User hyphen D says create a user that is going to be used for running applications only. So not for basically having a home directory that someone will log in. It's going to be used simply to run our processes from our particular project. Finally, this user switches Docker to the user that we've just created. The reason we do this is for security purposes. If you don't do this, then the image will run our application using the root account, which is not recommended because that means if someone compromises our application, they can have the root access to the whole image and they can go ahead and do other malicious things. Whereas if you create a separate user just for the application, then that kind of limits the scope that the attacker would have within our Docker container. All right, so we can go ahead and write out, we can save this file and move ahead to creating our requirements file. So this is what your requirements.txt file will look like. It's a fairly, it's just two lines. In the first line here, we are installing Django. We are using version 2.2.4, which is the latest stable version that I could find. And that's the version that we are going to use for the project. And then type Django more than equals to 2.2.4. So basically what it says is that install Django that is equal to or higher than this particular version. And we do this to take the minor version, which is the last number and make sure that we install the latest available version because typically it's the version that has the security features and security fixes and things like that. But it typically doesn't have breaking changes. So we can be confident that our application when we rebuild our Docker image will have the latest security patches, even if it does not have the latest version. Okay. In the next line, we're going to install the Django REST framework. So we're using 3.9.0. And in the same way, which we did with Django, we're going to make the install one less than 3.10.0 to get the latest version of 3.9, which is whatever is the latest minor version at the time we build our project. So now we're going to go ahead and save this file as well. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create an empty directory called app here for our Docker file to call because when our Docker file will run and it's going to ask for an app folder, we're not going to have one, then we're going to face issues. So now if I do an ls here, you see we have a Docker file, we have our requirements file and we have our app folder. Now understand why this is required for our Docker file for us to build it now. So now if you try to copy it without the app folder actually existing, it will give you an error. So now we can go ahead and build our Docker image. So we are already at our terminal. If you're not on your terminal, you can load up your terminal. And if you are on Windows, it will be your command prompt. Let's make sure that you navigate to your project folder, which I am already at. 
and then I'm going to type docker build dot. Now what that's going to do is that it's going to build whichever docker file is in the root of our project that we are currently in. The reason we call it docker file in the first place is because it's the standard convention that docker uses to identify the docker file within our project. So we're going to wait for it to complete and it should be fairly quick because we are using an alpine image. It's a very lightweight minimal image that runs Python. That's how we create a Docker file for our project and go ahead and create our Docker Compose configuration for our project. So we're going to use Docker Compose as a tool to allow us to run our Docker image easily from our project location. So it allows us to easily manage the different services that make up for our project. So for example, one service might be the Python application that we run. Another service might be a database, for example. So let's go ahead and create the Docker Compose file for our project. So nano docker compose dot yaml or yml. So this is a YAML file that contains the configuration for all services that make up our project. The first line of the Docker Compose configuration file is the version of Docker Compose that we are going to be writing our file for. So version colon and three. Next, we define the services that make up our application. Right now, we only need one service for our Python Django application. So services colon and in the line below, you're going to type app. This is the name of our service. So we are going to call it out and then we are going to type build and then context code on context. So what this says is that we are going to have a service called app and the build section of the configuration. We are going to set the context to dot, which is our current directory that we are running Docker compose from. Next, we're going to type the port configuration. So we're going to type them in open speech marks 8080 is our host to port 8080 on our image so we're going to type that and then we're going to add a volume the volume allows us to get the updates that we make to our project into our docker image in real time so it basically maps a volume from our local machine here into our docker container while we'll be running our application now this means whenever you change a file or you change something in the project, you will automatically update it in the container. Now, the good part is you don't have to restart Docker to get the changes into effect. So then you have a dot slash app forward slash app. So what this does is it maps the app directory, which we have here in our project. And this it maps to the app directory in our Docker image. Then you have the command to run your application in your Docker container. So just make sure that the indentation is one indent from where your command starts and then you type the command. So we're going to use to run our application bsh hyphen c. This means we are going to run the command using the shell. The Python manage py run server. Then we're going to run the server on our local host at port 8080. So this will run the Django development server available on all IP addresses that run on the Docker container. And it's going to run on port 8080, which is going to be mapped through the POS configuration on our local machine so we can run our application. So again, we are going to move on to our terminal and build the Docker Compose file. And what this does is it will build our image using the Docker Compose configuration and this should not take too much time. So if we're going to build our Docker file. So now we're going to add sudo docker compose build. And as you can see, it's successfully built clear it out so 
So now we're going to use Docker Compose to create the project files for our application. And for that, you can either log in as super user or just type sudo. So Django admin.py, we're going to start project. Now, after running the command, you will realize that if you go into your empty app folder, which was the folder that you created initially, and list out, it's not empty anymore. It has another app folder in it, which contains all of our app setup. I will show you. There you go. You have these files, one, two, three, four, five, Python files, which is basically your Django app's entire setup, and all of this Docker created and set it up for you. So a teensy little detail, let's just open up our settings.py file, and we're going to go down to allowed hosts, and just in case it's empty between the closed brackets, you can go ahead and add your local host or put in the asterisk which allows all hosts. All right, so I'm just going to do that and then I'm going to go back. And now all we have to do is deploy the application through your terminal. So we're going to go sudo docker compose up. So now as you can see, your Django application is up and running. And all of this was possible because of Docker. Let us discuss Python's popular framework that is Django. So what exactly is Django, right? Well, Django is web application framework written in Python programming language. It is based on MVT design pattern. You might be wondering what is MVT, right? Well, MVT stands for Model View Template. It is maintained by Django Software Foundation, an American independent organization which was established as a 501 nonprofit. Django is in very high demand due to its rapid development features, which means that it takes less time to build an application after collecting clients' requirements. This framework uses a famous tagline that is the web framework for perfectionists with the deadlines. By using Django, we can build web applications in a very little time and the reason for this is because Django handles much of the configuration things automatically so we can focus on application development only. With so much hype about Django, you might be wondering why Django and how Django is different from other frameworks. So let us now talk about its advantages. You see, starting off with one of the most powerful feature of Django that is object relational mapper. This enables you to interact with your database like you would with SQL. As a matter of fact, Django's ORM is a Pythonic way to create SQL to query and manipulate your database and get results in a Pythonic fashion. Starting off with one of the most powerful features of Django, that is Object Relational Mapper. You see, Object Relational Mapper enables you to interact with your database like you would using an SQL. In fact, Django's ORM is a Pythonic way to create SQL to query and manipulate your database and get results in a Pythonic fashion. The next advantage that we have is a tight integration. You see, Django provides a set of tightly integrated components. All of these components have been developed by the Django team themselves. You see, Django was originally developed as an in-house framework for managing a series of new ordinate websites. Later, its code was released on the internet and Django team continues its development using an open source model. Because of its roots, Django's components are still designed for its integration, reusability, speed from the very beginning. Then we have administration interface. You see, Django provides a default admin interface that can be used to perform create, read, update, and delete operation on model directly. It reads a set of data that explains and gives information about data from the model to provide an instant interface where the user can adjust the contents of the application. Then we have multilingual support. 
Django supports multilingual websites through a built-in initialization system. Using this, we can integrate multiple languages into a Python Django framework. This is helpful for those people who are working on websites with more than one language. So now that you know what is Django, let's see some of its features. You see, first off, as I've mentioned earlier, Django supports rapid development. You see, Django was designed with the intention to make framework that takes less time to build a web application. The project implementation phase is very time taken, but Django creates it rapidly. Then we have security. Django takes security seriously and helps developers to avoid many common security mistakes such as SQL injection, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, and many more. Its user authentication system provides a secure way to manage user accounts and password. Then we have scalability. You see, Django is scalable in nature and it has ability to quickly and flexibly switch from small to large-scale application projects. Then moving ahead to fully loaded. You see, Django includes various helping task modules and libraries which can be used to handle common web development tasks. Django takes care of its authentication, content administration, sitemaps, RSS feed, and many more. Finally, coming down to versatility. Django is versatile in nature, which allows it to build application for different different domains. You see, nowadays companies are using Django to build various types of applications like content management system, social network site, or specific computing platforms. With Django being so popular, let's take a look at big tech companies who are using this framework. Starting off with YouTube. These video sharing platforms need no introduction. Earlier, this site was developed on PHP, but the YouTube team felt the need to improve its performance and add new functionalities in it. Continuous rapid audience growth forced the YouTube team to choose Django framework, and the choice was fully justified. You see, Django helped the YouTube team of developers, allowing the team to act quickly and flawlessly. They use this framework to implement new features and to maintain the speed of the website. The next big company that is utilizing Django is Instagram. Again, this site needs no introduction. You see, Instagram is the fastest growing photo and video sharing app, which is quite popular in the world today. The Kevin and Mike, the co-founders of Instagram, developed the first version of this app using Django. It was super easy to work with Django, and it didn't require a lot of decisions and setups. Every day, Instagram users add 95 million photos and give 4.2 billion likes under the picture and videos. Django helped Instagram to scale the application, process huge amount of data, and manage great number of interaction between every single second. The ready-to-implement solution available in Django allowed the team to focus on UI and UX of the app instead of worrying about the backend technology that makes it work. And the popular application is Spotify. This music streaming app changed the way people listen to, share, and purchase music. The huge library of this application is accessible anywhere and on any device. It contains vast amount of data, and to handle this data, the application uses Python alongside Django. There were mainly two reasons for Spotify to choose this framework. First off, the faster backend, and second thing was machine learning options. Finally, coming down to Pinterest. Pinterest is yet another popular social media platform that allows its user to find ideas like recipes, home, and style inspiration. Pinterest has over 2.5 million monthly active users, so the website has to deal with a heavy load of users. To ensure excellent performance, website uses Django. Django provides ability to scale effectively without affecting its speed. Django's backend system has helped the developers to manage the website, allowing its users to follow each other and share boards and pins. With this type of hype, now you might be curious about how Django works, right? Well, Django is made up of series of components that help it receive and respond to user requests. Here is a quick overview. The way web application works is by request and response. Request is nothing but the user telling a framework that is looking for a certain application. So the user provides a URL pattern. The pattern over here is nothing but an URL. Django accepts this URL and processes it and giving out a response. That is HTML, which is needed by a web browser to render a page. This page can be a plain text or something more richer. The key component over here is views. Views take in URL and processes it. And whichever URL pattern is matched by the application, that particular application function gets activated. And then this application function will return an HTML page. So what exactly is these views? Well, Django views are a custom Python code that are executed when a certain URL is accessed. Views can be as simple as returning a string of text to the user. 
they can also be made more complex by querying a database, processing form, and processing credit card details. Once a view is done processing, a web response is provided back to the user. So, why do we need a web response? You see, it wouldn't be helpful if the user made a request to an application and don't see a response in return. When the user accesses a URL in a browser, what it shows in a window is a web response. Most often, this is HTML page showing a combination of text and images. These pages are created using Django's templating system. As you can see over here in the diagram, the model over here is responsible for dealing with our database, and template contains all the HTML, CSS, and bootstrap code. And the view over here is responsible for taking URL as an input and then executing the activation function. So now that we know how Django works, let me quickly show you how to install Django on our system. So to install Django, I'll be making use of Anaconda. The reason why I'm using Anaconda is because I obviously don't want to install Django throughout my system. So I'm going to create a virtual environment here. So to do that, all I'm going to do is conda create hyphen n provide a virtual environment name and then following that we'll give the python version and then hit enter make sure you click yes over here and it will download a couple of packages here i'm going to use python 3.8 as you can see i have mentioned that over here so it's installing python 3.8 on our virtual environment this might take some a minute or two, so please be patient. All right, so as you can see here, we have successfully created our virtual environment. So now the next stage, we are supposed to activate our virtual environment. So to do that, I'm going to use Conda activate the name of our virtual environment, that is Django demo, and let me hit enter. Okay, as you can see here, we have successfully entered into this particular environment. So let me clear the screen now. Okay, so this is how we can create our virtual environment. And now to install Django, I'm going to use this pip installer pip install Django and then hit enter. All right. So here we have successfully installed Django on our system. As of now, the version of Django that we have installed is Django 3.2. All right, so now that we have successfully installed Django on our system, let's see how we can create our first Django project and also see how we can create our first Django application. So to do that, let me move back to my code editor here. So first thing that I'm going to do is I'm create a folder here, mkdir, and give the name of this folder as Django. Or what we'll do is let's give the name over here as project and then we'll hit one and then hit enter and then let's enter into this particular folder here cd project one and now we are going to create a project okay so now to create a project what we are going to do is we're going to just have something like the command django hyphen admin then we'll have start project and following that what i'm going to do is give a project name so let's say something like demo so the demo is a project name and then after this, we are going to hit enter. Okay, so it doesn't say anything over here. So let's go to this particular folder and see what it has for us. All right, so as you can see, I'm present inside this particular demo project. And as you have seen, right, so I just created this project folder in front of you, project one. And as soon as I hit the command, you can see we have this particular folder. And inside this folder, we have manage.py and also another couple of files that is in it. And then we have settings, URLs, WSGI, and assign. Okay, so now what we'll do is we're going to our code editor and let's see how we can implement this. First off, let me, you can choose any code editor you want. The code editor of my choice over here is gonna be Visual Studio Code. So let me quickly open that. Okay, and now what I'm gonna do is just type here, open folder, and go to the folder that we wanna open. So it's gonna be E Drive, and then we have project one. Okay, and we're gonna go select folder. Okay, so as you can see here within this project folder, we have another folder which says demo, and now we are gonna have another folder over here called demo and the manage.py. So let me do one thing, let me directly get into this project folder that is a demo folder. So let me get inside project and let me hit enter and select this as our folder. So as you can see here, we have this demo folder, and within this we have another folder here, and it has all these components. 
Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change a Python interpreter here. So let me get down here and let me add the Python interpreter that we have created. So that's going to be Django. Okay, so let me quickly search that out. Okay, so as you can see here, we have our Django interpreter here, the one which we have created. Okay, so this is how we can create our project. So over here we'll have init file. This is the file which we usually don't touch. This is basically used to globalize all of these to make this demo over here as a package. And now we have a couple of other things. We have urls.py. This is responsible for taking in and exchanging URLs with our application. We, then we have settings.py. This is where we'll be providing all the settings of our application. And finally, we have manage.py. Manage.py is a folder where we will not be touching it. This is something which we use to run our application, like Django application. So now that we have created our first project, what I'm going to do is we'll create our first application. So, but before that, let's see what happens if I run our server. All right. So to run our server, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back here. I'm going to get inside my demo folder. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to run a simple command which says Python, that is manage.py. I hope you remember this manage.py, right? So this manage.py is a folder which is present here. And now just to run our server or the local host, what I'm going to do is run server and hit enter. So this gives us the default server over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this and I'm going to go to my Chrome and paste it over here. So as you can see, we have nothing over here, but you can see that we are now our application is working fine. Now, if you don't want to run on this particular port number, right? So you can also change your port number. So this can be easily done. So for that, let me first stop my server here. So now what I'm going to do is after doing this Python manage.py run server, I'm going to give a port number like let's say 888 and let me hit enter. Okay. And now you can see here before it was 8000, right? And now our port number is going to change. It's going to be 8888. Let me refresh this. You will see this won't run anymore. Okay. And instead of that, if I replace the zeros with eight over here, that is this, you will see that our page is working totally fine. So this is how you create your own project. So now moving ahead, now what I'm going to do is I want to create our first application. Okay. So to create our first application, what I'm going to do here is first off, let me stop my server. Okay. So to create your first application, what I'm going to do is Python. And now we have that command manage.py. But before that, let me quickly clear the screen. Okay. So I'm going to do this Python manage.py. Okay. And now we need something called a start app. This is a command. And now we are going to give the app name. So we'll give first app or let's say our first app. Okay, before I execute this command, let me quickly go to my code editor. As you can see here, we have just one file, right? We have this demo. Okay, this is one folder. And then we have manage.py file. And this is something which got added up. So now what I'm going to do is let me hit this command. Let me hit enter over here. Okay, nothing happened. We didn't see any line of code, but let me go back to our code editor. You'll and let me refresh this. So you will see here that we have this particular application. So this is nothing but our first app and this first app has migrations, which is basically used for database. And then we also have views, test models, apps, admin and many more. Okay. So now what we are going to do is we are supposed to add this first app to our settings folder over here. Okay. And if you don't add this app, that is our first app to our setting folder, this Django application will not be able to recognize it. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for this main folder. Uh, that is a project folder and go for settings.py and here we'll have this option of adding our application. So as you can see installed apps, right? So now let us install our apps. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just provide the name of this particular folder. So let me just go here. Copy relative path. Let me just paste it over here and give a comma and save this up. All right, so this is how you can add up your first app. And now to spice things up, let's do one thing. Let's create a simple project wherein we can render this particular output. We can render hello world on our web page. Okay. So to do that, first off, we need to go to views. Okay. So in the views folder, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have to create a function. So if you remember what I've said earlier, so basically we have views. Okay. And views is something which is used to process the URLs and then it returns back the response. Okay, so first off, we'll have a function here. We'll say, let's take something like 
you know, we'll give the random name. So we'll say my app and this will have something called as request. Okay. So what this basically saying is this particular function accepts the request. And now what I'm going to do is we'll say we'll have D is equal to let's display the current date and time. Okay. So we'll have date time. Okay. And in order to use this date time, I obviously have to import it. So I'll import it import date time. Okay, so now we have imported our date time module and what I want to do now is dot date. We have this function date time dot now. This is to capture the current time. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is we have to return this over here return. We have to return this in a form of a response, right? So as I mentioned earlier, it takes a request that is the URL and it gives out a response. So the way it gives a response, you can't just return D. Okay, if you return D, it's not going to work. So you have to return this in a form of an HTML. So to do that, we use something called as HTTP response. And for this, I'm going to import from Django dot HTTP import HTTP response. Okay. And now what I'm going to do is I'll have HTTP response here. And inside this response, I'm going to pass an HTML string. Okay. It means it's not a string. It's an HTML code in the form of a string. So let me define S over here. So S is nothing but let's say I want a heading tag that is H1. So I can say something like the current time is let's take that. I'm going to add this. I'll have str and I'm going to add D which gives me current date and time. And then again, I will have to close this with an HTML tag. So, so this is going to be H1 and then close this up and make sure you have this part over here. Okay. So this function currently returns the current date and time. Now executing this alone will not make it work because we obviously have to add this to a URL path. Because it is only with the URL we can route our request to this particular function. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to my project folder that is demo. And then over here, as you can see, we have URLs. Okay. And now first thing that I'm going to do here is add this particular thing to a path. So first off, I have a path. Okay. And now this is where I'm going to define my URL path. So my URL path over here is going to be just like, let me, let me give it as empty. I don't want anything. And here I'm going to pass the function. The second argument over here is nothing but the function. So it's nothing but views dot the function name. Now we don't have views over here. Obviously this is going to throw off error for me. So what I'm going to do is from this particular thing over here that is from our first app. Okay. I can see that I have made a typo here, but it's okay. So make sure you keep in mind about the typo. So import views. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this particular function over here my app. So let me quickly go get down to the URLs views dot my first app or oh, let me just copy this here and pass it here. Okay. And this is all we are supposed to do and let me execute this quickly. So let me save this up and let me execute this. Okay. So let me now quickly move to my code editor here. And as we know if to run this all I'm going to do is Python manage.py run server and then hit enter. Okay, so now we have this thing ready in our local host. Let me copy this. Okay, so I will not refresh this part. All I'm going to do is, you know, just compare this. Okay, so now if I add this up over here and hit enter, obviously we're getting page not found. That's because we haven't added anything, any extension to this. But before that, what I would like you to see is now we are not getting this server page. Okay. So if I refresh this, we'll be getting this particular page over here. So let me refresh this over here. And now for us to see the date and time, all you need to do is hash and give the pattern that is date and then hit enter. So you'll see here that this is the date and this is nothing but the function that we have defined. And if I refresh this, you'll see that the seconds are changing over here. So it's, you can see here now it's 10 seconds. It will now change down to 15. And again, if I wait for like five seconds, it will change down to 20. And so on and so forth. An interesting thing that I would like you to see over here is in the command line. Okay. So as you can see here, every time it says get request. Okay. As you can see, it's like get date. So this is nothing but the URL that I'm passing. Okay. So the get date is nothing but me or the user telling a web server that get this particular function. And what this function over here will return is nothing but a response that is HTTP response. And response over here can be nothing but an HTML page or a string or whatever it is. But you know, over here, the server has nothing to do with what response it is giving. It has only to do with 
you know it's taking this particular url is getting executed or this particular function is this getting executed and if this particular function is getting executed this particular response is what we get okay so now to give you a better understanding what i'm going to do is instead of giving this so here let's have one more thing let's say do here represents hello world so instead of passing a hello world there i'm just going to pass directly here let's say hello world let me save this okay we obviously need to restart the server here at this point so let me close this up okay automatically it's re reloading the changes because it detected the changes so let me now get back to my browser and try reloading this you'll see we here we have hello world okay and similarly now you might be wondering like is it possible for me to have just a single application here well no that's not the case we can have multiple applications and we can add this to multiple urls over here now speaking about reusability right so one of the important things about this frameworks or frameworks in general is that they allow or enhance reusability of particular code now every time i add our views okay every time i add the url path from the views to this particular url path i mean to say the url paths of our project you know it's like the bulkiness of the code is increasing and this is just because over here we have one page okay over here i have one single app what if i have multiple apps so this would obviously become a pretty huge thing right and if i want to delete this or someone new is coming by and he wants to understand the code it would be pretty hard for them to understand what is happening so instead what i can do is i can create a url path within our application within our first app and then add the url folder of this particular app to this part over here to the project okay so let me explain you what i'm trying to say here see first off we'll have a hierarchy over here this is nothing but our project folder and the project folder over here is the demo within the project folder here we can have multiple apps okay and each of these app is capable of rendering their own web page and web page you saw over here is like date and time which we saw and then we printed a hello world right so they are nothing but the web page so these are multiple applications and one such application that we have over here is nothing but our first app so what i'm trying to say over here is instead of having the, all the urls set it in our project folder what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a urls folder over here in our application itself or i should say locally and then give away in such a manner that you know our project folder is aware that we have defined our urls folder in our applications so let me quickly show you how we can achieve this all right so in order to achieve this right so first off we need multiple applications so we'll create def so let's say first okay and as we know this takes a response a request and in return http response and what i want over here is i'll have h1 tag here which is a heading tag and i'll say first and similarly let me close this up h1 and let me close this okay similarly what i'm going to do is i'm going to have not one i'm let me have like four or five right so let me copy this and let me paste it over here okay and now let me just change this from first second let me change this to third and this would be fourth and in our next stage we are supposed to add this like if you were to follow the old method i'm supposed to add all of these methods to our application window over here in the urls so it's going to be views dot first views dot second views dot third but i don't want that i want to make it as in as readable as possible so for that what i'm going to do is i'm going to go for this our first app folder okay and i'm going to create this particular file called as urls dot py all right so now we have this urls this is the urls present in our application so now what i'm going to do is from django dot config dot urls import url okay and another thing that i want is from we also need these views right so we need this functions over here so what i'm going to do is from our test app that is let me copy this up import urls that is sorry import views all right now with this imported views i can also have all of these methods so let me close this views as of now okay let it be open this urls is nothing but urls of our project folder this is for the application folder so let me have url pattern okay and this is going to be the list fine and within this list i'm going to pass the url so you can see here i have called this url right so url and this is going to be just this and i'll put first okay and here i'm going to provide views dot first call the method name okay so let me quickly check this out all right so this is the first url similarly i'm going to add all four 
So let me copy this up. Views dot second. At the same time, even this has to be second. And here is going to be third, and finally the fourth. Okay. And once we are done with this, okay. Let me save this up. Let me save even this views folder. Okay. All right. So now what I'm going to do is we obviously have to add all of these to our main projects folder. So to do that, first off, we'll create something similar to this. We'll have path. And inside this path, all I'm going to do is pass the name of our application. So the name of our application is our first app. So let me just copy that up. Yeah, let me just copy this up. And let me paste it over here. Okay. And along with this, I also need to import some folders here. So that will be from the Django dot config dot URLs import include. All right. And now what I'm going to do here is use this include method. And in this, I'm going to pass a string which says the name of our app. That is our first app dot the folder name that is URLs. Okay. It's referring to this particular folder here. And let me quickly save this up. This thing over here has formed a link or a chain between the demo folder and the app folder. So demo folder is a project folder and this is nothing but the application folder. Okay. And now let's run our code here. Okay. So to do that, obviously I'll be using this. Let me hit enter. Okay. And now let's go down to this particular URL. Let me copy this up and let me paste it over here. This obviously won't be working. If I reload this, it will say page not found. Okay. Or the site can't be reached. Okay. And now I'm just going to execute this. All right. So nothing to worry, guys. We are totally right. So I'm supposed to pass this particular URL. So the URL that I'm supposed to pass over here is nothing but the name of our app. That is nothing but our first app followed by the application name. Okay. So it won't be just first. If I put first, it's not going to detect. It has to go step by step. So it's going to be like the name of our app followed by the name of our application. So let me quickly get that done. So let me copy this. So if I put this part over here. Now, if I do this, you will see we are getting a couple of options, right? So now all I'm going to do is put here first. So if I do this, you'll see we get this first. And this is what exactly what we have defined over here. Similarly, if I put it for second, let me quickly show you that. And hit enter, you will see second and similarly for third and fourth. And for fourth, it should represent the same thing. So let me quickly get that done and hit enter. Okay. So the interesting part, let me show you over here. Okay. So as you can see here, first thing it says get request. We have supposed to pass the URL. So first off, I pass the HTTP first app, right? So this is, this is the URL that I passed first. So I got 404. Which is nothing but the page not found. And then what I did was I passed the complete URL. So I passed the complete address for our application, that is our first app followed by the first. And this is where it gave us a response, that is HTTP. And you can see similarly, it did it for first, second, third, and fourth. All right, guys, now that we have seen how to work along D Django, let me quickly show you an important part that is nothing but admin login page. So in order to do that, let me first move to my code editor here. And let me stop executing this code. So let me press Control C twice and clear the screen. Okay. So how do I access this admin, right? So how do I do this? So if you see over here, if I just go down to our root directory, that is just this. Okay. So for this, I have to run my server. So let me quickly run my server. And let me refresh this page here. So you will see here that we have two options. We have admin as well as our first app. So what will happen if I do this? So let me add this over here and hit enter. You will see we are presented over here with a username and password. So what is this username and password and how do I log in? Okay, so in order to work with this username and password, you need to get down here and you need to create something called as super user. So let me close this server first, clear the screen and we need to create a super user for this particular project. So to do that, we'll have py manage dot py create super user and then hit enter the reason why i'm getting this error is because first off we have to make something called as make migrations so let me quickly show you how we can do that okay so let me quickly clear the screen and type py manage dot py make migration and let me hit enter okay and after this what i'm going to do is py manage dot py migrate 
and then hit enter. So here basically what it's trying to do is it's trying to configure all the database. As we haven't added any external database here, it's going to take in the local database that is nothing but uh, SQL Lite, which is provided built in by Django framework. So let me clear this and let us now create a super user. Okay, so now it will say create a super user. That time you saw, right, we weren't getting the command, like we weren't getting this protocol over here. So let's say we'll give here as user and let me hit enter. Now it will ask me to give an email address. You can just give a random email address. So I'll give it as user at user.com. Hit enter and I'll give the same password user and it'll ask us to confirm and let me hit enter. Okay, it says password is too small, but you know, we can bypass it and just hit enter. Yes. And yeah, so now what I'm going to do is let me run my server again. All right, and let me go back to my browser and refresh this over here. Okay, so now if you remember, we gave the name a username over here as user and similarly, we gave the username here as user and let me log in. So as you can see over here that we are provided over here with some some page. Okay. And what does this page represents? It's nothing but a database. Okay, this is basically an admin page. And if you can see over here, it, over here it allows us to add a couple of users. We can create someone who has access to this. Apart from that, you can also add groups. And then this is exactly how this thing works. We can change our password, we can visit a site, and we can log out of this. So this is basically how the login page of this particular application works. Let's get started and now let us start by understanding what is full stack web development. So when I say full stack web development, so uh, here a full stack web development involves both front end and the back end web development. Now the person who is going to do this activity is called as a full stack web developer. So hence, we call the full stack developers are someone who is jack of all trades because he is the one or he or she is the one who is responsible for building both front end as well as the back end of the web development. Now these full stack developers are knowledgeable in every level of how a particular web is going to work. So I can say that these full stack developers is someone who has a good understanding about how the web works at each and every level. This would include setting up and configuring the Windows or the Linux server, coding the server side APIs, running the client side of the application with the help of JavaScript, operating and querying the databases, and also structuring and designing the web page with the help of CSS, HTML, and the JavaScript. Okay, so that's the expectation or the role of this full stack web developer. Now here when we talk about the layers of full stack web development. So here there are various layers. So we have got the presentation layer or a front end. Okay, and we have the uh, like we have the back end. Okay, and we also have the database. So these are the uh, three things that we generally have whenever we have got the full stack web development. Now presentation layer is a layer where the users will interact with the website. So you can think of it as a uh, like you can think of it as uh, what we call it as the uh, like as a place where the users where your end users will be interacting the application that is your web application. And then we have got the back end or a logic layer. Now this is a place where you will write your logic or the customization by saying as okay if the user performs this action this program or this script to trigger or this activity should happen and this is called as a back end. And then we also have the third layer which is called as a database layer and this is where all the data related to the user and the application will be stored. So this is called as a database layer. So these are the important parts of a web application. Now when we talk about the web developer, okay, when we talk about a web developer, let's look into the types of web developer. 
if I talk about the web developer, there are basically we have got the front end developer. Now front end developer is the one who is responsible for the presentation layer like in that scenario. So the front end developers will be aware of the skill set like HTML, CSS, JavaScript and using this they will be able to provide the efficient animation and the effective way as how my website would look like or a web application would look like. So that's the role of this front end developer. And then we have got a backend developer. A backend developer is the one where, where like this, he or she is responsible of controlling as how my application should behave. Like an example, so this person will be aware of the uh, like the programming like Java, .NET, PHP, and Ruby. Using this, he or she will be developing the backend. And then uh, when we talk about the full stack web developer, so full stack web developer is someone who is aware of not just front end, not just back end, but also the overall both front end and the back end. And that's whom we call him or we call her as a full stack web developer. Okay, now that you have understood about what exactly is a, a full stack developer and how does a full stack developer would look like, let's understand as why you should prefer or why should you become a full stack web developer. See, when we talk about the roles and responsibilities of a full stack developer, I can say that as a full stack developer, you should be well acquainted with the system architecture and the infrastructure. This would include the hardware and the operating system. And as a full stack developer, you are expected to create and design the front end using the HTML, CSS and the JavaScript and build the interactive UIs with the help of JavaScript frameworks like React.js, AngularJS, Vue.js, Ember and so on. And as a full stack developer, you are expected to perform the server side APIs like you are expected to code the server side APIs and the backends by making use of the programming languages like Python, Ruby, Java, PHP and frameworks like the Node.js. And it is expected that you manage and operate the relational database management like the MySQL, MongoDB, SQL and so on and you should be well versed with the project management tools and the client coordination. So this is how uh, uh, the roles and responsibilities would look like. Now when we talk about this full stack development, so here as I mentioned you are expected to make use of variety of tools to build the interactive UIs and you are responsible for designing and developing the application. And you are someone who will be uh, like who is responsible for creating an end-to-end -end application and that's the reason that a full stack developer role is the one which is one of the high paid jobs that we have got in the current world. Now, this is because the full stack web developers are someone who not only know the front end, but also the back end. Okay, so that's the reason that now is the right time to become a full stack web developer. Now, when I talk about this full stack web development, Okay, what are all that you would generally come across? As I mentioned, you will be making use of the HTML, which is nothing but the hypertext markup language. So you'll make use of this HTML to design the front end and not just HTML in some scenarios. So you'll also make use of the CSS, which is known as cascading style sheet, which using this, you will be able to perform the formatting and add the color coding for the required elements in your HTML web page, like formatting the containers as you see right here and changing the colors of the containers as you can clearly observe. And you can mention the click action, what should happen when you click something. So all these things that you will be doing it with the help of CSS. And then you will also make use of the JavaScript 
to create the front end like you'll create a javascript which uh, which will be running with the help of javascript engine where when the users interacted with the object the script will be run and the required animation will be produced to the user like when the user clicks on this uh, uh, button then you can go ahead and generate an action that says as a welcome page should be displayed so that is the overall role of this front end development and here as a full stack developer you're also responsible for a back end web development so let's see how does the back end web development would look like in case of the back end development let's say if someone mentions in the search box as edureka and let's say he presses the enter key so this request will flow to my web server and this web server is going to process this request and so once the request is processed the data is sent back to the front end and then here uh, it like it can directly send the data to the front end by performing the logic or in some scenarios that request might go to the database and you may get the data from the database and this data will back, will be sent back to the web server and then you can go ahead and send the data back to the front end now for performing this backend you can make use of the various options like java php node js you can make use of all these uh, abilities in order to configure the backend okay and here you'll also be required to know about the relational database like mongodb mysql and sql okay so these are the important tools that you will be generally coming across as a front end and as a back end as a full stack web developer now when we talk about the tools and technology let's have a look into the important web development tools and technology so first thing is code editors so code editor is nothing but it's the ide interactive development environment which you will be using it in order to create a code so one we have got the visual studio okay so visual studio is a most popular tool from microsoft which will be using it to write the code or the other one is the sublime text which is a sophisticated text editor where you will use it for coding markup or writing the prose and so on so these are the two most commonly used tool when it comes to the ide then we have got the knowledge of the version control system like a git so using the git based repository we will be tracking the code so using this git uh, based repository so or the git based system you will be tracking the version code of the entire web application hence the knowledge of the git is very essential for you because when you are working in a project so multiple people or multiple developers will be working and each developer or each team will be working on the individual parts of the application to keep everything in sync we make use of the git based repositories so this would ensure that the code that we have got is the error free and this will give us the effective management of branches when multiple people are actually running uh, the system in the system and this will also give us the ability to uh, say as like if some code version is not working so we can make use of the ability to uh, get back to our uh, the previous version of the code that is currently running so these are the benefits that we would get uh, whenever we are working with the version control system okay then the knowledge of javascript frameworks so the like that's another essential thing that you need to be aware while working so knowledge of javascript framework is very important and the setting up the connection and uh, like get, getting the request and sending the response to the api that is http and rest so this is the knowledge like the basic knowledge is very essential for the full stack web developer because from the client you will be getting the request and this request you have to send it to the server in some scenarios you'll have to set up the connection between server and the database so that you can fetch the data from the database and send back the uh, send back the requested data 
to the client. So the knowledge of HTML and the server will come in very handy. Okay, so these are the important skills that you should be aware of whenever we are talking about this full stack web development or the web developer role. Now, apart from these guys, okay, so uh, here, when we talk about this full stack web developer, so even you can check out the various uh, job trends as well. So full stack web developer is the one, uh, he, it's one of the highest pay, paying salary that we have got right now. Now, if I want to give you a, some idea about the job description of the full stack web developer. So this is one of the job description from IBM, which describes about the requirement of the full stack web developer, which says web development using HTML, CSS, framework based language like JavaScript with Angular or React, the backend language, it could be Node.js, Ruby, Python, Java, PHP, storage and databases like SQL, NoSQL, web storage and scaling, and repositories Git typical web application design and development philosophy. So as you can clearly see overall, when we talk about the skills that is required for the full stack web developer, as a full stack developer, you should have an in-depth understanding of working with the system architecture, web architecture, and the communication protocols like HTTP, TCP IP, and so on. And as a full stack developer, you should be skilled in working with the development operating systems like Ubuntu, CentOS, Windows, and so on. And it is required to understand the function of the web server like NGINX or Apache server. And you should have a basic designing ability, which is expected in UI UX designing and the proficiency in front end technologies like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The expectation to design and develop the user interface using the web development framework and the libraries like jQuery, React, AngularJS, and you should be having a solid understanding about, I can say, the server-side languages like Java, Python, PHP, Ruby, and the server-side frameworks like the Node.js. You should be well-versed in operating and querying the relational databases. It could be NoSQL database management as well, like the MongoDB, SQL, and MySQL. And you should be comfortable in operating and managing the version control system like Git or the subversion. So apart from this, so like as you start working with the project, you'll also be introduced with the various project management tools like Scoro, Jira, and so on. Okay, so that's the overall expectation of a full stack web developer. Now, if I want to give you a high level view about the various concepts or the technologies that you should be learning, see under the front end, we have got the HTML. So HTML5, JavaScript, jQuery, CSS, we have got backend, we've got Ruby on Rails, PHP, Angular 2, Node.js, .NET, under the database, we've got MySQL, MongoDB. So you can clearly get to know about the various, yes, the various technologies that is expected for you to become the successful full stack web developer. So with this, we come to the end of today's session. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can